Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Easter Lariat, and I'm your host, Dylan Fox. Today's a very special episode, and one that I hope you enjoy, despite the somber circumstances surrounding it. If you aren't aware, on October 1st, the Japanese wrestling world lost one of its biggest stars in its entire history, and really the entire country of Japan did, with his amazing influence on wrestling, being one of the tip-top pioneers of popularizing mixed martial arts. That's right, Antonio Inoki, the founder of New Japan Pro Wrestling, a legendary wrestler, a legend in the world of MMA, and a former politician, passed away on October 1st, 2022. One day past the 60th anniversary of his wrestling debut. That's, that's for real. First and foremost, myself, Striga, and all of the members of the Eastern Lariat family want to send our condolences to any family members of Antonio Inoki, all of his friends, fans, and as you may have noticed, my usual co-host Striga isn't joining me tonight, but don't fret, he's going to be back in a week or so as we discuss seven of Antonio Noki's most noteworthy matches in our Week of Lariat series, the first episode of which will be free for everybody. Hopefully many join us for that, as well as this show, because this is a special show today. I wanted to give as much history, and particularly as much backstory, on Antonio Inoki as a wrestler, promoter, as a man, as possible. And to do that, I reached out to an amazing Japanese wrestling historian. He's got credits and quotations from various wrestling media outlets, and he can be regularly seen writing on his blog, as well as on the excellent website, Pro Wrestling Only. And in particular, he specializes in the history of the JWA, the Japan Wrestling Alliance. That's the first ever Japanese wrestling organization and it was the forefather to both New Japan and All Japan, as well as the place Enoki debuted as a wrestler. So, with that said, joining me on this show, a first-time ever guest on the Eastern Lariat. You may know him as Ken Stalker if you see him on Twitter, on the forums, whatever. He is Cameron Lee. Thank you so much for joining me, my friend, and helping to honor this amazing legend, Antonio Enoki. All right. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, um, just real quick, uh... You may know me as Kinch Stalker. It's a dumb old name I came up with in high school. I'm not going to explain it. Um, but, yeah, this is not only my Eastern Lariat debut. It is my podcast debut. Uh, this white guy here waited until he, – he almost got through his whole 20s without recording a podcast. We only got about halfway through. But, you know, duty calls. <laughs> duty calls. Well, thank you. That makes it even more special that you decided to jump on with me. Uh, I'd like to think that perhaps it says something about about myself and, and the show, and hopefully you have a good time. Although it's a somber topic we're talking about today, but there's a lot of fun stuff that we could talk to. This is a, not just a, an obituary episode, but a celebration of this man's life who is so big. His shadow cast is so large over the Japanese wrestling scene and the wrestling scene in general that – I, I can't even possibly explain it to any kind of simple statement or anything like that. So we're going to go through a lot of his career, uh, especially the early part of his career, because I know you are a specialist in JWA, which was the precursor promotion to All Japan Pro Wrestling and New Japan Pro Wrestling. Obviously, everyone knows this year specifically is a very historical year with the 50th anniversary of both promotions. You know, All Japan just had their anniversary show uh, last month. New Japan had their anniversary show in March. So this is a big year for them, and JWA was the promotion that really started it all. If you, if you guys out there, the listeners, if you go back and listen to the show I did with Fumi Saito in April, we had a long conversation about – that show was basically all about Sumo Palace, right, Sumo Hall, as some people know it as. And we started off going all the way back into the 50s, which is where – uh, Ricky Dozon, the father of ProRes, and all kinds of stuff happened there. This show's not about that, but that's the forerunner to where we're going now. And that's where Antonio Inoki started his career. But, Cameron, you know, you've done a lot of research again. And you said it before that, you know, JWA is really your especially the old style of wrestling. You're always doing great things with that. So uh, if you would, uh, introduce us to the very – let's start at the very beginning of Antonio Inoki, the man, the person – and where did he start out going into wrestling? Well, let's start out where he started out. As He was born in Yokohama, uh, February 20th, 1943, I believe. Um, he was uh, the second youngest of 11 children. There was one brother that came out after, about five years later uh, named Keisuke Inoki. 
uh, Keisuke would later be, uh, he would later have a backstage job with New Japan. So he was, uh, Inoki was fairly well off, at least at first. Um, his grandfather, Jiro, was, had a, had a bunch of different businesses, but his big business was uh, coal. Like, he was the, I believe he was, like, the exclusive coal dealer for one of the biggest steel manufacturers in the company, like Neon Kokon. So Inoki family was fairly well off. Like, his dad was a policeman, but had retired to, like, take care of his stepfather's uh, coal and stuff, and his mother was a school teacher. And But Inoki does not actually, re- did or did not actually remember his father because uh, Sejiro Inoki died in 1948, uh, around the time that he ran for some, like, some political thing in Yokohama. Uh, so he doesn't rem- didn't remember his father much, and after that, uh, you know the fuel econ- you know the fuel economy shifts from coal to oil, and the fortunes of the family gradually fade. Uh, Inoki was kind of a clumsy. He was a tall kid. He he grew in elementary school. He was by like by fifth grade, he was probably the tallest kid in the school. But he, uh, he was a clumsy kid. Sorry, I'm rambling. This is my first podcast, but. Hey, it's okay. You're telling the info right now. There's a lot of information here where we're going to go through today. So I just want to prepare everyone for that. This isn't going to be a, a 20 minute show if you're expecting that. We're going to get through as much as we can. And you've got a lot of information at your fingertips. So just let it fly. You know, rambling or not, we got, we got a lot of good stuff. So no worries, brother. Hakuna Matata. So, Inoki, like he, I know he does a little, he does a little bit of karate or, then he, he tries out for the baseball team, or not baseball, basketball team, but he doesn't, doesn't work well there. But he does, he, the first sport that he seems to do well at is, uh, track and field. Well, track or field specifically because he was a shot putter. But when he was 14 years old, uh, a good portion of the family, that is his grandfather, mother, and I think, I think his brothers, I think his sister stayed, but at least some of his brothers, they decided to go to Brazil to start um, – their grandfather was going to try to start a coffee farm. Uh, risky venture, but, you know, I, I guess when your fortunes have fallen that far. You know, that's just to back up a little bit, not to interrupt you. I apologize for that. But you have to remember, I think it's important to note here, when all this was going on, we're still in the heyday of the, the, the post-World War II Japan. Yeah, yeah the, the, this is – you. This is before, like, the, the economic miracle really – like, that's more of, like, an early 60s thing, I think, when their economy really starts booming again. They sail – so they go on this boat. They're going to go to Brazil. They sail – they sail across the Pacific. They go through the Panama Canal. They stop in Cristobal. Uh, Giro, his grandfather, buys a banana, and they sail off for Brazil. While they're off the coast of Venezuela, Giro eats that banana, and it kills him. They don't so, – Intestinal blockage, I think. So the family has now lost, you know, Jiro had become the family patriarch after Sajiro had died, and now there is no patriarch in this family. And they spend a year, Inoki spends a year working just night, just all day in this coffee plantation outside of Sao Paulo. Um, but then he goes, he makes enough, I guess he goes to, uh, he's working at like a fruit and vegetable market in the city. He's in school. He's continuing to do uh, track and field in Brazil. He does good in discus and shot put. And that takes us to early 1960. Now, in early 1960, Ricky Dozon and Hideyuki Nagasawa came to Brazil for Ricky Dozon's second tour. This is not a full JWA tour. It's just him and another guy, Nagasawa, who was like more of a trainer. And Ricky Dozon, uh, depending on who tells the story, or regardless of the story, when Ricky Dozon first saw Noki, he thought, I'm taking this boy back to Japan with me. And, uh, you know, guy's got a good body. Uh, this guy's, you know, you know, Ricky Dozon was not a very tall guy when you look back at him. And I think that Inoki, you know, he sees this tall Japanese guy. Well, just I, not, not to cut you off a little bit, when you you think about it, this guy right now, we're talking about Antonio Inoki, or Kanji Inoki at the time, obviously, like just his, his you know, born name. Right. So when you look at his life so far, you know, it's been such a whirlwind for him in this Brazilian run. And, and like, this is an amazing story. It's something you can't really write. If somebody wrote it in a movie, I don't know if it would get passed for being realistic. You know, his dad was a politician. 
he dies when he's five years old. You know, very little memory of him. The family business goes under because of a World War II that was, like, unfathomable at the time, you know, before it happened. Then he leaves to, you know, at the behest of his grandfather and, uh, you know, his, his mom and everything like that to go to this country all the way across the world. You know, like Japan and Brazil. Uh, there's a long history of J- Japanese and Brazilian, like, uh, crossover when it comes to just people migrating. You know, I, I, yeah, I don't know if people are that, are that familiar with it, but, you know, there's a lot. That's why, if you notice, like, uh, MMA is super popular in Brazil, obviously. And a lot of the martial arts that came there was from Japan. You know, someone like uh, Masiko Kimura, some of his famous stuff was uh, going to Brazil and fighting there. You know, famous uh, judoka and pro wrestler. So it's like you see... Uh, the crossover as well there. So like you said, he's going there to start this coffee business, and the grandpa dies on the trip. I mean, this couldn't have been more uh, just a topsy-turvy, upside-down life for this guy. And, you know, I was reading a lot about his early growing up and stuff, and a lot of times he was so poor. And, I mean, this – well, obviously talk about when he gets to January, but this would follow him around for a little while. But when he was just a child. People would be bullying this guy crazy for being poor, and obviously his noteworthy chin that we all uh, know about has become a medium in later years, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but he was getting made fun of all the time. He's going to a new country where he didn't know anybody working in these coffee fields. That's a, a hard thing to do, working 10, 12 hours a day uh, in, the, in these situations, and now by the you know by fate pretty much. The biggest star in Japan, Japanese pro wrestling, is now in Brazil. Like you said, it wasn't a company initiative. It was it was just him uh, on there. And he he's finds there about four, he's there for about four weeks. He's working yeah. dates. Apparently, I think uh, the one one of the stories is that a journalist told him about Inoki, and he came into Ricky Dozon's hotel room. Ricky Dozon sized him up and said, "You know, if you're coming back with me." And yeah. Kanji came back uh, over his mother's objections. So back, you know, he comes to Japan, and we should note that for, like, the first year of Inoki's career, they're billing him as a half-Japanese, half-Brazilian guy who cannot speak yeah. Japanese. <laughs> I think there's a story where um, there was somebody who recognized him from school, and he had to be quiet, like, pretend <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> that, that, now, see, isn't that, that crazy? Because this is another thing I was thinking about. When you're talking about that, sort of expedition. We had seen companies kind of adopt that even until later years. I mean, the most recent one I can think of is when in Pro Wrestling NOAA, when they had Kenta and Marfuji travel to Chile and recruit people from South America that, you know, nobody had really known about, but they they brought them in and they found some really great talent there. But it's like that still stayed there. Now you look at this in the 1960s and I think the reputation of Japanese wrestling, especially back in the old days, is just ultra serious. And we're going to get into all of that too with Inoki specifically, that sometimes the reality Reality is a little bit different than the, the myth, so to speak. But now, you compare it to American wrestling. We already know if you're a fan of American wrestling back in the old days, how many fake Russians were there in the, in the middle of the Cold War, you know? And now you go into Japan and they're doing a very similar act where you want to build this guy as a half Brazilian named Antonio, you know, which is obviously not a Japanese name. But you need really give him as this to make him seem more like different and give him something to specialize well, to the fans there. I should say, Antonio, that ring name, we'll get to that. That doesn't come up until 62, just to be clear. Yeah. Right. Um, so, in a, and on that, uh, with, you know, there was the Sharp Brothers being billed as Americans, even though they were Canadian. It was <laughs> all this big Geico Kujin, big white guy, like, bl- yeah. <laughs> blob to uh, Japanese public. So, anyway, Inoki comes in, and I, wa- I think something that's worth noting at this point is. So the JWA was not always training wrestler. Like, by this point, the JWA is actually fairly new to training wrestlers from the ground up. If you look at the first few years of the company, it's all these people who had experience in other combat sports, uh, either judo or sumo, or in the one case of Isao Yoshiwara, amateur wrestling. So, so, um... You had, and that's not to disparage, or not disparage, not to discount the um, massive amount of conditioning that like a sumo wrestler would have to do to do pro wrestling. Because you ever watch sumo? That's that's not an endurance sport. <laughs> Somebody like Ricky Dozon or Toy Obori would have to do a lot to recondition their body. But at this point, I think it's in '57 they start actually training people from the ground up. I think the first one is uh, Yazuhiro Kojima 
who we know better as Hiro Matsuda, who will show up later in this story. Then there was, like, Maddie Suzuki after him. Then you have, like, other people like Mitsu Harai and I think, like, Ushinosuke Hayashi, who, if people know him, they know him as a referee in All Japan and AJW in the 80s. But anyway, Inoki, on one hand, he is considered one of the top four prospects in this, like, first generation of JWA trainees. These were the original four that were called the Shitano, or the Four Pillars. The others were, in order, um, the first one that joined was this guy named Yukio Suzuki. He would later be called Mammoth Suzuki or Gorilla Suzuki. Biggest, like, bust in the history of early pro Resu. He thought, Ricky Dozon thought that he was going to be bigger than any of them, uh, than Inoki or Baba. But uh, it just flamed out. He was so bad that, like, in the 1963 World League, Ricky Dozon renames him Gorilla Suzuki out of spite. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the other two are a lot more famous. One of them is Kintaro Oki or Kim Il, or actually uh, Kim Il, they've said, was his real Korean name. There was an interview a year or two ago with his former valet, Kim Duck, Mazanori Taguchi, where he actually claimed that Kim Il's real name was Kim Tae Sik, but uh, that's just a sidebar. So Kim Il was this guy who was 29 years old, has a story like almost as wild as Inoki's, in fact, or maybe as wild. He yeah. shipped into Japan on a fishing boat when he was 29, uh, just because he'd heard about Ricky Dozon. And this is like five years before Ricky Do or before Japan and South Korea had really any. It's not until, like, 64, 65 that South Korea was, like, really open to negotiations with others uh, because of, like, Atsuza Boroshina that I don't want to get too deep into the Japanese politics, even though that does kind of slightly dovetail with the JWA. I might mention that a bit. Um, So he gets thrown in jail for being an illegal immigrant. And what what Kim Il did was he wrote to uh, Ricky Dozon, wanting to wrestle for him, and Ricky Dozon pulled some strings with Bamboku Ono, who was a big guy in the Liberal Democratic Party, that's the right-wing Japanese party, and uh, he was also like the JWA commissioner, so he gets him out of jail to wrestle for him. Then the last one is, of course, Shohei Baba, the six foot ten son of a vegetable dealer who became a basketball, or baseball pitcher. <laughs> yeah. And instead of becoming perhaps the Japanese Randy Johnson, he only uh, pitched for about four years. Uh, then he was about to get traded from the Omiuri Giants to some other team. Uh, he falls through a shower door, just totally messes up the nerves in his left arm or pitching arm. And uh, he found uh, he was now into wrestling. <laughs> so these are four, you know, Suzuki, Inoki, uh, Oki, and Baba are the, like the original four pillars of the JWA. But Inoki is Inoki is the one who he's the one who always had he he was the one who started with the loss he was the one yeah. who started at the bottom he had to work up like on their debut show so because him and Inoki or him and Baba debut on the same day and on that same day uh, this is the same day that Inoki ended up leave, ended up departing <laughs> um, he uh, he lost to Kintaro Oki while uh, I well. Uh, Baba went over somebody. I, I forget it was Nagasawa or Atsuba or some one of those guys. Um, but yeah, that's what happened there. You know, I just wanted to cut you up again uh, here. I, I I really wanted to bring up that Oki story because I was doing a lot of research on this, and I have to say, just just watching wrestlers is totally aside to, to anything. But uh, way underrated as a wrestler, uh, Kitaro Oki. I really loved his matches, and some of them with Inoki, in fact, were really great. So I, I was a big fan of his as a wrestler, to be honest with you. But you look at the story of the JWA, the guys uh, Ricky Dozon's recruiting, and it kind of plays into how they all got treated, right? So you have somebody like an Inoki, as I we just went over his story, like tragic childhood pretty much, and like an unbelievable journey to get here. Uh, Oki, another one, like a tragic deal, and we have to mention, you know, again, to bring up post-World War II stuff, not to delve too much into politics or anything, but uh, obviously, with the Korean War, we're coming off the backs of that. Japan has, you know, contentious, re- contentious relationships at times, and that would grow on even years and years later with the Zenaichi uh, Korean stuff uh, for okay. some certain people there. Yeah. So, and the of crazy course, thing is, Ricky Dozon is yeah. Korean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the greatest Japanese uh, hero 
is Korean, actually, yes. That's the, that's the part that everyone – so it's amazing how you see that. But then you have Baba, who's like this prime athlete, a baseball pitcher, six foot nine, has everything you want. So – I was reading a lot, and Baba was the favorite of everyone. You know, he wouldn't have to do a lot of the stuff that Inoki would do as the young young boy type of deal that you would yeah, see. Baba, yeah. Baba never had to, like, never had to li- – like, he had his own apartment from the beginning, where, whereas Inoki is living in, R- in Ricky Dozon's house, literally. Um, and, like, if Baba also – because he's not – like, I do want to say, like, Baba – this is, this isn't like a jumbo thing. They're not like you didn't have somebody like a jumbo or a Sakaguchi where you would push them mega push. But you know, Baba is considered a top prospect. Um, so I guess we we go into that, and I'm thinking. So you know, this is the early '60s. The JWA was actually kind of in a slump from '57 to '58. I don't want to get too into that, but they're on the rebound now. Um, so Inoki's doing his stuff. I know, I think the first really significant thing Inoki does is he participates in one of the early world leagues. I want to say it's like 62. I think it's like the fourth one where he gets to wrestle like Luthez and Freddie Blassie and a bunch of other people. Yeah, just to, just to add on, the world league is basically their version of a G1 or a the original round robin tournament. It was, um, yeah. Which they would bring back to New Japan years after this. Uh, yeah, New Japan would briefly bring back that World League branding for, like, I think it's for four years they do it. Yeah. But anyway, um, and the interesting thing is, so back in this uh, back in this time, like, in 61, uh, Baba gets to go on an excursion just, like, like not even a year into his in-ring career. Him, Suzuki, and Yoshino Sato get to go to America, and Baba... Baba, he, like a lot of his, a lot of his exploits are not actually reported on in Japan because uh, Ricky Dozon had done a very good job of only really showing the American industry in the context of the West Coast. And you know when Baba is in New York or wrestling under uh, Fred Atkins in Toronto, that's not showing up. But you know, and, and eventually, what got Baba over finally in Japan was he did this program with the Destroyer in Los Angeles in '63, which was a lead up to the Destroyer coming to Ricky Dozon or coming to the JWA and having his famous match. The thing with JWA is you could see it even back in the '50s. Uh, the TV like boom for JWA, like it, it was like a totally a right time, right place scenario to where you could get the huge rating where like seventy percent of the company, the country or something was watching Ricky Dozon's match, and he was always going to have that kind of level of notoriety from the matches well, of the TV. There is like like I said, there is a slump in like like something really interesting about Japanese res- uh, wrestling is how different the television model is. Like they don't yeah. really, di- you know. They don't, they never, so around the time that Ricky Dozon, the JWA was first blowing up, in America, Jim Barnett was coming up with the uh, studio show, which was sort of the this, this standard staple of wrestling programming in America for almost 40 years. But the studio show never really took off in Japan. Uh, Ricky Dozon tried doing, like, weekly tapings in 57 at his dojo, and, like, he was he was putting over Michiaki Yoshimura as this big star. It just didn't work. It was – behind the scenes, this was happening because the guy that Ricky Dozon was trusting to book his house shows, he'd had a falling out with. So he was, like, they, they weren't able – so we think of 57, we think of Ricky Dozon and Luz Dez, you know, selling out Cork and Stadium. But really, that's, like, kind of the flop era of the JWA. But anyway, so uh, an interesting story that I, I want to bring up is, so Inoki, well, the the frustrating thing with him is that he never got to go on an excursion during Ricky Dozon's life. Uh, there is actually, I just found this out today, he might have gone in 63 before Ricky Dozon died, but so the story at the time was he was going to go with Fred Atkins but he'd hurt a ligament in his knee when he was wrestling Kokichi Endo in Sapporo in like May 63. There is actually a biography of Baba that I have. I haven't translated all of it, but I have like translated bits of it. And there is an interesting little tidbit there where apparently when Baba first came back, uh, 
uh, Toyobori was jealous of him and had ordered o- Kentaro Oki to shoot on Baba, and Fred Atkins was at this tour, was working on this tour, and Atkins was mad. And Atkins may not, and this, the speculation in some other magazine due to this fact was, what if, uh, the, that this was the reason that Inoki did not get to have his excursion? I, we can, I guess we can, I, we'll be talking about Toy Nobori in a little bit because he yeah. is an important figure in, uh, Inoki's early life. And he's, <laughs> Toy Nobori is a character. Let's just say that at the outset. But, um, that, that happens. So, and there's another interesting story from the early years. This comes, I got this from the one Ricky Dozon biography in English from the, a few years ago, uh, Japan, the Ricky Dozon years. I want to plug that. It's mostly a book of like card results, but there is some valuable like information about the, about the business there. Even if, you know, I wish there was a full book that wasn't just re- half wrestling cards. But anyway, there's this, this is the story that the day, that Ricky Dozon got stabbed, he had, he had, was doing this meeting with some sumo, like sumo stable master, and he wanted to make Inoki transfer into sumo. Cause th- this is also a point where it, uh, Ricky Dozon was like really obsessed with trying to train, well, he wanted a uh, boxing champion to be trained in his gym. Like he got this famous trainer named Eddie Townsend to work for him. So he he was probably like he wanted he, he was wanting Inoki to quit and go into sumo and Inoki claimed that he almost quit the JWA that day. Oh. Uh, this is something. Um, this is something like this, this actually rhymes with what the reason why Hiro Matsuda left is that Hiro Mats the story Hiro Matsuda told is that he was grappling with Ricky Dozon and he like beat him or something. And this was like, like sparring in the dojo and Ricky Dozon lost his temper. And it's like, you must do sumo, you know, cause he, he was trying to, trying to throw that weight around. And Matsuda eventually just goes, screw this. And he just eventually goes <laughs> to like Peru and Mexico and becomes an American style wrestler. But Inoki claimed that Toyonobori dissuaded him from quitting on that day. And December, 1963, Ricky Dozon dies, and there's multiple theories as to why, but let's just say he never recovered from the stab he received that night. They, they like, people don't, like, don't know if there's going to be wrestling. It's a crisis. The day after that, there was this, they have this wake where they announce that four big wrestler executives are going to take over the, man, the leader, posi- the president, well, I, at this point, they're not president. I think that they made, like, Keiko Momoda, who was uh, Ricky Dozon's widow, the president. That happens for, like, there's, you know, honestly, we don't, probably don't need to get into Keiko Momoda. That's more of an all-Japan thing. But um, anyway, the it is in that era where Toyoto Bori, Yoshino Sato, Kokichi Endo, and Michiaki Yoshimura become this, like, council that leads the JWA that Inoki finally goes on his first excursion. He goes... uh it was under the wing of Sonny Myers, who was uh, – I, I forgot where Sonny Myers worked out of, but he was somebody who had been in the JWA a couple years before. He liked what he saw in Inoki, and he was the one who finally gave Inoki his excursion. So Inoki goes on this, like, two-year excursion from, like, 64 to early 66, where he just travels – all around the country, he's really maybe one of the first people to really do that nationwide excursion instead of just, you know, one or two territories. Um, Yoshimura, or not Yoshimura, um, Inoki, he wrestled as uh, Tokyo Tom in some places. He was wrestling in Los Angeles. He was wrestling in Portland with uh, uh, Pat Patterson, who is somebody who will show up very early in New Japan later on. He teams up with Duke Kiyomuka to win some tag titles somewhere. Uh, he teams up with Hiro Matsuda in another place. Uh, he does some uh, stuff in, like, NWA Mid-America, uh, like Texas. Uh, yeah, you know, he was even – and he, he was really getting over big in, in the South. You were mentioning that he was one of the first ones to really go all around, especially on an excursion. He was even in Memphis by uh, Neck of the Woods yeah. here and doing some things. In Texas, he, it's like he was challenging for the NWA Texas title, like, you know, the Von Erich. <laughs> He was with uh, with uh, yeah. he was like Ray Ur- Ray Urbano, I think. Uh, or, yeah, yeah. or no, Joe Blanchard. Joe Blanchard was the person that he 
there was I was thinking of Ray Urbano because Ray Obr- Urbano was somebody who had also gone by Tokyo Tom in that era. <laughs> Even though that's not a very uh, Tokyo Tom sounding name. <laughs> no, no, no. But yeah, you know, Fritz really uh, must have seen something. Him get, putting him up there right away, having a little bit. Well, of- that's not Fritz. That's Paul Bo- Paul Botch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're, you're right. You're right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think Fritz is a promoter quite yet, but yeah, that's uh, right. That's in Houston. Yeah, you're totally you're totally right on that. So let like with that, let's uh. So it's March 1966 that Inoki is set to return. Uh, they want to bring him back for what would it? What would this? Which World League would this be? Fifty nine. I guess would have been the eighth World League. So, like we said earlier, the World League is the archetype for the G1 Climax and the Champion Carnival, the single round-robin tournament. Um, the plan is that they want to bring Inoki back to debut on that tour. But, perhaps unbeknownst to Inoki, something very radical has happened in the JWA. So, Toy and Obori had become the president in early 1965. There was this big shakeup where, like, the Yakuza guys and the Shareholders Association were forced to step down because of police pressure. Um, there's some other convoluted stuff. And Toyo Nobori, he's using, like, he is not, he is not doing good by the company. He is, he is jeopardizing their relationship with the Worldwide Wrestling Associates out of Los Angeles, which was the promotion that they did business with. We need to point out uh, JWA was not an NWA member until 1968. That is a very common misconception I see in the West. They don't actually join. That's why that some things we're about to talk about are able to happen is because there is not an NWA member in Japan at the time. So, Toy, um, he... he Right. He wins the WWA heavyweight title as, like, that. that's the title that uh, Ricky Dozon had won, like, against, like, Fred Blassie. Um, so, and he holds on to it for a super long time that jeopardizes their relationship with the company. Like, he doesn't want to go to Los Angeles to defend it because uh, he doesn't want to be on a plane or something. And then he ends up, oh, let, let me look up real quick. And this is another story, just to, just to add in, fill time for you a little bit, but uh, just to, to thinking about that, this is another story that I feel like this is totally a product of its time. Because remember, in the 60s, it's not like now where everybody flies everywhere. The 60s flying places, that's still relatively new and maybe scary to some people out there. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, yeah. Yeah, th- this is – and that's another interesting thing as to why they did so much business out of, like, Hawaii and San Francisco is that those are the only places that you would have direct flights to Japan from, you know, to I, Japan. I, you couldn't fly straight from Japan to New York back in this time. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Again, this shows you how much time has changed. and You have to look at things as a product of their eras, which is – like, this things are about to get really rocky. We're like we're, where we're headed with the story. Things are going to get really kind of crazy uh, with Toyota. So, Toy and Obori had become – so he was using the, – and the reason they were using the WWA title is that Ricky Dozon's old belts were being held up by the Momotas. So uh, Ricky Dozon's widow, his last wife, Keiko Momoda, was the stewardess that he had married about six months before he died, uh, and she had carried his – she had his child. Uh, and she – I believe she was wanting – uh, his the presidential seat because she was president as like a figurehead at first in like '64 after Ricky Dozon died, but then she was transitioned out of that role and I think she wanted like Yoshihiro Momoda to do it. That's the oldest son, not Mitsuo. Yoshihiro is the other brother that was with All Japan. Uh, people who know their old All Japan will recognize Yoshihiro as being the old ring announcer and old timekeeper from those like old '70s matches. So um, she wanted him to become the JWA president, and apparently Toyon Obori was like, like, like said, "Oh, sure, we'll do that," but he didn't put it in writing, and he probably didn't intend to, and they were not going to honor that later on, which we'll get to. So Toyon Obori is using this WWA heavyweight title because the Momo, because Keiko is holding on to both of the singles titles that Ricky Dozon was wearing. Um, or the uh, NWA International Heavyweight, which will later become one of the Triple Crown titles, and the um, uh, Asian Heavyweight, which is 
much for it's it, which is like paired with the Asia tag team, but Asia heavyweight is often forgotten now. That would later kind of become a vanity belt for Kentaro Oki at kind of the end of the. That was the end of that belt's life. I think it's. I think it's. I think that belt has actually been picked up by some Korean promotion. No, it's a. It's a. Now it's a vanity belt for a man named Ryoji Sai, who started okay, okay. wrestling like a man did. And like you said, they do shows in Korea as well now. But I, that, there's a, speaking of corruption, which we're about to get into, that's another story that could uh, we could do some research on with his uh, huge loan that he acquired to start Lands End. But yeah, he acquired the Asia title uh, there, and that's they don't even run shows that much anymore. I don't think, but uh, the title is with them technically. I think a South Korean guy ha- holds it right now, actually. Yeah, this, yeah that, that, that I will say real quick, that that is something that I need to put look more into, because it seems like as over as Kentaro Oki was, or Kim Il, I guess, was in Korea, that, you, when you look at the history of Korean wrestling, it was really... So the, the, the Korean leader, uh, Park Chung-hee, just really... He really wanted that kind of American-style pro wrestling because he saw that it was really over in Japan, and it was, you know, good American anti-communist entertainment, and it doesn't really, go, like, like it has a lot of trouble, like, it even, they even went off TV at one point, and Park Chung-hee was like, no, you put that back on, <laughs> and it's like, it's so sad. Yeah, that, that, that's a, yeah, he was a fan, and there's, um, so, like, that's why I think that, that, they, they really tried to force, like, Oki was over, but, like, the, uh, in South Korea, pro wrestling did not was not able to survive the decades the way that it did in Japan. But anyway, getting back to all of this, so he keeps holding this WWA heavyweight title, and he gets um, let me look this up. He um, the WWA was using this other belt as like an interim title. And when the Japanese wrestling press reported that, you know, Toyonobori is not defending the WWA title, he's <laughs> – so these other guys are doing an interim title. Toyonobori finally goes over to L.A. for this unification match. And, he's like, I think the first match they do with Luke Graham, he goes over. But then in a rematch, he gets disqualified, but he loses the belts, which is like this kayfabe thing to, like, protect him while making sure they didn't burn their bridge with their only only stateside ally. So that's when you come up with the uh, – that is the origin of the NWA international – or not the NWA, the second international heavyweight title. That's the title that Baba held in the JWA that would later be the belt that Oki held. This is convoluted belt stuff. Anyway, with all of this, because Toyono Bori was using the the company vault as his own betting fund, just this this guy loved horse racing. Like he would inspect paddocks. He would like inspect. He he thought that he could figure out uh, what horse would win by like inspecting its manure. That like this this guy really needed like some budget people, and he just didn't get it. Oh and man, that's so crazy. So eventually. Toy Nobori, he gets, he, he, he leaves the, he, he is no longer president. And at one point I think he says, oh, Ricky Dozon always wanted to have another branch of the JWA in Osaka. I'm going to go over here and start this new promotion in Osaka. And the other guys are like, no, you're going, you're trying to start a new promotion. And sure enough, that's what he's trying to do. And like, and we're almost to Inoki here. In Toyo Bori, he goes to this friend of his who's going to be very important in the New Japan story named Hisashi Shinma. Hisashi Shinma was this old workout buddy of Toyo Nobori's in the 50s. He was now working for uh, Max Factor, this cosmetics manufacturer, very important people actually, a uh, company actually invented lip gloss. So Shinma has, he comes from money because his father is the head of this uh, Buddhist uh, temple. And that's actually, like, you know, that doesn't mean he's a monk. That means he, like, there's some money there. And <laughs> he goes to this story that, like, he, Shinma goes into Toy and Abori's apartment at the end of 65, and Shinma's like, I've got all this money. Let's start a new promotion. And Shinma's got this, like, mattress with a bunch of money under it because, of course, Toy and Obori is the kind of guy who puts money under his mattress. <laughs> Hey, he, he, this was the 1960s. Again, this is the old school way. Maybe he didn't trust any kind of banking system. It's just like, I just need to have this in case I... Oh, no, there is one bank. The bank is Toyon Obori. <laughs> <laughs> so Toyon Obori starts... There was a bunch of people that he wanted to leave 
the com- he was going to try to get them to uh, leave and join him in this new company that would be called Tokyo Pro Wrestling. He had this dream team. And a lot of people, there's a lot of interesting names. Like he wanted like Maza or well, Maza Saito does come, but he wanted a bunch of people that didn't come. So most of the people in the JWA, like Kantaro Hoshino and Kotetsu Yamamoto and Great Kojika, a bunch of people who had like been with, with kind of in Toyota Bori's posse, they don't join him in Tokyo Pro, but some people do like uh, Maz- Mazao Kimura, the future Russia Kimura, Maza Saito. Um, but he has, but Toyo Nobori needs an ace in the hole. And Toyo Nobori decides he's going to grab Inoki. So Inoki, in March 1966, is hanging out in a hotel in Hawaii. He's about to, he's about to come back to the JWA for the World League. And Toyo Nobori rushes over and he gets to Inoki. We don't know what was said, but he goes over to Inoki and he says, you know, they're never going to push you above Baba. You're always going to be number two. You know, if you come with me, I'm going to make you a star. And uh, Inoki decided, he decided to go with uh, Toyo Nobori. <laughs> and, you know, shortly after that, Toyo Nobori, in a supposedly magnanimous gesture, named Inoki the president of Tokyo Pro. But what he was actually doing was transferring all of his debt to Inoki. Oh, something we forgot. Uh, I feel very dumb for not bringing this up earlier. Uh, Toyo Bori was the one who named Antonio Inoki. <laughs> Toyo Bori was the one who came up with all these those ring names in the early 60s. Like, uh, Umanosuke Ueda was a, a ring. Like, Toyo Bori loved to, like, reference, like, old, like, historical characters in his names. Like, Kotetsu Yamamoto was, like, named after some samurai, I think. So that's another thing, that's another legacy of Toyo Nobori's was all these names, or Kabuki for a long time went for, by Akahisa Takachiho, that's another Toyo Nobori name. Um, so anyway, so Inoki has joined Toyo Nobori, he's joined Tokyo Pro, and he realizes that, <laughs> how much of a mistake he's made, because uh, Toyo Nobori, was had like a million yen that he was supposed to give to Inoki as an advance but he'd actually gambled all of it already. <laughs> um, the, another thing was, like, the other guy that Toyo Nobori had, Tadaharu Tanaka, who was, like, the head trainer of the JWA, he misappropriated, like, all of the money that was supposed to be for their training camps. So when they got trainees, they didn't, they couldn't afford to build a ring. They had to actually t- train these guys on a beach. They couldn't even afford rice for them. So anyway... In the midst of this, Inoki is probably, you know, his world's crumbling around him, and he flies back to America to try to get in touch with Sonny Myers, and it's like, hey, man, can you help me get some talent? And luckily, the JWA is not a member of the NWA at this point, so there is nothing blocking Tokyo Pro from doing, like, I think, I think Sonny Myers, like, actually got approval from, like, Sam Muchnick to book people for this uh, Tokyo, first Tokyo Pro Tour, he brings over Johnny Valentine and Johnny Powers. Those are like the two biggest names here. Uh, Johnny Powers had this heavyweight, uh, had this, I think it was called the U.S. heavyweight title. I forgot what territory it was out of. But that's an interest. So in October 6th. And uh, not to interrupt you again, but just uh, first of all, we'll be talking more about Johnny Powers <laughs> in the next oh, day. Yeah, yeah. Johnny Powers uh, is a very important guy. Yeah, in Inoki's career, but just from the, the – again, this is just uh, kind of me pontificating, hearing this story, and we're talking about Inoki's story now, but again, all the way to the back, we're going to all the way, this guy's had a really rough time before he got into wrestling, and when he got into wrestling, he was basically the low man on the totem pole of his era. You know, Bob, he was seeing Baba get all these opportunities and special treatment, and he was getting treated like crap pretty much. Right. So he goes through all of this. He can't even get his excursions until way later on. So now he comes back. I can see why he would have been motivated to want to break out on his own, you know, just realistically knowing those circumstances, even though obviously it was the wrong person uh, to, to link up with. But I can see from his perspective on why uh, things happen that way. And that is – and you'll notice later on that – and maybe it's just because Inoki was a bigger name, but – the guys who left the JWA to join Tokyo Pro, Maza Saito and uh, Russia Kimura, like the JWA kind of cons- like considered them as like burned bridges. Like after Tokyo Pro falls apart, uh, Maza Saito and Russia Kimura were like living in the same apartment waiting for the JWA to call them back. And they never did. 
Uh, Masa Saito would work with the JWA later on, but that was after he had made a name in Los Angeles and he was just doing it for a tour on a freelance basis. So Inoki, they finally, so Tokyo Pro does their first and really only tour in the last months of uh, 1966. Uh, this is significant for Inoki because he does the, he works this program with uh, Johnny Valentine and they're actually the first uh, wrestling show. They're, they headline the first wrestling show at Osaka Stadium, the the base, the ballpark over there. Uh, that's a significant venue because a year later, Giant Baba had this very famous match with uh, Gene Kaniski, and then there was one of the matches with Bruno San Martino. And I think after that, there was only like one other show. I think Maeda, like there was like an early uh, UWF 2.0 show in the Osaka Stadium. But that's an important. That's a Really interesting tidbit there, but uh, Tokyo Pro they're th- they're wanting to get a television deal, but that's not coming through. Toy Onobori is just not chilling with his embezzlement, and it gets to the point where the talent revolt. <laughs> oh, I should say there's one show in December where uh, they they like they it gets to a point where they they actually like refuse to do the show and it's like an hour late and some like I think somebody like the money refuses to go through or something and the people the spectators who've been waiting at this cult like this this outdoor show in the dead of winter set fire to the ring. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you you could tell that things have gone so so very very quickly for that. I did read I was reading something about it though where Noki gave this interview where he was basically like kind of speculating like jumping off of what I said a minute ago, how he was getting, you know, he was facing abuse and stuff like, as a young guy in JWA. And he wanted to make sure that that didn't happen in Tokyo in Tokyo Pro Wrestling. And he was trying to fight for the young guys that they could get and try and make it more personal. But unfortunately, it obviously was not working out in any way pretty much as a company. Unfortunately. That is an interesting thing with Inoki because later on, something that we I do want to address with is how – New Japan, it is still a vertical culture. You, you can't have a, you couldn't, you couldn't not have that vertical cult, like hierarchical culture. But, uh, New Japan softened up a lot of that old sumo, like old sumo culture pretty significantly. While interestingly, while we always think of All Japan as a much more Americanized company, that, uh, All Japan kind of inherited that baggage of the old, it was because of the sumo when the JWA went under. I think it was like the people like Kojika going back into all going into all Japan that kind of kind of held that culture and that old like sumo milieu or miyu for uh, like that. That is an interesting thing that we'll definitely talk about later. Is an interesting story with Shiro Koshinaka that really oh, yeah. illustrates that. But uh, with Tokyo Pro, so they finally reach a deal. So by this point. By uh, early '67, um, another co- another promotion has started up, Kokusai, or the International Wrestling Enterprise, with uh, Isao Yoshiwara at the head, and um, uh, they do the, uh, Tokyo Pro. So Inoki actually creates a new Tokyo Pro. Everybody in the company except Toyonobori and Tadaharu Tanaka join Inoki in this new Tokyo Pro. And this Tokyo Pro helps the IWE out on its first tour, uh, which is in January 1967. They're hoping that some money will go through, that, that, like, television money will go through. They've got some, they've got a connection with Hiro Matsuda, who's, like, working as a sleeper agent for Eddie Graham, because Eddie Graham is actually wanting to take over the IWE for himself. Very, very fun little story there. Um, but anyway, so, uh, you know, uh, after this first tour, I think it was called the, the, the Pioneer Series in uh, January 67, Tokyo Pro just totally falls apart. Inoki gets in these lawsuits with uh, Toy Nobori and Shinma for, like, embezzlement. Um, eventually what happens is, like I said earlier, Inoki was the, – uh, the JWA – had a little more mercy for Inoki. They sympathized with him a little more than the other people who had left to join Tokyo Pro. So there's this guy, this uh, guy who had become the commissioner after Bamboku Ono died, the JWA commissioner, this uh, politician named uh, Shojiro Kawashima. Uh, Kawashima uh, mediates to help get Inoki back into the JWA. And, uh, and also, Inoki, as part of this package deal, 
he also brings uh, his valets, uh, Motoyuki Kitazawa, who actually did was he's the only other guy besides Inoki who was in the JWA, left with Tokyo Pro, and then got to come back in. Kitazawa will later be Shoji Kai and New Japan. He worked for a decade. The other two are Tokyo Pro trainees, Haruka Egen and Katsuhisa Shibata, uh, father of Katsuyori Shibata. So that's how Shibata got his start. That's how he got in with Inoki. He was his valet, and uh, Inoki looked out for him and brought him back with him to the JWA. Yeah, and I could see at this time, again, I think a big part of that, and this is just speculation, it could have been the others that they were really disenfranchised with were there at the time. Inoki was on excursion when all of this happened, and it feels like he just got swept up in their plans more so than necessarily. It's hard to say he was a part of the plan when he was away in this other country in 1960. Right, right. Years. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, I believe they do – I think they do this angle around, like, in June where like, Inoki storms the ring. Like, Bobby Baba's defending his title against somebody who, like, attacks him after the match or something, and Inoki comes in in plain clothes to defend him. So at this point, he does, like, fairly early on in this May tour back with the JWA, he does team with Baba for the first time. It's this match against uh, Mike DiBiase and Waldo Von Eric. But their team does not really take off until October in the year. So we're getting into, like, J- the Inoki back into the, the JWA. Uh, on one hand, he wins, um, I think in, in May, he wins the All-Asia Tag Team title, which the oldest uh, – all this belt still still used today, uh, if you not counting unifications. Uh, he wins it with Michiaki Yoshimura in May. Um, then he goes and uh, you know I just want to say real quick that now listening to this, I think we can all agree and we can all finally settle the rumor, settle the the debate that's been having. You could draw a direct line to, from Antonio Inoki to Hikaru Sato. The what have the current All Asia Tag Team Champions? Oh, and yeah. I, I, yeah, and also you know uh, Inoki. We will get later on Inoki the NWA United National Title. One of the Triple Crown belts is um, that that was originally a, the Inoki title. We'll get into that. The reason why that belt came into being in a couple of years. So October sixty seven. That's this is when the meat of the stuff happens. Uh, we have. Uh, this is when they really throw their weight because uh, Michiaki Oshimura was – he was the last of the, the four wrestler council to still be wrestling. And Yoshimura, like, you know, from the, the footage that survives, I actually think he was probably the best worker of the first generation of Japanese wrestling. When I say, say first gen, I mean those people, like I said earlier, who were pseudo-amateur wrestling. Uh, Yoshimura is – I think he might have been – I know there's also re- – like – the referees were involved in booking, but I know that uh, Yoshimura was called the on-site manager, which is like the euphemistic term that they give Choshu when he was the booker in New Japan. So I think Yoshimura was actually the book. And if you watch him, this very good talent. Um, anyway, Baba and Yoshimura drop the NWA international tag titles, or they're not NWA yet. They don't join until 68. Um in October to get over uh, Bill, the team of Bill Watts and Tarzan Tyler. Now, on that tour in October, and this is when Inoki and Yoshimura are holding the All-Asia titles, uh, Inoki and Baba team up. They um, beat Watts and Tyler that tour to uh, become the uh, NWA, inter- or, again, international tag team title. I'm just going to say NWA. You guys know what I mean. Yes, the unofficial t- NWA title at this point. <laughs> that, that, that certific- it's, it's a part in the anachronism. So the NWA um, – or not NWA. Uh, so, like, I guess we just – we um, I guess things are sailing high. Um, there We go into 68. I, I believe Inoki and Baba actually have to vacate the titles – because or because Inoki got stuck in a snowstorm, they they weren't supposed to put over the team. It was Inoki couldn't make the show. <laughs> well, listen, you, when you face Inoki and Baba, you take your wins however you can get them, even if it's just yeah, because absolutely. you can't. But uh, I just want to say one thing about uh, this team with Inoki and Baba. The B.I. Ho team is like so influential 
Like, they still are, like, referenced even in the modern day. Like, uh, not that many, not that long ago, uh, it was that in Stardom, the Joshi promotion, uh, the team was BY Ho, uh, Kari Ho, oh, okay. you know? They still, they still use that, that acronym. And this, and I just want to say one thing about them before you get out here. Because, uh, this team is basically, uh, you know, the, the BI Ho, it was like BI Cannon, right? In, in well, BI Cannon, that was a mistranslation that I perpetuated. It's more like B.I. Platoon or B. It's like B.I. Gun. Yeah, like, yeah. So, but it yeah. was a it was a reference to the baseball tandem. Yes. Uh, uh, Owen and Ho. Uh, Sa- so, o N. Sadaharu yeah. O and Shigeo Nagashima, and that's significant because they were the they they were the ace team for the Yomiuri Giants. Actually, the person who came up with B.I. Gun was Kazuo Tokumitsu, who was the head announcer for the JWA broadcast at the time. Tokumitsu would later become uh, Nippon Television's big baseball commentator, and he's somebody who has kind of stayed in the wrestling business. Like, if you've watched clips of Misawa's funeral, Tokumitsu is speaking at it. Anyway, interesting thing about that nickname is that it does kind of – it kind of extends to the way that Baba and Inoki worked, because if you – because Sadaharu O oh was the greatest – he is the uh, – for those who do not know, Sadaharu O oh, – holds the home run world league the home the record for most home runs in any professional baseball league. Yeah, eight hundred this is sixty eight home runs, over a hundred more than Barry Bonds in the MLB. Uh there's a I was one of the BC oh it was the BC boys, I got more hits than Sadaharu O. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's that's the track off Paul's Paul's boutique. I forgot which one. But um anyway, but so like him, Baba is the one who hits the home run but Inoki is the one who loads and runs the bases. And the interesting thing about uh, Biagun is that that actually, that actually is reflected in both of their tag teams or their most significant tag teams after that. If we look at Baba and Jumbo and Inoki and Sakaguchi, they are kind of like refracted versions of this Biagun dynamic because later on in the seventies, you'll see, you know, uh, Jumbo cannot really do what Inoki, he was not trained to do what Inoki did. He was, he was, and uh, Jumbo was trained to very specifically be a response to the, the early 70s NWA title match. So they, like Dory Funk Jr., Jack Briscoe, he's part of that lineage. But if you watch like old Baba Jumbo matches, even like, er, like fairly early on, Jumbo is the one who's doing a lot of the motion in the ring, and it, and Baba is the one who is being conserved for like like big decisive moments that allow Jumbo to put everything together. That's something, and and I think the same thing. It's kind of like that with Inoki and Sakaguchi, where Sakaguchi is more of a pinch hitter in the situation than somebody who's doing it all the time. Um, so that's I think that's an interesting thing to to note there. So in 1968. Uh, this is an important year because this is when Inoki really gets on with Carl Gotch. Yes, Gotch was around in 61 in the JWA uh, because I, I think Gotch and Great Antonio were like the first Europeans to really work in the JWA, and that's because they were North American based. Uh, they both get booked in 61. There's this uh, horribly butchered but still really great match uh, with Gotch and Yoshimura from that first tu- from tour in 60, 61. Anyway, um, Gotch gets a one-year coaching contract with the JWA, and this is when he trains, uh, he, tra- he instructs a lot of the people who will later go on to do New Japan, and I think he might have trained some people who wouldn't even, who wouldn't join New Japan later, like Mazi, I think he might have done something with Mazi Okoma, who was the original head coach of All Japan, but anyway, Gotch is the one who teaches Inoki, uh, but that's where Inoki start the, the, the genesis of the Inoki myth is in there, that he was, he was working, the, the genesis of Strong Style is that it's this, this, Euro, that, you know, it's based on European catch wrestling, which at this point was nearly, like, even got, even by Gotch's time, like, you know, Gotch always said, uh, that, you know, he wasn't the best catch wrestler. He had to reverse engineer a lot of what he knew just because all the good guys had died in the war. Um, but anyway, this all, this all kind of comes to a head, this, this, the early block of Inoki's myth in 1969. So there was yet another wrestling promotion that almost 
competed in Japan. This guy named the Great Togo, who had been a booker, uh, who had been like Baba's manager, and during his excursion, and like it, the Great Togo is his own thing. But Togo was going to try to create his own uh, promotion with apparently with Luthez's money, though I think Luthez was actually kind of deceived by this guy. Um, and Togo was one was shopping around to try to get television. But so so all this is important is what I'm saying is um, this is what leads the JWA to start pursuing a second television deal. Now, the, the, they start bidding with uh, – I actually – I can actually start going to my big thing, Broken Crown, is um, it was something – Kokichi Endo, one of the big executives, he had a friend in, uh, in the uh, net TV management, and he starts working um, – they, they, they start courting. So Net TV is what is now TV Asahi. Net TV started as this educational uh, television pr- uh, channel with fairly limited coverage. Um, and so Endo starts to court a deal with them. And Nippon Television accepts it on a few conditions. No Baba, no World League, no Sakaguchi, and no, ti- uh, no like, like, like title defenses, I think. That, that's what the original thing was. So all of this is the reason why Inoki wins his first singles tournament, the World League in 1969. They they have this uh so they were hyping up uh Inoki's new move, the Octopus Stretch or there was a fan vote to give it another nickname which would be the Manjigatame. So there's the World League in 69 and the the way that they book it is interesting because this is going to come up again a couple years later. They book it to where there are two natives and two foreigners tied at the end of it. So Giant Baba, Antonio Inoki, Bobo Brazil, and Chris Markoff. And what they do to make this work without having Baba have to wrestle Inoki is that they have the two, uh, they flip coins to see who, well, which, uh, which native wrestler will wrestle each, for, which foreign wrestler in, in a, you know, in a deciding match. And then, on the condition, and if both Inoki and Baba won their matches, then they would have had to do a playoff against each other. So they do this thing where uh, Baba and Brazil go to a 30-minute time limit draw, but Inoki goes over Markov, debuting the Octopus Stretch, which had been shown in hype packages, which had been built up as this new move that he had invented. He hadn't really invented it, but, <laughs> you know, it's the Inoki myth. Um Hey, they still they still use that trick to this day, where you you hype up a new move. Not that long ago, Jake Lee in All Japan was building up his new moon salt that he was bringing out of training, and then they, he actually did it in a match after they had showed it on a, a videos beforehand. So yeah, and so in July they start. So we have to note that this is the start of what will tear the JWA apart: having these two television deals, one with Net and one with Nippon Television. Um, it's going to tear. It, it's not quite a brand split as we commonly think about it because everybody worked at the same shows. But due to the network exclusivity, you would have different shows being taping dates for different networks, and because of that, this these factions start to emerge in the company. Um, and this is where we start to get to like Ino- some like classic early Inoki matches. Like um, he has a draw with Dory Funk Jr for the NWA title in uh, December 69. That's one of the big, like, early Inoki matches that still survives. Um, and there's another thing, what's I going to say? Um, oh, yeah, another thing that's interesting about early World Pro Wrestling is that Kokichi Endo gets to become a commentator, and he is terrible at it. He's, like, considered, oh. the, like, the worst commentator in the history of, like, Pro Resu. There's a famous call in, like, the, the first Dory Inoki match where he's like, uh, where Dory gets a, a wins a pinfall with a, a butterfly, and he's like, oh, it's a Texas suplex that must win over a German suplex. And I think that might be why Fire Pro Wrestling still calls the butterfly a Texas suplex, even though Billy Robinson invented it. <laughs> anyway, um, this this uh, you have this net World Pro Wrestling Network uh, doing, and and it's also show spotlighting some other stars like the I think this is. 
a really sad thing is that we don't have any early footage of the Yamaha brothers, who were this excellent tag team in early New Japan that we just don't have enough of. I, when you watch, like, Hoshino and Yamamoto, and those guys, you can tell that they were really like the, the blueprint for a certain very energetic kind of New Japan tag team style. Like, they were the antecedent of what Choshu was doing in tag matches, really. Uh, like, Choshu and Hamaguchi were basically Yamaha brothers updated for the 80s. But, uh, anyway, to get... And that was considered very flu- influential as well, when Choshu was able to bring that style to... Oh, of course. Yeah. Like, the, the way he goes into All Japan and yeah. irrevocably changes them. It, yeah, absolutely. And, and you could trace it back to the Yamaha brothers here, which, by the way, I've seen a little bit of them. And, yeah, you're right. Uh, every time I've seen them, they're, like, really, really strong teams. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a shame, because, uh, I guess, skipping ahead a little bit, the reason they, 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 the reason we don't have as much of them is because Ken, um, Inoki asked Kotetsu Yamamoto to become a commentator to uh, step away from the ring. And, like, Yamamoto only did – Yamamoto was like, I still have five good years left in me. But Inoki was like, no, I don't want a sports writer to do color commentary. I want to actually have a wrestler do it again. And that's how he got uh, that role. And really, I guess we can talk about this later – one of the influences of New Japan is that they really helped codify the modern announcing format if, if for, like, Japanese wrestling. They, mm-hmm. if, like, uh, if, like, we'll talk a little later on, Ichiro Furutachi was kind of the blueprint for, like, the Kenji Wakabayashi, yeah. you know, the, the, that's what you hear at the beginning of this, this podcast, uh, that sort of histrionic, like, spirited style, that's, Furutachi's the one who starts that, and Yamamoto is the one who kind of, after Endo, did not reflect after Endo. Yamamoto was the one who kind of redeemed the idea of having a wrestler on color commentary. So, and which is that, you know, that's kind of the standard format to this day. Now, uh, back to the JWA in 1971, I guess let, let's skip ahead to 1971. So the, it's uh, two years ago, Inoki had won that world league with um, uh, that uh, with against Chris Markov. Now, in 1971, they do the same trick, but this time the foreigners are, oh, is it, it's the Destroyer and, oh, Abdullah the Butcher. Uh, uh, this is like the first real big Abdullah the Butcher thing in Japan is the, the 1971 World League. But this time what happens is Baba gets the win because Baba gets to go over Abdullah the Butcher while I think, I think Inoki versus Destroyer ends in a double count out because we, we have that match. Um and what happens is Inoki goes uh, after the match. They have this media scrum, and there's actually, if you look on my Broken Crown, the Fall of Japan Pro Wrestling site on my blog, there's a photo of when Inoki does this. He walks up to Baba and says, "Hey, what, I, I think we should, you know, what I think what the people here would like to see is a champion versus champion match." Because oh my god, I I just I forgot. I I I set this up and I forgot to to pay it off uh, because. They weren't going to have Baba drop the. They weren't going to have Baba the, uh, risk dropping the title. Baba dropping the and what is the NWA International Heavyweight Title at this point? They're not going to have him drop that on to Inoki. So what they have to do in order to keep this 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 network thing running is they have to come up with this other title. So they they have that they have like the NWA United National Title, which Inoki goes to win for like John Tolos and in March '71. So uh, now it's like NWA United National versus NWA International Heavyweight. That's the the nucleus of this Baba versus Inoki dream match that never happens. Um, as and, and apparently Baba was like like Inoki actually tried to go like I think he was he he I, I think he knew he wasn't going to make this happen. He was kind of he was just going through the channels to probably to kind of get himself over. And Baba was actually mad about this like. Yoshimura actually had to beg Baba, like, okay, like, you guys need to defend your tag titles. Like, Baba, like, Baba just didn't want to wrestle with him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, like, the thing is, these kind of politics would continue on and on throughout, not just Japanese wrestling, but specifically these two, <laughs> when they oh. broke off, uh, then we would see a lot more of these kind of antics where you're doing wait, stuff for show. Until we get to 1975. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I have got some juicy info for 1975. So, anyway, um, here you go. Let me look again. So, 
now we're going into like late, I guess now it's time for me to kind of recap how Inoki gets out of New Japan or gets kicked out of New Japan. Or so I wrote a big thing about this. Oh, that, you know, back in, uh, back in December. And I know more about this subject than I did back then, but yeah, and maybe I'll pepper a little bit of that in, but I won't give you, I won't go into excruciating detail, but basically the JWA was not the best managed company in the world. Uh, <laughs> by any means they were, uh, there was like this, uh, uh, Inoki, the, one of the people that was like running his personal company was this accountant named Akimasa Kimura, who was also like a promoter. And what happens is Kimura gets a hold of this secret ledger and the secret ledger shows that there was this like mysterious 50 million yen payment that was made and nobody knows what this 50 million yen payment is about. And I think something like there's this might, cause Inoki was making statements like great Kojika once mentioned that he was in LA in 1970 that uh, Inoki was like, we need to clean up the company, you know, to help get them, make the money, get the money flowing better. Um, so right after Inoki has his second marriage, I should note real quick, uh, during his first excursion, he married his first wife, a woman named Diana. Uh, they split up sometime after he returned to Japan. I believe he was unfaithful. It's a sad story. It was like a tour in Southeast Asia. She leaves. They had a daughter, and I, I think the daughter died when uh, she was like eight years old. Sad story. Yeah, I read that too. Oh, about yeah. his first daughter dying, yeah. Yeah, so Inoki marries his second, he, you know, he finds love again with uh, actress Mitsuko Baisho, who will do a lot to help New Japan behind the scenes uh, early on. She does, there is, it's a misconception that Baisho was directly putting her money into New Japan, but she was definitely supporting them. But anyway, so in late 1971, uh, Inoki gets together with the Akimasa Kimura and Umanosuke Ueda and Giant Baba. They're all in on this, and they're going to try to reform the company. They're, at this point, what they're wanting to do is, like, they're going to call a meeting. They're going to, like, have everybody sign a paper. Then they're going to go to uh, the board of directors, and they're going to have, like, some, like, internal review or something. They're going to have Kimura, like, audit everything, and they're going to – then one thing that they're, like, there's actually a big disagree. there's actually some disagreement with Inoki – between Inoki and Baba because – Inoki kind of Inoki kind of wants scorched earth. Like he wants to make Endo, Yoshino Sato, and Yoshimura all all go. But Baba is like, yeah, Endo needs to go. I, I'll, I'll concede that. But I think you're being a little harsh with the others, or at the very least, we can't have this all going on at once because from the outside, it's going to look like this company is in shambles. Because I think at this point, the JWA was actually declining in attendance by '71. Um, and we talked about, isn't it funny how this has happened in other companies as well, but the history of JWA multiple times, in fact, has happened where, like, the higher things got and the better it got, it inched closer to the collapse at the same time. It's like, you were, you know, you're always on the verge of falling off, and then you would see if things turn out how they would in this situation. Yeah, uh, uh, New Japan is always, like, we know about how turbulent New Japan was in the 80s, but yeah. some of the stuff I've been translating um, – has been indicating that it was it was kind of touch and go for a while, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, like before that, so um, anyway, so they 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 organize the they go to the locker room and they're like, hey, uh, you know, can we all sign this paper? Two people don't sign. Kentaro Oki doesn't sign, and Seiji Sakaguchi doesn't sign. Or, or three people. The other person who doesn't sign is Mazanori Taguchi, who was the later Kim Duck, who was Oki's valet at the time. Sakaguchi doesn't sign because he doesn't really want to get involved with network politics. That's he like he's kind of the he was at this point in time he was kind of like a jumbo kind of like that jumbo was kind of infamous for being very hands off, not wanting to deal with the backstage. But Oki is a little more am, like o Oki's I, I Oki's um. Oki is what doesn't sign because it's like he's he wants to use that as leverage because o Oki potentially wants to he, he wants to he wants to get himself over because uh, at this point there's like 
I don't want to go down into the. You could do an whole ep- whole episode about Kentaro Oki, like yeah. the reason why Luthez shot on him, or what, the reason why he shot on Luthez and ended up in the hospital in '64 is because like the people in the JWA Association, the Yakuza people, were wanting to expand into North Korea or South Korea, and they were like, uh, they they like for like Yoshino Sato once said that like they were they, the JWA or the shareholder guys tried to for were going to force him to call. Kentaro Oki, Ricky Dozon, so that they could have uh, K- Kentaro Oki go get over in South Korea. And apparently Yoshin Asato's like, yeah, we'll let you do that if you beat Lou. And apparently that's the reason why Lou, he thought he shot on Luthez. So there's like, there, Oki's a very interesting guy. And like in, six, in 68, there's, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. There's this whole thing I don't, about I don't almost, him almost joining the IWE because, um, like he he very like but he like he gets threats over the phone and, and it's like that that's the famous incident where they go into the great Togo's hotel room and just beat the crap out of him. Uh, <laughs> so that's the thing. Like this was a this was like the Wild West era. You oh, can tell yeah. the, the the company was just no like. I uh, you know, think big thing right now is as we're recording this is AEW. There's been all kinds of fights backstage. <laughs> everyone's saying HR. Where is it? Let's let's look at the seventies, in the early seventies and late sixties. Here, there was no HR to even be thought of in this the, the story because Yusef Turk was so. Yusef Turk will later be an important figure in early New Japan. He was the one who did, who like beat Great Togo, and the story is that he got suspended, but but uh, openly, but then he got a round the world ticket <laughs> as a reward for because they had the, with Togo. The thing with is so Togo was working with the IWE in early sixty eight. And he was breaking a promise because so they had paid Oki off or Togo off right after Ricky Dozon died to like never work in Japan again because everybody knew like Togo was ripping everyone off. <laughs> He's like, and and hey, sure. it comes back around to him though at the yeah, end. It does. So anyway, um, the what happens is so they so Baba thinks that what is happening with the with the, Baba thinks that him and Inoki and Kimura are all on the same page. But then partway through the tour, Ueda comes up to, or, or Endo, I think it's like Endo actually interrogates Ueda, and it comes out that the plan is a little different. The plan is that Inoki wants, what, so there, there was this day where they, like, the, the, um, they were gonna be, I think it was, uh, the JWA management was going to be out golfing with some, like, with, like, some, like, uh, sports coaches or something, and, what the, so, you know, so Kimura was going to go into, like, the articles of incorporation, like, the documentation for the company, basically cross out their names and put <laughs> <and> Kimura. <laughs> Some, like, cartoon stuff. <laughs> like, it is a very funny image. That's why, like, everything we're talking about right now, in Noki's early life, from his early, early life, like, as a kid, to now, it's like stuff you couldn't write in a movie because everyone would think, oh, this will like, this isn't realistic. <laughs> like, this couldn't happen. So and and there is this um so they so and when this comes out apparently uh Endo like calls Baba over to this place where they're like interrogating Ueda and Baba doesn't know anything about this and what eventually happens is Baba realizes like we're about like this is about to be like a t- like like they're about to go too far and uh so the story that was always I don't know if this is true this is probably somewhat embellished just because of the way that pro wrestling journalism worked, but the story was that when, uh, let me look at this, what I wrote. Um, so Kimura does become the auditor, and the story is that Baba what comes into the JWA office just as Kimura is going into the safe, and the other guys are playing poker in the room, and Baba just... <laughs> And, and Baba says, "No, he's going to he's gonna he's gonna change the articles of incorporation." So he gets re- his privileges revoked as auditor. Uh, no, there's this big meeting with like Inoki, uh, where Inoki's like <laughs> he gets mad at Ueda because you know he ratted him out. And uh, they, they're still at, at this point. They're not going to fire. They, I don't think that they're not going. They're, they're, they're not immediately trying to fire him. I think, like, Inoki actually apologizes to, like, Yoshino Sato, who by this point is president, after the meeting. But what happens is Kentaro Oki rounds up all these people 
who want Inoki gone, and they petition to like like work like they almost like threaten to go on strike if Inoki is not kicked off of the two out of the company. And Yoshino Sato was like, like guys, we have to finish the tour first. You, you can't, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, people paid money for this. Now, so it looks like, so like, and this is, I think it's the same. So it's like the meeting that where this happened, where everything got got exposed, was like the same day that uh, the last JWA Inoki match on tape that survives is him defending the United National Title against Dick Murdoch. So. Um, let me go down. So on December 7th, this is after that big meeting has happened, um, Inoki is scheduled to, and Baba are scheduled to defend their tag titles against the Funks. Um, and uh, what happens is I think Inoki loses the first fall, and then Baba and Terry trade falls. So and this is, uh, so they, they lose the titles. And what happens is uh, Yusuf Turk, who I mentioned earlier, at this point, Yusuf Turk is one of the companies. He was a former wrestler, but he, at this point, he was one of the referees. He had caught wind that they were going to ambush, like they were going to beat the crap out of Inoki in this locker room. So he actually guides Inoki into the waiting room on the other side of the venue where all the foreigners go. And he actually, like, he, he's like, because Turk, like I said before, Turk was the one who ambushed Togo. He knows yes. how these operations work. He goes, Inoki, check yourself into a hospital. They can't do, they, they can't touch you if you do that. So. That's they, a genius that's what, idea. So they, they take him to, uh, he checks into this clinic. Uh, Mexico by show, his wife comes in and uh, gives a certificate for, uh, like, a medical certificate. Basically giving him, like, the, like, the, 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 the when, you know, when you're, you're, you were sick in school, like you, the, the yeah, your doctor's note. <laughs> yeah, your doctor, he brings in the doctor's note, and he and like Sakaguchi gets slotted in for the the title match at the last minute because he was going to do another NWA defense against Dory. So now Inoki is like he gets they announced in like December thirteenth, I think, that he was fired. Uh, there's a great picture on my blog post that I found before this site, this this blog. Uh, there was a bunch of blogs that got lost because Teacup started off, stopped offering services. There's a great picture on this uh, post where you see Anoki's portrait is removed from the uh, the JWA office wall, where you've got the big five wrestlers, and it's like just just it was Oki, Anoki, Baba, Yoshimura, and Sakaguchi, but his is gone. So anyway, the first time uh, apparently. Inoki's first move was to try to get back into the JWA. Like, he asked, I think, at Suzuburo Shina, who was, like, the, the politician who was also commissioner to get in, and he failed. And, and they, they say, you know, he, it was no use. He couldn't get in. So um, I guess that, that could lead us into New Japan. <laughs> yeah, the one thing I will say is that uh, I love this whole story just because of how nuts it is. And you see some of the write-ups is like, well, Inoki tried to take over the company and it didn't work. And he, <laughs> he got ran out. But there's so much other stuff behind it. So I love that we got into that. There was a question and something that I read, and we can talk about it a little bit. I'm going to ask you about what, what you think of this. I had read that his wedding to Mitsuko Baisho was like legendary. Extra, oh, yeah. It's like a know. five-meter wedding cake. Yeah. 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 And that was a big reason why he was trying, like, why he ended up getting all this debt on him, and he was hoping that the company would be able to pay the debt for him. You know, like, I would not be shocked. Uh, I have never, I have never seen that connection made myself. But I like, and and don't take me me as the authority here, but you know that's that's plausible, certainly. Uh, <laughs> so let's so yeah, let's, have, go to New Japan. let's lay, yeah, let's start with uh, New Japan. So. Inoki, he kind of, like, him and Kimura do one last press conference where he's like, you know, like, really, guys, these guys were corrupt, you know? <laughs> like, 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 we were, right, like, 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 uh, history will vindicate me, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> That's awesome. And, but what happens is um, he finally breaks his silence around, like, December of, or, like, Christmas of 71, and he's he's preparing to form his own promotion. He's he's got this. Him and Baisho had just gotten this house that was. I think it was like it. The house was it was this big house that had been owned by this famous singer, but like people thought it was haunted because I think I, I think like a maid had committed suicide or something. So it was like <laughs> there was this like hey, this, there was that hanging over this house that they bought. They had, they had started to build a dojo. 
Um, and they got – so at this point, we should say the original roster at this point is uh, Inoki, Kotetsu Yamamoto, who was like – who was, you know, by his side during – as this stuff was going down in the JW and the JWA, but also their respective valets, Tatsumi Fujinami and uh, 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 Osamu Kido. Those are like the first four wrestlers. And then you also have on the business end, you have Akimasa Kimura, uh, Yusuf Turk, who would actually become a, the original booker of New Japan. Uh, and then you have uh, some other, like, I don't want to get, I've been actually translating a big thing about like the sales stuff in New Japan. And, you know, maybe in a couple months I'll have more information on that because it takes a long time for me to translate these documents. Anyway, um, the the interesting thing I want to get to it. It's like uh, Inoki. They they go to New York and they he 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 calls in with uh, at this point. So Gotch after that first year had kind of he backed away from the business because you, know, th- you know with television things weren't things weren't really amenable to his style anymore. So he was just doing like a cleaning business in Hawaii for like a year or two, and then he start he, the way that cut that way that Carl got his groove back was the IWE actually picked him up for a tour. And I guess that got him back into this because there's there's very famous him and uh, Billy Robinson had a bunch of matches against each other on that tour. Sadly, no uh, broad. There's like, there is actually some eight millimeter footage of one of them, but besides that, nothing. But anyway, by this point, gosh, you know, he's got his, he's gotten a step back and he's uh, in the WWF. He's uh, doing uh, tag titles with, uh, He's holding him with, uh, what was his name? Rene Goulet, Rene Goulet. And Gotch, now the thing is, New Japan cannot actually afford to hire Gotch as a wrestler full-time. You'll notice if you look at the New Japan cards, he only works like five matches that year. But Gotch was able to get them a little bit of talent. Uh, because at this point, the JWA was part of the NWA, and they did have the muscle to prevent some bookers from doing business. With, the, with New Japan. They announced that New Japan is formed in January, like the end of January. They also tried to sign Sakaguchi, but that backfired. <laughs> so Inoki goes back to, he goes up to Mexico, and he actually hooks up with uh, Kitazawa and Shibata to bring them back on board with New Japan to, um, and there was like, so there's, uh, at this point, so Shinma, Remember Shinma from back in the Tokyo Pro days? So he was it. He he had spent four years working in a coal mine to repay his debt to his father. <laughs> so, but and by this point, he's back in sales. I think he was running like a bakery. Uh, he's also friends with Toyo Nobori again, and they start meeting with Inoki in the end of '71. Oh, I remember. I just translated this interview. Shinma says that they had reconciled with Inoki because he had invited them to his wedding. So tying back to my show, um, yeah. Shinma, Shinma at this point, he'll become he, like Shinma is a big name later on in New Japan um, as, as a big behind the scenes guy. People listening to this, if they know him, they know him as like the original founder of the UWF and as the guy who was like the kayfabe authority figure for the WWF before Jack Tunney took over that role. But let me tell you, Shinma may not have been a wrestler, but he might be one of the like three most important people in the history of New Japan. He is like, it, it's like trying to tell the story of Led Zeppelin without bringing up Peter Grant. He is an incredibly important behind the scenes figure, behind the scenes executive. So anyway, they are wor- so at this point we need to bring up that New Japan is like it is an indie organization for the first year of its existence. There, it is able to get some support, but it is running at a massive deficit. Like they're having trouble promote that. None of the promoters will buy shows from them. Um, there's this thing like in the provi- like when they're in the provinces, a lot of people don't thought that Inoki retired, and they're actually like mistaking his face for Strong Kobayashi's on the posters. Strong Kobayashi being, of course, the big IWE star. Um, Jesus, I'm not used to talking this much. You get into my throat. Um, anyway, so they, they do this first tour in March of, uh, 72. Uh, like I said, Gotch only does, um, like he only works two or three matches on that tour. 
But somehow New Japan, like they, like it, I think it's because th- this early failure is because uh, Kimura was really bad at this head sales manager job. He was not good at getting show, like a, he was not good at like charting the course throughout the country. So, like we guess we gotta skip forward to like July. They kind of re, they kind of re, they move to a new office. They restructure the company a bit. Uh, Akimasa Kimura gets kicked out, or he doesn't get kicked out. He he leaves like I think it's like amiable circumstances. He just wasn't good for the job. He abandons it. They get Hiroshi Iwata, who was the old JWA sales manager, the guy who actually came up with the idea of the World League to like run their show, like run their stuff. So and they also have this guy named Naoki Atsuka, who is this brilliant salesman who will come up later on in this story. Uh, Atsuka was really uh, the guy who. Like, Shinma was the guy who had the big ideas that helped New Japan prosper, but Atsuka was the one who was keeping everything afloat on the back end. That's the story that, that's what the impression that you really get, because I've been translating a bunch of Atsuka interviews, and some of that information will get in. So, let me get to, um, they, they run their first show on March 6th. Also, another person who's working helping promote them is Tetsuo Baisho, who will later become uh, the, like, announcer for New Japan. Uh, he is, so anyway, everything, like, like this, so things don't start looking up for New Japan until the autumn. So, and the autumn is when Giant, so Giant Baba leaves the JWA in August to start All Japan Pro Wrestling. And at this point, the JWA is still alive, but only because they have a contract with, uh, I don't want to get into the whole network, like, there was, like, this, like, I don't want, I'm not going to get into all, like, the, the, the television stuff, but they are, oh, by this point, they only have one television deal left, the net TV deal, and they are working, uh, they are only, they, they're only still around because they have this deal signed until the end of the fiscal year. So what's happening, and this is something that's kind of, that's often been misunderstood about the, about early New Japan, is that the original plan, so they, it, like, I think it's like autumn of 72, they start having meetings with Inoki. Uh, him and Sakaguchi really hit it off. I think it's Maza Saito who connect them together. And they're behind the scenes, I think by like December, what the plan that comes into being is New Japan and the JWA were going to merge together into what would essentially have been called New JWA. Um, at this point, New Japan is horribly, horribly in debt. They're just barely hanging on. Uh, but Inoki is a big star. Inoki is just what they need to reignite this. You're not going to have this. You, you they're, they're, they're already seeing that they cannot support a, uh, they cannot get good ratings on just, uh, Inoki, or, uh, Sakaguchi and Kentaro Oki. So the original idea is for this new company to come out of those two. But and that's actually the reason why uh, uh, on the other side, all Japan actually lobbies to join the NWA six months before the meet the annual meeting. Uh, Dory Funk Senior actually used his leverage, being the the dad of the the father of the champion, to have the NWA hold their membership meeting six months early so that Baba could get in. And nah, nah, that's that's politics to a deep level that, you know, you can't really pull that off. Again, this, that's something that can never happen with the way things work today. But in the 70s, I mean, that is like a big, big move to make. To and something, the I, whole, I should, yeah. something I should make to them. In no, Baba, had, see, Baba had been building all of these connections. And Baba was a way more respected name in the U.S. than Inoki. So even though Baba was not part of the N.W.A., he was able to – he had enough loyalists to be able to get by for those – for the, until he was in the J, until he was in the NWA. But if you, this new JWA thing had gotten together, they would have inherited the NWA membership, and, and Baba would have been out of luck until August. So it's a – but what ha- ends up happening is that ends up not being necessary because Kentaro Oki is just too stubborn to let – uh, to, to let to let the JWA go down, even if it's just being rebranded. So, and you get the impression that Oki was this like you get like Oki seems like really like apparently one of the commentators claims that Oki told him, oh, they they weren't they aren't really going to drop the JWA. They'll just have us on on alternating weeks. See, like 
he, I, I, <laughs> if you know, like, the, the television stuff that had happened in 72, it's kind of stunning how naive these people were about network politics, you know, that these people were not playing, this is, you know, they're not playing around. And you can see that in, in the actions of some of these people, even New, New Japan coming into existence right away at the start. They're go, it was destined, and regardless of Inoki's stardom or anything like that, they were destined to be behind the eight ball right away and go to death because of the TV situation not being what it, it needs to be. Right, right. Of, of course, that's, there's a reason why you don't – I mean, with the exception of the UWF, the modern indie – like, Japanese indie does not really start to show up until the bubble period. The, you know, Heisai, like late 80s, early 90s, that's when it starts being able to even run something like that, which I think is an interesting thing. Um, anyway, so uh, so this, this even though this new JWA deal goes, you know, falls apart, a few people sign contracts with the network before so they'll be that meaning that they would be part of new japan so they because they decide to if you know if you're not going to agree to this new jwa deal we are going to do business with new japan so that's why sakaguchi leaves that's why uh kengo kimura and killer khan then known as say kimura and uh Masashi Ozawa, that's why they left. That's why even why one of the referees, I think it was Yonataro Tanaka, I think that's he's the one who leaves. And we'll actually see that in a couple of years if you look at um if you look at uh there's a very famous like heated brawl between Sakaguchi and Oki in nineteen seventy five in the World League. We'll get to that a little later, but there was legit heat between those two. Like when Oki does his match in in October of 74, like, they had to make sure that there wasn't, that, 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 that the beef was not that hot between him and Sakaguchi, and then when Oki comes back in 75, Sakaguchi's like, wait, I only agreed to one match, and, like, Sakaguchi refuses to go on this Korean tour with the rest of New Japan. Like, there, there's actually some legit drama between that, because, J, uh, you know, uh, Oki was the last one to stay on the ship of the JWA as it sank. And what happens with the J- rest of the JWA is they, against Baba's wishes, get merged with All Japan, basically the board of directors and with Keiko Momoda and, like, the, the network people force Baba to let these people go in. So Baba did not want Umanosuke Ueda or Kabuki, or the, he didn't want Kabuki. Like, that, that's a wild thing now. Like, like, he didn't actually want the Kabuki in the promotion, and... If you know Kabuki's history, it's interesting because Kabuki kind of has to get over in spite of Bala because he he becomes this huge star in the eighties uh, as the great Kabuki gimmick. And like they like you watch like early or like eighty three eighty four all Japan the net by that point Baba's not in control of the comp the, not in control of the company the network took it over so you're seeing Kabuki get all this TV time because he's the only draw with kids that they have that's why you've had those super gimmicky matches in eighty three eighty four where there are like two moves where like 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 Kabuki is taking offense for like five minutes then bam super kick second rope el- heart elbow drop or fist drop so that was that was what was happening there. So anyway, New Japan is like they're so deep in debt that they actually form a new company when uh, they they start with Net. Uh, but it's not necessarily smooth sailing. Like Net, uh, like Inoki and Sakaguchi get together, but the, it, it takes them it takes them a little while to to get something going. Like there's there's only a, a, f- a handful of matches from this early '73 period, and I think that speaks to just how, like, precarious their, their situation was even back then. But now let's start get, this is the time where we start getting into the meat of New Japan. Yeah, then, then I'll just say one thing before we get there. I, I, I've been sitting on this because it's something I've been thinking about. Because uh, I said it earlier about Oki a little bit. Uh, Sakaguchi is another one where I think he's, like, underrated historically as an in-ring performer. Uh, he really had a lot of fire back then, like a, a great – guy to have on New Japan. You can see where his son gets his skills from. Uh, you know, his son wrestles at DET now. Uh, even, like, even his son's like 46 or something now, but still, he's a very talented performer. You can see uh, Sakaguchi. I think he's a kind of an underrated name in ring-wise. I, th- I think Sakaguchi, um, I think Sakaguchi suffers just because um, the, 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 horde, the I think he suffers the, the, the big work rate paradigm. The, the famous thing about yeah. Sakaguchi 
is that because of his back pain, he refused to take certain bumps. He's kind of infamous for never allowing anyone to body slam him. Like, he would use his leverage to never let that happen. One important thing that happens is they really start to push, uh, well, this is the debut of Tiger Jeet Singh. Tiger Jeet Singh is this uh, 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 Indian-born, Canadian-based wrestler who comes in, I think, he comes in for the first time in, I think, May 73. Uh, so it's really early on. I think it's like the second tour after they have network support. And we don't have any footage from that first tour, but they're able to get him over. Uh, like, like they do a really decent number. Uh, uh, they, they, uh, or they do like, they, they get a really, they, they get a really solid attendance number working in Osaka with like the first big Inoki Tiger Jeet Singh match. And, Skipping ahead about five months later, they... Well, and the reason for that is just to say they filmed a huge angle where... This that happens this... in October. That oh, happened. yeah. With... So that, that that that's what I was saying. Yeah. Uh, uh, when he's out, when Inoki was out shopping with Mitsuko Baisho, and I think Keisuke Inoki, his younger brother, is in the presence of him as well, uh, Singh attacks him, and this is not during a program. This is when he's out shopping with his wife. <laughs> Like, and it got covered as like a shoot at the time. Yeah, yeah, it was it, it was like front page news in Tokyo Sports. But well, not speaking of Tokyo Sports, there's one thing we have to get to before we start talking about Tokyo Sports. Yeah. So one thing that one thing is with Kokichi Endo with or with Net TV back in the fold, they have connections again to Kokichi Endo. Yes, that means that New Japan is blighted by this terrible commentator for like five years. But it also means that Kokichi Endo, and who, by the way, Endo was the uh, of the executive of the wrestler executives of the '60s. Uh, Endo was the one who had the best English, so he was doing talking to a lot when he was like talking to foreign promoters. Like he was the one who did a lot of that. So uh, because of that, uh, Endo is able to hook New Japan up with Mike LaBelle. Now Mike LaBelle is the leader, the uh, owner, the brother of the recently departed uh, Gene LaBelle. Rest in peace. Um, Mike LaBelle was the owner of NWA Los Angeles. NWA Los Angeles had or- was had originally been Worldwide Wrestling Associates. That's the WWA we were talking about in the mid '60s, back when it was uh, an outlaw promotion owned by uh, uh, Jewel Strongbow. But uh, not to be confused with Frank Hill, Jules Strongbow. There's another wrestler who took that name, but this is another guy. Uh, anyway, so Mike LaBelle was the one who is so uh, – NWA Los Angeles had continued to be like the place where the JWA booked all their foreign talent because that's where Mr. Moto was. Mr. Mo, you know, if you wanted to work a tour in Japan, you got in touch with Mr. Moto. But – um Around this time, I, Mike, La, Mike LaBelle actually, uh, like, they, they actually cut Mr. Moto out of the profits of being, uh, they, they actually screw him out of it. So LaBelle is, like, the first, I guess, besides, like, Frank Tunney, LaBelle is the first really big ally that New Japan has in, um, in America. That him and later Vincent James McMahon are really the two pillars of support that really help New Japan prosper in terms of, like, stateside support. So Mike LaBelle brings um, uh, brings Inoki and Sakaguchi over. This is actually, it's not on New Japan World, but this is actually the earliest surviving uh, TV, net TV slash TV Acai broadcast match on uh, that has been circulating in modern times because there was, I think it was, like, a, a block on, like, Sky A, I think the name of the channel was. They actually put this match out. It's, I think, August 24th or something, 1973, it's a tag team match between Inoki and Sakaguchi and Pat Patterson, Inoki's old buddy in Portland, and Johnny Powers. Now we get to Johnny Powers. <laughs> yes, because like, now we're seeing a big, I think this is a very, like, uh, not, this is a this huge moment in Inoki's personal history here, what makes him, you know, he carries this on for literally almost a decade, uh, what he's about to pull here. With Johnny Powers, uh, you can tell the story, <laughs> pretty, pretty much. So you, you are the man on the show, or I can tell it. You know, basically, they had this promotion in America. I can, I can do it. I can yeah, do it. So go on. There was this um, – so Johnny Powers was in le- – so Johnny Powers, let, let's to, – to, re- to bring people up to speed, he was a Canadian wrestler who had put himself on the map in North America in the mid-'60s. He'd gotten some shots at Bruno Sammartino uh, back when he was the WWF heavyweight champion. 
Uh, he'd gotten some high profile stuff in like St. Louis and Toronto and Florida. So Powers was one of the people that appeared on that one Tokyo Pro show. Uh, and because, um, like, because of that, he's the rare person who actually has a little bit of history with Inoki, the rare person in the early years of New Japan. Like, I've always wondered if they could, if they ever tried to get Johnny Valentine o- over. Uh, and of course, Johnny Valentine has that car accident in 75. You know, I, is, I think it's 75, yeah. Uh, where if that's one of the great workers of his time that we have, like, just, like, z- such little footage of, you know, is a great shame. But anyway, Johnny Powers had been, gotten in with this promoter named Pedro Martinez. And Marti- and they created this promoter. Not the baseball pitcher of Pedro Martinez. <laughs> no, 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 not, not that big. Uh, and, and Martinez was a guy who had been, like, like he was one of the guys who had, who was – like there, there's some history to like the beginning of the WWE, of uh, beginning of WWE, because Pe- uh, Pedro Martinez had been booking and had been promoting in Buffalo, New York. So the NWF, he, they create this new promotion. It came out of this thing that Ed Don George had this promotion called Upstate Athletic Club, which was in Cleveland, and uh, Marti- Pedro Martinez and Johnny Powers they went independent uh, from the NWA because they they didn't want to pay their ten percent. Damn it. <laughs> So they start the National Wrestling Federation, and it comes – National Wrestling Federation starts to, like, expand in Northeast America. There's, they, they also expanded into Canada. Uh, it was um, – like, that. Like that. there's, like – I think Ernie Ladd is one of the big, like, NWF guys as well. And another interesting thing about the NWF is that they are being uh, – in Japanese magazines, at least, they are being sold as a major new force. So what is about to happen is very important. That's what makes this very important. So this, well, I guess I, I guess there is one more important match in between the two. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk about Johnny Powers, the, ma- the Johnny Powers match now, and then yeah. we're gonna get back a couple months. I think that actually will work better now that I think about it for a reason I'm about to say. So. Um, Johnny Powers, uh, the, the promotion's running into trouble, and behind the scenes, apparently Johnny Powers uh, ends up selling the NWF title to Inoki for $10,000. So they work a program in December of 73. This is the earliest singles match on New Japan World. Uh, uh, Antonio Inoki versus Johnny Powers on, I want to say, like, December 10th or something? I, I don't have it on me right now, but anyway... Uh, that match is also interesting because it's the first that's refereed by Red Shoes Dugan, who was, he's the big, if you watch the, the LA footage, Japanese LA footage, like the, there's a, it was December 10th, by the way. Yeah, you were correct. What's that? You were right. It was December 10th. uh, Okay. That was just going off memory. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, uh, the, um, but you'll be seeing Red Shoes Dugan, who is, yes, he is the inspiration for Red Shoes, oh no, the namesake. Red Shoes Dugan, you will know him. Uh, if you've seen Rocky Three, he's the one in that wrestling match scene with Thunder Lips. Um, Red Shoes will show up in a number of significant New Japan matches over the next decade or so. He's kind of like, wh- when I think about it, I guess you have like Jerry Murdoch, but Red Shoes might be like the most known, like famous uh, foreign referee of this generation in Japan. Of- that, of that generation in Japan, just for these occasional big match appearances that he made. But anyway, so Anoki wins the NWF heavyweight title. Now, and, and also at this point, he is promoting that as a world heavyweight title because, and that will come into play later. Um, so, what, now I need to go back a couple months to October. So, there's a very, the other, you may have noticed that uh, Antonio Noki versus Johnny Powers is not the first match on New Japan World. The first match on New Japan World is a tag match in which Inoki and Seiji Sakaguchi wrestle Carl Gotch and Lou Fez. Now, this is a significant match. Now, it's significant, of course, because it's you're able just by being Carl Gotch and Lou Fez. But there's something that you that that hasn't been shown that been. Uh, talked about in the West as to why this match is really significant. So this is the time that we talk about Tokyo sports. Tokyo sports was an evening sports newspaper. I think it it was formed in uh, 59. And the thing with Tokyo sports is that Tokyo sports was really into wrestling. 
Uh, there were practical reasons for this. I think by the time that Tokyo Sports really rose to prominence in the late 60s, I think the other papers were actually getting smart to the business, they, and they weren't covering it. But the other thing is that you're an, if you're an evening sports paper, it's very hard to make a living off of baseball scoops that are, like, reheated from all the morning papers. So you have to, like, you have to invest into this thing that, that the other newspapers aren't really touching at this point. And you'll notice the big legacy of Tokyo sports is the many of the color commentators of pro wrestling in the last 50 years were Tokyo sports reporters ranging from, it's really Takashi Yamada was the all JWA and then all Japan reporter. He was the one who really codified the role of that, that, it, and you know, a color commentator is very important in this because when you have new foreign guys coming out every tour, you need some guy to explain who these people are, and you need somebody with who can get like contacts with like sports papers in America to be able to tell those stories. So that's so they have a commentator when when they start World Pro Wrestling, they have this commentator named Yazuo Sakurai, and I believe Yazuo Sakurai. Side note is the one who actually coined uh, Moiru Tukon, the fighting spirit that burns, which is the big Inoki marketing phrase, you know, um, the burning fighting spirit. So. Yazuo, so the reason why Tokyo Sports is important is because this is the point when they start to actually stimulate New Japan directly because they see that if they're going to sell more papers if there's another uh, company that's doing well. So the, uh, the, uh, the newspaper actually goes out of its own pocket to pay for Gotch and Thez to wrestle this match. Um, and that's not all they're doing. Well, stay tuned. Tokyo Sports is going to show up again. Um, the, uh, I think, I'd like, like, Thez even wrestles that match with, like, a bad back, because I think he'd hurt himself, like, wrestling Briscoe or something, like, he pulled something. Uh, but it's still, like, that is, you know, if you've got the patience for it, that is a great match. Uh, you know, just great historical document. I know this isn't the matches episode, but just want to put that over for a bit. So, now we're getting into 74. Um, let me think. 74, what is the first big match there. I think that's is there a match before Strong Kobayashi? Let me I'm going to look at it real quick, okay? Yeah, go for it. Um I'm looking it up right now as well see what I can find. Yeah, okay. uh, that is the first match of like of 74. Uh, so this is this is the match where everything really changes for New Japan. This is the first time that they got a 20% uh TV rating. Uh, Inoki has has said, and I think Shinma as well has said that the company, even though they had network support, the company did not actually start to turn around until this match. So with I've written a bunch about, I actually have on Pro Wrestling Only a strong Kobayashi profile, which gets into a lot of this. But Kobayashi was the champion; he was the ace of the international wrestling enterprise. And in by in early '74. He leaves, and what, what's come out now is the reason, it, it's believed that the reason that he left was that he had a big conflict with uh, Great Kusatsu, who was the booker. You'll, if you look, and, like, <laughs> Kusatsu was, like, using the company's incentive pay structure to make sure that he and Rusher Kimura got paid as much as Strong Kobayashi because he was booking them in more main events <laughs> because they were being paid extra by what matches on the card they were on. So it was strong Kobayashi eventually has enough of this and he leaves the company. He vac- he just said he turns in his Pete slip on the last day of the tour, turns his belt into the office, and he says, I challenge both Baba and Inoki. Now Baba and Inoki are both fighting to get strong Kobayashi. Uh Baba happens to be he's got uh Baba happens to uh have like he has, he has connections to uh Isawa Fujisawa, who was the I that might not be his name. I know it's something Fujisawa who was the editor of the Monthly Pro Wrestling magazine. You'll notice that Monthly Pro Wrestling magazines in the mid-70s love to kind of throw shade at Inoki, and it's because they were actually in league with Baba. Like, there's an early 75 tour coverage where they're like, oh, Mark McGuire, Brute Bernard, this is really strong style, you guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, like that, that, 
that is something that you will notice with like new, the uh, monthly pro New Japan coverage from back in the day. But anyway, he's got him on his side trying to get Kobayashi. He's also even got Matty Suzuki working for new, All Japan at this point. Matty Suzuki is the guy who trained Strong Kobayashi. So Matty is with Strong Kobayashi's family trying to get him to, to join them. But Shinma actually starts visiting uh, uh, Kobayashi's house. And like he like he he visits so much that like his dog becomes like Kobayashi's dog becomes attached to him. It's cute, <laughs> you know. And um, and and they end up getting um, they end up announcing that Strong Kobayashi and Antonio Inoki are going to wrestle uh, in Kurameko Kugikan on March nineteenth, nineteen seventy four. And this is where Tokyo Sports really pulls out the stops because this is the number two and number three promotions, their aces wrestling each other, or maybe that, I don't know if they're number one. I, I don't know, but they're one, two of the big three promotions are wrestling each other. Um, uh, their aces. And so this is like the forbidden battle. This is something that hadn't happened since Ricky Dozon versus Toshio Yamaguchi in 55, back when there were all those regional independents that were competing with the JWA. Anyway, what Tokyo sports does is, they pay – so Isao Yoshiwara comes up with this this transfer fee to get Kobayashi out of his contract. Tokyo Sports pays it. They don't they, – they only – they not only pay it, they actually promote the event. Like, they pay all the money to, like, get all the posters put up in Tokyo and all of that. And then re- what they have to do to offset the cost of this is Tokyo Sports – permanently increases their price by 50%. They go from 20 yen to 30 yen because of this match. Um, but it pays off because this is like the first, I don't know if it, I wouldn't call it the first great. And uh, it's like the first, like the first great singles match in new Japan history. <laughs> and I think that match, I, I also want to note about the match itself. Something very interesting is that I think that that match well, and I, that's like the first big singles match of, for, in that, like, I think that there might have been, like, no, I maybe I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to qualify it. The, I think that was the first really big match in, uh, like, big singles match in Pro Resu that was one fall. Not two, and, and you watch that match, it wouldn't work as a two out of three falls match. You need that building tension to that 30 minutes to where, to building up to when, they uh, when Inoki gets the pinfall, and I think that that's something that's really interesting to point out because you look at like I think I said earlier when you look at you know uh, Inoki the way that Jumbo was made Jumbo Suruda in All Japan was sort of implicitly framed as a successor to Inoki like in '76 they actually revived the NWA United National Title just for uh, Jumbo. But something that's interesting is that jump, while Inoki was really pushing forward for the one fall match, the modern layout of a Pro Resu big singles match, uh, Jumbo was still doing two out of three falls matches through 1981. So he's like, like that, and that's something that I, I, I don't want to get too much into. Like some people are saying, oh, Jumbo was not very good at leading matches. He was never really taught that. But that is something that you really notice that Inoki was kind of the innovator in putting that in and and getting that punctuation kind of out of wrestling, you know. And just to another thing noteworthy about this match, in my opinion, is that we went through the, the story last year, the 1973 with Tiger Jeet scene coming in, kind of one of the foreign monster heels, pretty much. You know, your crazy weapons. Abdullah the Butcher, you know, Bruiser Brody later on, like amazing bloody matches, all this. Here in this match, we had talked about it earlier, throughout the history of pro res at this point in Japan, wrestling in Japan, it was all about the Japanese star versus the foreigner. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and this was the first one in 20 years, like since Kimura and Riki Dozan, where it was the Japanese star versus Japanese star in the main event match here. And the, like that, that's this is also going to come into a, another theme later on in the '70s that we'll get into. But anyway, after this, that tour. So what happens is Strong Kobayashi does not join New Japan. He there's actually he actually goes to work in the U.S. and like 
at one point he actually talks to Baba because he could actually have still gone to all Japan at that point because he was being signed. He, he wrestled as a representative of Tokyo sports, but Kobayashi basically, uh, he still, he felt so in debt to the president of Tokyo sports, Hiroshi Inoue for helping him get out of the IWE that he was like, no, I'm going to stay with new Japan and Kobayashi. They have a rematch in December. Inoki wins again. Then, uh, in, he joins the company, but in kayfabe, he does so as a freelancer until the 75 World League, after which he, when he loses to Inoki in the semifinal, he joins full time. So that's that squared away. Now let's get to the first World League. This is the first time that, um, like notice that they actually, the JWA wasn't around anymore. They actually took the World League branding yeah. and started using that. And they do this big three way tournament with him. With uh, the, the, or not big three way, but the final is this big three way. It's actually on New Japan World. Uh, it's Antonio Inoki versus Seiji Sakaguchi versus Killer Carl Krupp. They have this big three way that uh, Antonio wins. And um, the important thing about this tour that a lot that hasn't been known in the West is that on the last show of this tour, somebody very important was in attendance. Vince McMahon. <laughs> And this is at the same time that uh, that uh, All Japan was promoting a tour with the WWWF. There's that one tour in the middle of 74 where uh, Baba uh, wrestles Pedro Morales. Uh, so, so uh, you know, that you know, Vince McMahon is going to be the other guy besides Mike LaBelle who really gun is really gunning for uh, New Japan. The interesting fact about uh, uh, Vince McMahon when and this is senior, of course. This is Vincent James McMahon. When uh, all when all Japan had their um, their meeting six months early to get into the NWA, uh, Vince voted against them, and he was the only per only dissenting vote that did not have any business incentive to do so. Because the other two that voted against were Yoshino Sato and Mike LaBelle, both of whom would have been directly hurt by Baba becoming an NWA member. But the interesting thing is in '73. Uh, uh, New Japan applies to join the NWA, and Vince goes is is up for it. He he gives them a positive vote. So Vince is Vince is not allowed to because of Bruno San Martino's loyalty to Baba. It is going to be a few years before the uh, New Japan can go full steam with the WWWF relationship. But just know it's starting all the way back in '74. And uh, I I should also point out. This is ties into Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant has his first matches with New Japan in 1974. First one with the big one is like with Sakaguchi and April and March, and then they 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 wait on the Inoki match until they have their first tour of Brazil in '74. So that's another important thing to really bring up right now. Uh, let's see what else in '74. I think this is time to get back into Kentaro Oki. This is the interesting thing with late uh, 74 New Japan. So Kentaro Oki had been part of, like I said, all Japan after he left, um, after the JWA finally died. And Oki was, he, he stayed in with, he stayed with them, I think through like October. So what happened was uh, Baba didn't, like I said, Baba didn't want them. And what he ended up doing to kind of respond to that was he he got he told the Funks to speed up Jumbo Saruta's training. There's actually a story that Terry Funk was the one who suggested that that Jumbo get that title shot at Dory like eight weeks after his debut just to put him over, so that Bob, when Baba was able to uh, when, when Jumbo so Jumbo came back in October and Baba announces that he is going to be. Baba's tag partner, not Oki, not Umanosuke Ueda. So after this, Oki basically leaves the business for a while. He he's like he does like a fishery business in in South Korea. What happens is he kind of comes back into the fold for uh, New Japan, and this is late '74. Interesting thing at this point, something that this match ties into is for years. Like, like going back to 1971, when when Inoki basically challenges Baba in front of the press, he keeps like he's been he's been talking like mad game for years, just like oh, I, we should have a uh, there's four promotions in Japan now, we should have a unified commission. 
you know, Baba wrestle me. <laughs> and, 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 um, they, and Oki actually ties into this because one day after they have this match, uh, him and, uh, Kintaro, uh him and Kintaro Oki have this great match in, uh, uh, October 10th, 1974, Hisashi Shinma actually gets some of the old JWA guys. He gets, uh, Yoshino Sato, Toyo Nobori, Kyushu's on, who's like a referee, and one other guy to actually sign a letter saying, we want you to, re- we want you to recognize this unified Japanese commission, Baba. We want you to wrestle in the, <laughs> like, he's actually bringing them in on this, too. <laughs> and it, it really comprehended, or really calcul- it was calculated. He set up a situation where the fans could point to his brand of wrestling, New Japan, and look at it one way, uh, and you can even see the people he's bringing in, and maybe look at Baba, and therefore all Japan, in a negative light, through Inoki's uh, plant and scheme that he's coming up with in terms of trash-talking them, maybe even making it seem like his brand is a little bit more real than, you know, oh, Baba's. Oh, that, that's, yeah. that, that, the strong style, that's what that comes from. Yep, you know, yep. I don't know what Baba does, but what I do is strong style. Yeah. Now, an interesting thing that we, I, something, the elephant in the room, if you know your All Japan history in late 74, Baba wins the NWA title for nine days from Jack Briscoe. This was him basically, this was him, this was like, this was kind of a Baba panic move responding to all of this publicity because he had been saying, oh, I can't wrestle him because I'm part of the, because he, at this point, they're actually propping up the PWF as like an actual organization. It was just a paper thing to call his belt, the the old Ricky Dozon belt. I'm not going to get into all the belt things with that. That's, you know. Uh, that's, this isn't, maybe, maybe when we do an All Japan episode, or, or if I do it somewhere else, but anyway, yeah. um, is, so Baba actually paid, uh, and for those who don't know this part of the story, Baba paid Jack Briscoe, like, $25,000 to get that title for nine days. It was behind Sam Muchnick's back, and this would actually have a ripple effect the following year at the NWA convention. Muchnick wasn't so mad that it had happened, but he wanted a cut of that 25000 and Jack refused to give it to him, and eventually Jack dro- drops the belt to Terry Funk because of that. So Inoki is actually causing a ripple effect inside the NWA by doing this. And you, you could see that, uh, uh, again, we've seen it time and time again, all throughout this story, all throughout Inoki's career at JWA, and now uh, we're seeing all the way into his competition. In the Japanese pro wrestling world at this time, there was no, uh, you know, how should I say this? There's, there was no solidarity, pretty much. You never knew when things were going to take a turn for the worse, and you'd have to make these kind of panic moves, and you'd see people turn on you and make de- demands out of the out of the blue, pretty much. It felt like any time running co- uh, promotion in the early 70s was a gigantic headache, man. Oh, it must have been, yeah. So, um, I think we, let's go into 75. There's some pretty notable matches. Like, he, I think... This is when he drops the NWF title for the first time to put over uh, Tiger Jeet Singh. They do this. This they work a uh, they work like a two or three match program. I think I think two, there was, I think there's like three matches in it total. I, two of them are on New Japan World. Anyway, um, I think uh, 75 is. Oh, we should note uh, in at the end of 74, Inoki does his first trip. Uh, trip he does a couple shows in Brazil. He'd actually been to Brazil a few years earlier not to wrestle. He actually went to shoot a nature documentary at the end of 1970. But what happened is he got bitten by a snake. <laughs> and it was like a – and, and the, the, the funny thing about this is when he got bit by the snake, uh, Kosuke Takeuchi, who was the uh, guy in charge of uh, Monthly Gong magazine, he actually made the cover of the next – because he didn't know if Inoki was going to die. The news didn't travel fast enough back then. He actually made the cover uh, Inoki with a black background, because, just as a precautionary measure. So he, he goes back to Brazil, and that's going to come back in a few a couple years, in 76. But anyway, now in 75, this is when they start to, well, first of all, they do this angle with, um, they have, the, they, have uh, they also drop the, him and Sakaguchi drop the NWA, North American tag team titles, which they had won in 74 for the first time. They drop them to, well, they, they go into Los Angeles, they have a match, and I think it's, there's a DQ finish, and the match is held up, but what, and the belts are held up. But what happens 
Enoki actually gets sick. He, like, contracts some sort of, like, viral arthritis. And uh, they have to actually have Sakaguchi and Strong Kobayashi challenge the Hollywood Blondes. These are the – this is Buddy Roberts and Jerry Brown, to be clear. This is not Brian Pillman and Stone Cold. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I would – I. I, I would have if if I had had more pre- I would if I had had more time to prepare for this podcast I would have done a Hollywood Blondes like 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 promo on Enoki. You see what you're looking at, Enoki? It's the burning bush, you know, or whatever. <laughs> Amazing! That, that's awesome. I love that. It's so, it's, and Steve Austin, he is a very noteworthy impression. Kind of like how in Japan, Enoki's chin is kind of like a meme. I feel like Stone Cold's voice. Like a meme in America. Oh uh, yeah, the, the, uh, and you know, think, you know, so, it's funny just because it's fu- it's funny how uh, Inoki's chin just real quick that how that's transcended um, even transcended wrestling fandom because the uh, uh, you know you you're probably the age to know this um, Yu Gi Oh the the uh, the anime Yu Gi Oh there was uh, there's a character Joey Wheeler and he there's a there's a shot in that that anime where he where he they they draw the Inoki chin on him, and that actually became a meme in the West like a few years ago, independent of people knowing that it was a, an Inoki homage. And first of all, Joey is awesome, so I I, I, applaud, I completely applaud this. Uh, secondly, it's amazing because I was reading about it, and he had actually planned to get surgery on his chin. And this is one of those only in wrestling kind of stories. And, and clearly, this is a wrestler brain surgeon that he talked to, yeah. because the surgeon actually talked him out of getting the surgery. I read that too. Yeah, that that's a. And I, I, there was this one talk show where Mitsuko Baisho was one night when Inoki was sleeping. She put her fingers in his mouth just to see how far down the chin. She, <laughs> she said she could fit her entire middle finger down. It went down that far. Oh, that's a, see, that's amazing. But yeah, the wrestling ring, the surgeon said, no, you shouldn't get it. You shouldn't get it removed. You can make it your your image, and you can make it yeah. your trademark. And then he did. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. The so, surgeon is a genius. Uh, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So Inoki and Sakaguchi, they get back together. When he recovers from that 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 condition, uh, like we don't have this, but this is like the only t- uh, there's fun trivia. The only time that Inoki actually wore long black tights, he apparently borrowed them from Don Arakawa, who is a wrestler, one of the New Japan young guys who he was. He later becomes one of the most influential comedic wrestlers in pro wrestling history. He was the one who really, in the early '80s, him and Haruka Egan were really kind of the nucleus of the modern comedy wrestling match that that was like later you know insp- that was kind of the basis for what would later become uh the uh old man comedy matches in all japan so he borrows arakawa's tights and then he, they do a match where H- inoki and sakaguchi this one is on new japan world win the titles back from the hollywood blondes but this does actually lead to something a little bit later it, it or at least it, it foreshadows something now in uh in uh, October, oh, we should also note in 75, New Japan does actually join the NWA, but not in Inoki's name. Shinma and Sakaguchi have their names as NWA members. And this also, and just because in, Baba still has all of these connections, uh, it, this doesn't really change as much as you might think. It's still it's still going to be like LaBelle and La, the, the pillars of his is organ of support in the States are still LaBelle and McMahon. Anyway, so there's this match with Luthez that they have, and now I think it's time to get into what I think of as kind of the climax of the, you know, you'll fight me, Baba, you know, story arc of Inoki's career. So in late 1975, Baba finally strikes back at him for after these four, this, this four years of just dancing around the, the, these empty threats. So what in, Baba does is he comes up with some tournament called the Open League, where he says, "Oh yeah, New, you know, New, hey, you know, IWE is going to be here. Bunch of NWA promoters are going to be here. So you know, hey, we're leaving the door open for for uh, for New Japan. You know, Inoki, if you want to come wrestle in this tournament, you know, hey, we're we're not going to block the doors. And of course, but let's let's be clear." This is was never going to happen. Network politics that that, that be, you were never 
there, there is a Tokyo sports show later on, but with all the compromises they had to do to even get that, like, to happen, like, like, uh, there was that it was, it was never going to happen with two net, with networks on the line. But, you know, Inoki was taking advantage of that. And since he, Inoki was the one who had initiated this dance, it made Inoki look like he was the aggressor, like he had more courage than Baba. But anyway, this, this, so this isn't all, but this isn't all what, that Baba does. Baba twists the knife a little further by bringing Ricky Dozon's widow and the secretary of his estate, Mazo, uh, Mazao Yamamoto, into it. So they, they book on the same day that Inoki is set to wrestle Billy Robinson for the final New Japan show of the year uh, at, at the Sumo Hall, Kurame. Um, Baba and the IWE... The, they all and they all uh, go together to um, promote a Ricky Dozon memorial show for the 13th anniversary of his death at the Budokan. Uh, this that show is side note. Uh, Mitsuo Momoda, Ricky Dozon's uh, child, actually performed the first Tope Suicida that a Japanese wrestler had ever done in Japan on a battle royal in that match. Uh, Mitsuo Momoda, a very underrecognized figure as like an early transitional junior heavyweight who helped modernize things pre uh Fujinami, but since all Japan didn't have a junior division, uh Momoto was kind of stuck as the curtain jerker. But anyway, so with this is when Baba's real plan comes into focus. So not only is Inoki not wrestling not only does it look like Inoki doesn't want to wrestle the open league, it looks like he is defying Ricky Dozon. They actually like issue he like Baba actually, like, gets Yamamoto and Keiko Momoda to hold this press conference where they, like, excommunicate Inoki. <laughs> so, they're twist and... Jesus. <laughs> uh, Shin, uh, my favorite part, this is something I just learned yesterday, like, like, <laughs> like this is my favorite part. So, Shinma starts, he, he said that in the middle of the night, he used to, he started getting calls from, like, these Baba fans who did, so they were like these teenagers who would do like Yakuza impressions, being like, Inoki and Shinma are going to pay <laughs> for not going on this show. Just imagine you're Asashi Shinma. You know, you, you're already, you're trying to get this tour off the ground. You're just, you know, it's, it's been a long day. You just want to just want to op- open the fridge and get a Coke. And now then somebody calls you on the phone and you have to listen to this teenager do a bad Bunta Sugawara impression on you, you know? <laughs> like, like, that's my favorite part of the story. Now, they eventually settle this because Hiroshi Inoue, the Tokyo sports president, actually gets Inoki in the same room with Keiko and, like, Inoki apologizes and, like, bows to her and she wishes him good luck with his match against Robinson. The interesting thing there is that Tokyo Sports then prints this picture on the front page of him bowing to Keiko. So he's basically like kowtowing to Baba. And New Japan was pissed about that. So Baba, this is when Baba outpoliticked him, finally, after these years. And this is kind of, it doesn't end the Baba versus Inoki thing, but this is kind of what, this this was kind of the end of it. Like the the end of... Like, like that being, like, the primary, like, marketing thing, if that makes sense. So, you know, Inoki has the big match with Billy Robinson. You know, other people are probably going to talk about that and you know, or have already uh, talked about that because that's one of the – An amazing one of, match. One of the greatest matches of the 70s. Also, really interesting is kind of the end of an era. That's, like, the last – with the exception of a couple of the Bob Backlund matches – that's the last big two out of three falls singles titles match that Inoki really does. Uh, and that kind of, that might play into the match. Cause if you watch it, it does really seem like Robinson is playing around with him. Not cause he, he, do, he doesn't get that like second fall until like the last minute. Like, like he, he really like plays with him. And this feels like the proto era of where we were going in the late seventies with the, the strong style the, and the different style fights that we were we were probably about to get into. This was kind of like the proto version of that, and it was coming off of what we just talked about with Baba, which we had talked about all the stuff Inoki had done, and now Baba. This is kind of his signal flare, like, hey, you know, I'm not just going to take this lion down. I can make my own moves, and we would see another one next year that relates to this very match because. 
a spoiler alert if you want to watch it. I, re- I highly recommend watching it because it's an amazing match, but it is a draw. And that would yep. play into what Billy Robinson would do <laughs> in the next year. So the next year, with, I guess we can go back and talk about that now. Baba, so what happened was, so we're about to get into this. Billy Robinson, if this was, that wasn't going to be the only match between him and Inoki. But by this point, um, New Japan and TV, or Net TV were saving up money for um, the – uh, for the match, for the actual fight with Muhammad Ali, and they wanted to dock Robinson's pay. Robinson had just been divorced. He's not going to work on. He's not going to work in New Japan for scale. So all Baba does in seventy, in like in the summer of seventy four, is say, "Hey, I can just pay you that same rate that they had paid you." And Billy was willing to do business. That's when they actually do <laughs> the really. This can be lost because it only survived, like, we only have, like, half of the match because of how much Nippon Television clips these things. But, well, you know, seven months after they went to, uh, him and Robinson and Inoki went to a 60-minute draw, Robinson and Jumbo go to a 70-minute draw. (laughs) Like, that is so carny, beautiful. Yeah, it's like, yeah, he could do what I could do. (laughs) Pretty much, Baba was saying that. Yeah. And he needed all the help he could get, considering what it, like I said, you were already talking about it, you know. The most well-regarded story of Ali and Inoki is that, look, there's a lot of different versions of the story, depending on who you believe. And a lot for all of this, so we have to keep that in mind. That a lot of this is, you know, grandiose in nature, and a lot of it is different people having different perspectives. But the most common version of this story is that... Ali thought the match would be a work, and Inoki thought it would be a shoot. And some people say that he just didn't know, and Inoki was going to cross him. And some people thought that Ali got was like, no, nah, I don't want to lose. <laughs> you know, because I think Meltzer reported that it was going to be, like, Ali would knock the ref out accidentally, and then, you know, he'd beat the hell out of Inoki, but then accidentally knock out the ref, and Inoki would hit the Enziguri. That was his big signature move. <laughs> and that would be his big deal. And Inoki would win, but Ali would claim that it was, uh, of, you know, BS pretty much. So very simple kind of finish there. But for whatever reason, it didn't happen that way. And it became romanticized as a legendary match. It was what it was from a business perspective. What I will say is that that, that was – now, to be clear – the Ali, so in early 70s, the, the match that really starts this martial arts stuff is a match against uh, Vim Ruska. Yeah. And Ruska, so this is an interesting pair. So Ruska was an Olymp, he had won the uh, gold medal in judo, and uh, I think it was the 72, I think it was Munich Olympics. Um, so, and, and that's an interesting, that I, without going into a whole tangent on that, like Ruska kind of seems like a response to, all Japan's use of Anton Giesink, who was the first ever, like Anton Giesink is the reason why judo added weight classes because he was the first foreign, per, foreign judoka to win a world championship. They were so embarrassed that they finally added weight classes to get into the Olympics. They get into the Olympics. They, they're thinking, you know, this is worth it just to get our win back against uh, Giesink. Giesink goes, beats, gets a gold medal. Then he goes into another world championship, beats Sakaguchi. But anyway, Ruska is probably playing off of that. And apparently, Ruska got in. This actually parallels Masahiko Kimura, the original judo pro wrestling guy, is that Ruska apparently got in because his wife was sick. And of the re- if you look, if you've ever read about Kimura, the reason Kimura got into pro wrestling is that uh, he needed streptomycin. His wife had tuberculosis, so that's yeah. another inter- interesting parallel right there. Yeah. By the way, I just want to say we talk about that a little bit in the Fumi episode from April because uh, I'm, I'm very interested in Kimura. I think he's a fascinating character. Oh and, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah so uh, we did go over that a little bit in the April. If y'all want to check that out, where we go into it a little bit more and uh, the craziness of. And by the way, we mentioned before we were talking about the strong Kobayashi and you know, Inoki match. Uh, that one was way more successful than the Ricky Dozan and Kimura match, considering yeah. how, how that turned out. If you, I will say the Ricky Dozan Kimura match is a fascinating watch. I will say that. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's fascinating, just not uh, successful for Kimura, especially, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
but, crunch but, tough food around the world. <laughs> yeah, it was a it was an amazing spectacle to, to watch for sure. But this yeah. whole deal with Inoki now, and just I want to speak on this part here because we're kind of leading into a lot. Like the next few years are kind of of the similar vein. Obviously, Ali is the one that everyone knows the most because it was such a monster business decision. Yeah, I feel like. Again, we've gone through Inoki's whole career to this point in New Japan, the first four years of the company. We've seen, we've seen him lean on different styles. We've seen him do the foreigner. The, and it, that's the thing, because, you know, Inoki now, we're getting into, is doing these different style fights. The origins of MMA, everybody says. But what everybody doesn't remember or doesn't talk about is that against Tiger Jeet Singh, he was a deathmatch guy. <laughs> we saw a nails match. Fence match. He was doing these weapons matches with Tiger Jeet Singh. The the, attack, the exact opposite of. And, and when we get to instead when he they finally they wait a year for him to have his big singles match with because uh, Umanosuke Ueda comes back to the to Japan in '76. He beca- he he basically invents the modern pro Resu native heel gimmick. Like people like Mr. Ganasuke, like Evil Toru Yano, like early 2010s Toru Yano. Uh, Ueda is mo- one of the most influential characters in history, and the first match that when they, him and Inoki finally have their match, it's a nail death match. They take these boards, like these boards of like foot long nails, and circle the ring and the Budokan with them. So like Inoki could do Carney as well, you know. Yeah, that that was good. that's going to be one of my major points. I mean, this whole build ultimately to uh, Ali now. You're, I mean, ultimately, he's beating these guys in worked matches. <laughs> you know, these, these uh, shooters. So, so something that's important to say about – so Inoki does, makes a couple changes to to what he does in order to sell that he is going into martial arts. First of all, he vacates the tag titles with Sakaguchi. And then that builds up to Sakaguchi and Kobayashi really holding that down until 79 when Ricky Choshu is called up to take uh, Kobayashi's place. But the other thing that happens is Inoki, he actually drops out of like the 66 and or 76 and 77 World Leagues, both of which Sakaguchi wins. Side note, Sakaguchi beating Pedro Morales in the 76 World League final was a big step towards the WWWF going into their partnership with New Japan. That was another big transition, um, but uh, or a point in that transition anyway. So he, go, he he drops out of that. He also drops out of the World League, and that's actually what ends up in 77. It ends up hurt, like, the World like We can actually get to that in 77, but that's what yeah, yeah. leads to the MSG League coming instead of the World League. But So yeah. they're building up to this match with Muhammad Ali, uh, and, and Inoki also doesn't work that June tour building up to the match. It actually hurts their business very badly. They're very dependent on Inoki. It, this was kind of a ballsy move. Um, but, you know, we don't need to talk about Ali versus Inoki itself. It's, you know, <laughs> it's like, it is, yeah. there is, like, there is still stuff to be said because a lot of the Japanese person, even in that Ali versus Inoki book that came out a few years ago, that doesn't actually go into the network politics behind what made that show happen. So I guess you could, but. Come on. Like, I don't need to. Yeah, the, the match itself is definitely not one I would recommend watching, <laughs> if, if, if you can see it, because, uh, you know, it's legendary and how it works. So basically the setup to this, and they built this stuff as a big deal. And it was like all of this started, <laughs> you know, this whole deal with Ali started because of the fact that Ali was uh, – this is all about uh, Ichiro Hata, like the yes. – or plus Judoka, the founder of the Amateur Wrestling Association in Japan. My man, my man, Ichiro Hana, the most important person in late 20th century martial arts that you have never heard of. <laughs> well, now, you, now we've heard of him. <laughs> the, the, uh, I wrote a big article about him on my blog I can plug, yeah. Yeah, plug it, plug it. Yeah, it's uh, on From Milo to Misawa. The, I'm, sure, you know, I'm sure Dylan can, like, link this at the end. Yeah, I totally uh, will. Or, or, like, I, like link, yeah, when we do the Twitter. I actually yeah. have a – I actually do – I actually wrote an article about Ichiro Hana about – the like birth of amateur wrestling in Japan and how Ichiro Hada ended up. He's a really important pit figure in like, like Sambo doesn't leave the Eastern Bloc without him because he's the person who sent Victor Koga to Japan. He's the reason Benny Hana exists because he sent Rocky Aoki to America. He was, uh, he's very important in pro wrestling because he's the reason that Andre the Giant and Billy Robinson first got their work outside of Europe because he was the one who connected the IWE to European promoters. So he's, very important guy. 
on top of what he's known for is supposedly being the guy who brought Jumbo into pro wrestling. So anyway, ha- he Ali talks to Hada and he says, uh, in you know typical Ali fashion, you know, okay, don't you have? Uh, can't you bring one of your uh, old Oriental, you know, Oriental fighters or something like that? That's what he says. I'm just quoting him. You know, very dated terminology. Yeah. But, um, and and eventually it, this this Ali Anoki match it comes out of because. Net TV had an exclusive contract to broadcast Ali fights, and there was and, and Hana had actually suggested Inoki, but at first the network was actually trying to do it with this sumo guy because this sumo guy and Ali had like play fought at a at a party a couple years back, and then it just ends up being Inoki and this this big and this, now we need to talk about this match because or yeah. not about this match or the effect of this match. Yeah. Because this really hurts New Japan financially. This match was, they were expecting to make a million dollars on closed circuit screenings in the U.S., and it did not draw that well. Um, it ends up, um, it was actually so bad that what actually came out a few years ago, one of the, or recently one of these interviews that I've been, that I worked on, um, he, the network actually took over the company for a little bit. Like before they did it, Later on, they actually took it over for a while, and this is when Naoki Atsuka, the salesman I mentioned earlier, becomes the New Japan sales manager, and he finds out that New Japan is half a billion yen in debt because not only did this Ali thing not go the way that they wanted, but people on how the the people they've been selling house shows to haven't been paying their full contracts. So they, they, so he has to, so Atsuka has to work like overtime to reform the whole company and get like that. This actually goes into other stuff that they do in the late seventies. Like when we talk about the different styles fights, another thing, one thing about different styles fights that often isn't mentioned in the West is that the different styles fights were not part of world pro wrestling. They had a special Monday time slot that they were broadcast on, like whenever these happened. And the reason that they, that this is important is because that gave New Japan essentially a free episode's worth of TV money that they could funnel back to the company to help resolve their debts. So that's an important thing that happens with the mar- – and that's partially – it's a good thing that that kept happening. And eventually the martial arts, even though we now see them as works, the post Ali different styles fights did work at the time in restoring Ali's reputation in, the, in, in Japan. And and those- they, they made legitimate contributions to mixed martial arts. Like there's famous, uh, a famous example is the Chuck Wetner one from uh, like from late from autumn of '77. Mm-hmm. Satoru Sayama by that point was uh, Inoki's valet and sparring partner, and he was like, "Hey, there's been this. They have, people have been using open fingered gloves in like judo or karate. I, I forgot what martial art. They've been using this for like 70 years now. Why don't we start bringing this into wrestling? And they actually do. And that's why open fingered gloves are now standard MMA equipment. You know, is because Sayama came up with this. It was a way for Inoki to be able to punch Wepner while still being able to grapple. Yeah, that's an amazing contribution. And you know, even then, uh, Inoki, it's like even if they were worked fights or whatever, they definitely made a huge impact. I, and I think that that even the Ali fights, the one that everyone points to, but a lot of them were are really big. For example. Uh, in a, uh, later on in 76, he uh, had a match in Pakistan yes. with uh, yeah. Akram Pelwan, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was his, that was his name. He was a, a, a amateur wrestler from Pakistan, and basically it ended up with Inoki breaking his arm. And that the... apparently was legit. A uh, quick note for people who may not know this: uh, Indian wrestling is very influential on catch. Re- uh, Indian wrestling, Pelwani is what's called. Is yeah. like that's. That's a big influence. Like when Carl Gotch was doing those like Hindu squats and working with those clubs, that's Pelwani stuff that he's cribbing from. So that is something that I'm sure was acknowledged in like contemporaneous press that that India was this prosperous, this this great place for uh, wrestling. Yeah, so, and in Pakistan, it's like at that time. I mean, the people couldn't believe it at the time because this was the hometown hero, and there's oh, been all yeah. kinds of stories that were going out that like could there be a riot or something like that for the fans. A and lot of three crazy years stuff. later, his son does, did, uh, actually kind of avenges him, or actually just does avenge him. And and that match is kind of one of the last of the big different styles fights. 
you know? Yeah, yeah, it was. That was near the end of the decade with Jara uh, Pelwan, where he yeah. did it. And, he, he, and they later became good friends, and Noki actually, like, uh, uh, became the guardian of his son after oh, Jara died. Oh, I, I actually did not know that. Like, yeah, that, wow. Yeah, and, uh, you know, his, like, Noki's mess, you know, uh, kind of, uh, stature in Pakistan is like super huge. Uh, right. Even after Anoki died, like the the prime minister actually went on Twitter and gave him uh, condolences because they actually went. This we're jumping way ahead now, but when Anoki had IGF, uh, yes. his, you know, he ran shows there, which by the way were main evented by Hideki Suzuki, uh, one of the best wrestlers in the world right now. Uh, but uh, even today, Pakistan has a strong relationship with Anoki to the point where December eighth is Anoki Day in Pakistan. Oh. I looked that up. Oh, How I, about that? That's that's. I think I like that's that's great news to me, you know. <laughs> hey, but it shows you the the way in the seventies again. There was no MMA like UFC right. or anything like that. That's the people saw these, they believed in them, and they were legit because of Inoki. It was, it, you know, it was a really it was you because we think of, you know, in the West we think of because we had a we had a martial arts craze because of you know Bruce Lee and stuff and you know. And, and and I think that I think seven like seventies is also when kickboxing really starts to take form. I think that's like when Benny the Jet like starts going on the scene. People like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there was also other stuff feeding into that because you know of course Japan has its own martial arts scene over there. Kickboxing actually became a mainstream sport. Like you've got like Tadashi Sawamura. That's the guy who Hitmon Lee the Pokemon was inspired by. Yeah. Um. Like so. Um. Yeah, that's, there was there was all these other factors, and I guess another thing, is we, if we want to skip ahead a little bit, an interesting thing with these different styles fights is that this is what starts to get Inoki working with Iki Kajiwara, the author of Tiger Mask. Iki yeah. Kajiwara was a no. Tiger Mask was not his only thing. He has another. Um, he did he did other sports manga, and I don't even think Tiger Mask is best. Dylan can see on the Skype call my profile pic is a – the profile picture I selected is actually a shot from Ashita no Jill, which is my favorite of Kajiwara's works. Ah. Uh, the great uh, – that is the great boxing manga uh, from which all others you – know, you know, all, all others must pay homage, to which all <laughs> others must pay homage. Uh, but anyway, um, Kajiwara – so in, like, early 79, there's a different style fight with this guy named Mr. X. And this is, like, the worst of the different styles fights. I say this as somebody who likes the different styles fights. You can skip the Mr. X one. Mr. X literally happened as, like, cross-promotion with one of Kajiwara's manga. Like, Mr. X literally shows up in this comic. Yeah, it was, it was a character in Tiger Mask. He was the evil promoter, and he made oh, his I, return. I, I think, is that Mr. X, like... Maybe yeah, he made his return in Tiger Mask W, uh, the one that came back uh, with his daughter, Miss, Mrs. X, oh, as well. Okay, so, yeah, okay. Well, any, uh, so, oh, I guess this is to me. Um, <laughs> but also, sorry, kind of, kind of, kind of uh, don't, don't no, cool. there. But anyway, uh, and also Kajiwara was involved, and in, I think this is like the, like, this is actually like the last of like the first wave. Like he brings it back against like the Soviet Union guys a few years li- uh, later, or like like almost a decade later. But the last of the big different styles fights was against Willie Williams and uh, Kajiwara. I believe was directly involved in promoting that. And of course, in the early '80s, the uh, uh, TV uh, by this point, TV Asai licenses Tiger Mask. Because this is right around the time that they actually adapt, they actually uh, re, they've actually brought Tiger Mask back to uh, the as a cartoon. And Satoru Sayama, who originally was going, they were going to make this big martial arts division out of the different styles fights, and Sayama was going to be like the like the new the, the the hot young star with that. But then Fujinami comes and kind of derails that, and Sayama ends up getting sent to EMLL. So th- th- uh, then you know that Tiger Mask happens and. I just want to bring this up because this kind of ends up in an ugly way because Iki Kajiwara eventually holds up Inoki in a hotel because he hasn't been pay- hadn't been paying him. Oh, I never heard of this. <laughs> this is one of the things that like destroys Kajiwara's reputation about five years before he dies, and that's what leads to him eventually selling the gimmick to uh, All Japan with uh, Misawa. But anyway, oh okay, back to seventy seven now. There's some like like I said in um I, I let I 
So in this is actually the, the to commemorate when Net TV changed their brand to TV Asahi, um New Japan became the first promotion in 20 years to promote uh, Sumo Hall on back-to-back nights, uh, March 31st and April 1st, 1977. On the first night, they I think they had the final of the World League, uh, and by this point, the, the World League was just not uh, – it was not doing well because there was no Inoki. That's why they rebranded as the MSG League in 78, so that they have an excuse for Inoki to come back into it. That's the one that Sakaguchi wins against Masked Superstar. I've actually seen – it's not on New Japan World, but I have actually seen, like, DHS footage of it. They only show, like, the last four minutes. <laughs> like, like, like they kind of they shafted it. But anyway, um, then that's when Inoki also ch- defends his title, the NWF title, against Johnny Powers – Forgot to mention, they do an angle after the NWF goes down, where it, when Inoki joins the NWA and it's no, they have to, he has to stop promoting the NWF title as a world heavyweight title. Johnny, pa- they do this angle where Johnny Powers takes over the NWF and tries to force Inoki to give the title back to him, like just drop it, and Inoki refuses. Like they actually, he's like, no, you're going to wrestle me for this. So that's the story, but between their matches in the mid seventies. Uh, they do. They, they actually worked an angle with the NWF, even though the NWF was dead at this point. <laughs> yeah, so it was completely yeah. So not not any kind of promotion at that point. But I, no, I just I I love the idea. This is such a. I, it's kind of a, it's like it captures Inoki in the seventies. The spectacle of everything was so strong with him and everything he did, and it continued. Right, right. So now in the. And then on the so on that was the first day. On the sec the second day is famous because so like I said, uh, Sakaguchi and Kobayashi got together to win the titles, the tag titles. What they, when Umanosuke Ueda, I don't want to get into the whole story because there's a whole convoluted thing with him going into the IWE. Basically becomes the IWE champion just so he can use that as leverage to promote himself into a rest, into a match with Inoki, and then he does he finally does. He finally joins as Tiger Jeet Singh's partner in early 77. What they do to get Singh and Ueda over is they do this match where the champions win the first fall in the defense. The second fall, what uh, Singh and Ueda do is they break uh, uh, Kobayashi's arm. And they lose the second fall by disqualification, but they win the third fall by forfeit. (laughs) So this is like something that they use to, to get over these guys is just dastardly heels it's what really gives tiger jeet Singh some fangs in the tag scene and uh that leads to the one night reunion of inoki and sakaguchi on uh april 1st 1977 they have luthez referee this match where him and them in a way to go to i think they go to like a a because uh, I didn't go to like a DQ or something or a double count out because uh, they actually they keep putting uh, Singh and Ueda over. They hold the NWA North American Tag Titles for like five six months. They they Kobayashi and Sakaguchi get back together and win it in like August. But anyway, uh, that is an important. That's an interesting little thing that we can. I want to transition to talk real quick about the television situation or the production situation of New Japan at the time. Something that Inoki was a pioneer at that uh, that I want to bring to the forefront is so he you'll know if you watch if you look at the old uh, calendars of like dates of like uh, big New Japan shows you'll notice that they always booked big shows on Thursdays. The reason that they did that is because World Pro Wrestling broadcast on Fridays, and what Inoki and I think Inoki was the first person to do this. When they produced this big, uh, when they did a big show on Thursday, Inoki would supervise the production of the episode. He would direct the camera cuts. Like, he wasn't doing, like, Vince McMahon production truck stuff. It wasn't live. But he was still the first guy to do that, I think. Like, first wrestler to, and if you watch, like, New Japan, there's, like, some dynamic camera angles that, like, in that early stuff that I think you can really see his imprint and you see, like, all Japan try to kind of mimic that in the mid late seventies. That would be, that's another thing with wrestling that I think would, I would love to like actually do like a film analysis of like the production, the development of like television production and wrestling. So I bring that up because uh, they booked back to back nights 
on, on, at Sumo Hall on a Thursday and a Friday. And the reason they didn't do this again for a long time is because the people who bought the tickets to see the, sh- the second day show didn't see the TV of the first day show. Oops on that one. You know, when you were talking about the camera cuts and Anoki being so hands-on, I think that must have been part of his vision uh, where we talked about Yamamoto earlier, where he wanted a wrestler to be the commentator. Who better than to know how to shoot the action than a wrestler himself, oh, especially himself? You know, like, and you, if you watch, like, when the, like, those are, those are, like, yeah, when you watch, like, I remember, like, going by memory, like, early All Japan is still sticking to, like, this kind of, this pretty stale presentation. Like, it's clearly, like, the same camera crew that was shooting the old JWA stuff. But with, um, and, but in the mid 70s, I think you see them, like, there's this, like, zoom move that they love to do. Uh, that in like 76, there's this Terry Funk. Like, when people talk, when I talk about the All Japan Zoom, I think they'll, people will know what I'm talking about. They've really watched this 70 stuff. And I think that that was them trying to copy Inoki, or perhaps. But anyway, so Inoki's like a really busy guy because he's having to work all these shows. He's doing this production stuff. Um, so something that really helps lighten his load in 78 is when Fujinami comes back from his three-year excursion. I want to say real quick, like, Fujinami, uh, because Jumbo was the first person to really, uh, like, he, for, like, Jumbo, there was this huge uh, uh, female fan base that emerged around Jumbo pretty quickly, and wrestling had not really, like, there was Joshi, but Joshi, uh, like, like, the... That was like Teenage Girls, pretty much. Right, and, and, and... Early Joshi is a lot was a lot different. Like it was, it, it did not get teenage girls. It didn't get the same audience. It was like considered kind of seedy, uh, whether fairly or not. But until um, Mak Fumiyake came in and really, right. and, and that yeah. happens around the same time that Jumbo really starts getting the ball rolling with, uh, with like his female fan base. So I sometimes wonder if there was like a bit of cross pollination between like Jumbo fans and. And, uh, but, you know, this is, that, this is for the Jumbo podcast I might do someday. Uh, I should plug my friend, um, Alex, uh, the, uh, Barabaro Tag Boom podcast, or, uh, I Say You Say Hisai, uh, look that up. Uh, if you're a, a fan of classic Joshi, she's, uh, she's got the stuff you need. Like, she's really, she's been, do- she is one of the people who's really doing for, jo- she's really doing for Joshi what I've been trying to do for wrestling, just really, bringing in, like, new perspectives, new angles, and on, I, I cannot shout Alex out enough. Anyway. Yeah, sh- shout out to Alex. I did a show with her once uh, a few years ago. I'm a big fan of what she brings to the table and her knowledge of that uh, old school scene, and that's a scene that's been so underrepresented. I mean, even like we were talking about earlier, the JWA stuff, I don't think has ever really come to light the way you just <laughs> put it on the, on the show, but... Yeah, yeah. The thing with the JWA is, you know... The, the only footage that we have from, like, Nippon Television's JWA is stuff that they aired for, like, nine weeks right after they cut their deal. So that's <laughs> – that, Nippon Television was terrible at archiving their wrestling. That's why there's so many important matches that we only have on, like, bootleg VHSs. Now. Oh, I mean, that's true of, like, almost everything in the 70s. So, you know, look at Mexico. I mean, Mexico, you can't you – know, Oh, Mexico, they, they weren't even – they weren't even on TV in Mexico City, so it's like the I mean, only- even even in the eighties, it's like we got sparing stuff. Uh, you know, even that it took them forever to catch up, and even in America, I mean, they weren't really archiving stuff that way, unless you were at WWF or something like that. Memphis used to overcut their tapes, <laughs> like it's, yeah. you know, yeah. So it's a a whole other tangent on there, but uh, regardless, uh, shout out to all all of that. Uh, pretty yeah. Uh, anyway, so this is actually the stuff that I've been researching lately about. Another interesting so interesting thing with Inoki in the in the late seventies is uh, in around seventy seven seventy eight New Japan to improve their cash flow actually starts a ticket reservation system the the first ticket reservation system in Pro Resu um, and the reason that they were really able to do this was that they, and and of course I guess I should t- tie this back to Fujinami Fujinami really with the boom that Fujinami had with like younger audiences. Uh, uh, Atsuka in one of these interviews claims that when when Fujinami came back, what they call the Dragon Boom, you started seeing people actually go follow like on tour, like to see more than one show, which is something that hadn't happened before. That's something that like hardcore fans of the Four Pillars would do in early, early '90s All Japan. 
Um, so that's a really interesting thing right there. But anyway, going back to Inoki and the ticket reservation system, that's important because they were able to bring their cash flow in a few months in advance uh, just on the strength of Inoki being a big draw. And the reason I want to bring that up is that All Japan couldn't really do that. Because All Japan was so dependent on the foreigners to draw that uh, – and the reason why you couldn't do that is that the whole business of promoting uh, tours was predicated on not knowing who was coming on a tour more than one in advance. So you would see in the magazines or the, the like television advertisements, you'll, you know who's coming on the next tour, but you're not going to know who's coming – uh, five, six months from now, the only way that a hardcore fan could know that was by either somehow getting a hand on one of the show, the house show contracts, which would have it in a sidebar, or they would go to this tabloid called Weekly Fight, who would actually look at those contracts and leak the names. So that's an interesting little little uh, tidbit of what it was like to be a hardcore pro wrestling fan in Japan in the 70s. And, and this was all before the internet or any kind of thing to make it easier. You had to really be zoned in to even get this kind of info or even want to get this kind of info. Like, yeah, there's a, a, a funny thing about, like, early New Japan is at first there was only, like, one newspaper that noted that New Japan was formed. It was Daily Sports. So it was actually pretty obscure that this company had happened, had been formed because it was because there was this one reporter, Masaki Ishikawa, who had been with him since like the to- who had known Inoki since like the Tokyo Pro days. I think he'd even helped him get back in the JWA. He did a solid, put him on, made him front page news. So, you know how many, you know how many people would not have known if not for that. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a point where I, I also cannot emphasize enough. That print, like the wrestling print media, had a legitimate influence in Japan. Like the, uh, I wrote, I translated a whole book that's partially about like Tarzan, Yamamoto, and Weekly Pro in the '90s. Anyway, get back to Inoki. So I, I'm gonna be honest with you. This is the point where my knowledge of Inoki, like by the research I've done, is kind of stops around here. Because I know later on we have in '79 he wins the. He finally wins the Backland, the belt, the WWF title in what is, I guess, a non-canonical reign. And the thing is, like, that belt is very, that, that win is very obviously him, like, like him, 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 like, ha- being, being able to get back at Baba, you know, Baba having the NWA title first with Frisco, then with Harley Race, and then them doing the same thing. Oh, I forgot. This is probably a terrible listening experience to be jumping around in time like this, but. No, it's fine. It's totally fine. There is the Tokyo Pro Show in August of 79, uh, or Tokyo, not Tokyo Pro, Tokyo Sports. This was the show where they finally got Baba and Inoki together for one night to wrestle, uh, I think it was a fan vote. They read, the, the team that won was Abdul the Butcher and Tiger Jeet Singh. There is a full copy of this match out there that was actually like, they actually with full TV production and everything. There's even commentary by, by I mentioned much earlier, Ichiro Furutachi. But um, the interesting thing about this is um, I believe that that was never actually broadcast. Like, that actually came out – like, that like that broadcast version has been bootlegged. But – so what they apparently did in order to get this show off the ground was they – nobody could actually no, – they would not give TV Asai or Nippon Television the rights to air any matches. The only thing that they did – was that they allowed any network, any news network, any any news program for any network was allowed to use footage in that in the context of news coverage. So there is like apparently there was like a news segment where there's like three minutes of there's a, the famous six man where uh, Jumbo Fujinami and Mascaris teamed up together. Uh, there's like apparently like a three minute clip where they're doing commentary. Where, where they have the Nippon television team doing commentary over it, but I've never actually seen that out there. And But I should note that there is a 90 I think this is the earliest, like, camcorder footage, like, I've seen in Pearl Resu. Somebody got, like, the tape, like, the last 90 minutes of the uh, uh, Tokyo Sports Show, so you have all those matches there. So you have also a fan cam of Baba Nanoki versus Abdullah and Tiger Jeet Singh, as well as that broadcast version that has been bootlegged. So that is the one night only reunion of B.I. Cannon, or B.I. Good, I should say. <laughs> one, another thing I do want to mention, um, well, I guess, I guess we can go, you want to 
like lead us like into the eighties? I need to go to the bathroom real quick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so from that point on, uh, Inoki was really heavily into wrestling with or working with the WWF and Vince McMahon at this point, who had bought it from his dad. Uh, you know, you, you obviously had we spoke about the MSG League. They also had the MSG Tag League. They were really putting that over as a big deal. The thing with Backlund, uh, something that uh, we talked about a little bit, he didn't really mention, but I'm going to say it here. This is another kind of a, like continual, you know, screwing with each other between Anoki and Baba, where Baba, when he won the NWA title, this was so obviously getting the WWF title was such a, you know, FU to Baba and the NWA. But when Baba had the NWA title, he had to lose it back. Anoki never lost it back. So he was able to get out of it, and they just didn't tell anybody in America. And Backlund had the title again. So it protected him, and, and nobody in America would have known either way. I will say this. Uh, I had actually seen where they acknowledged this title reign after his death on Raw, or maybe it was SmackDown or something. I don't it know. It was SmackDown. It was yeah, SmackDown. It was, yeah, they actually did acknowledge it on there. Uh, so uh, they have finally been able to acknowledge it after all these years. But basically, he was trying to prove that he didn't have to lose the title back like Baba lost to, it, it, to like the NWA title back. You know, at the yeah, end. I, I, you always know, should petition Triple H to make the Inoki reign canon. <laughs> hey, listen. I, I, do it. Make Inoki's reign. Put it back in there. But to kind of close the door on this 70s stuff now, this was a huge era, not just of him wrestling, but obviously with the promotional tactics with the different style fights of the Ali fight. Uh, it just goes to show, like, his legend at this point is built around more of the different style fights and the influence on MMA. But the re- reality is, and I think that that's, like, part, like, it's not untrue, but it's more so a means to an end, whereas early on in the decade, he was doing the hardcore stuff with Tiger Jeet Singh and doing all kinds of uh, deathmatch stuff. And what really was the realness of it was the emotion that it, he was looking for, the spectacle of it all. And we would see that even into the 80s with more here as I get into that. Uh, basically, in the 80s, he was clearly the top star. We would see the debuts and, uh, you know, in the early part of the 80s, the, the 80, 81, so on and so forth. We would see people like that would be very influential a few years later, people like Akira Maeda, we talked about Tiger Mask, uh, Takata would be there. So we're seeing a lot going on here. Fujinami was kind of the guy, like you said, he was really the young guy that the people like really took to. Choshu was there. So you're seeing like legend, like this is a legendary era of New Japan. Don't, don't forget my, my ultimate boy, Kango Kimura. I'm always going to stick up for my boy, Kango. <laughs> you know, in Al-Dubai. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Kimura, that, that's a good stuff. Uh, Yoshiaki Yatsu uh, was there as well. So you're getting oh, all Yatsu. kinds of people. We, I want to tell the story real quick about Yatsu. That's, tell it, brother. Yatsu was bait. So Hisashi Shinma wanted Jumbo Saruta. He actually, in 75, he actually, like, takes – he actually gets into Jumbo's limo or something and tries to get him to go to New Japan. He does this, like, one or two more times. And, he, and Hisashi Shinma is like, fine, I'll make my own Jumbo Saruta. So he goes to Yoshiaki Yatsu, who had w- wrestled in Montreal. And he's like, and he even has Yatsu go, uh, like, start his career uh, working in America, just like Jumbo did. And then when Yatsu is going to have his big return match, he gets fed to Abdullah the Butcher. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, he's just poor guy, you know? Oh, hey, listen, Yatsu, uh, definitely still a legend. Some, some amazing high yeah. matches in the 80s, for oh, sure. Yeah, so anyway, I think something I want to, we want to get, I want to get into is yeah. something that almost, like, I feel like this is the last thing that I can really bring insight on with New, ja- with New Japan is the, what happens to almost tear New Japan apart? Yeah, the that one thing is, I kind of that kind of is around there and subsequent to that, and I wanted to mention this real quick because we kind of spoke on this on the April show with Fumi, um, was Hogan coming into New Japan in their oh, early Oh, absolutely, years. absolutely. Yeah, and that was a huge deal. So that thing is that nobody really knows, I think, or isn't that well known, is that Hogan was a star in Japan before he was Hulkamania and all of that. And so he was big there, and Noki loved this guy. And we were talking about it on that show, and something I thought about when I was looking over these results and doing research and stuff, we talked about basically Hogan, he always put himself over. But I also think we talked about it earlier, too, the myth 
of Inoki, and the real story of Inoki is amazing on its own, but the legend of Inoki is so strong all the time. I feel like Hogan took from that just really poorly to, to where the point that you hear all these stories. Remember where he would say, like, I, w- I could have played in the MLB. I was the guy who's going to be the guitarist for Metallica. No, no, and, it's after Cliff Burton died. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like he would tell all these tall tales. I think he, th- he thought he was kind of trying to be like Inoki, but just in a really stupid way. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, that he he learned, but all the wrong lessons, <laughs> pretty much from Inoki. So, one interesting thing about Inoki I want to bring up in the early 80s is yeah. in 82, he, he, he in the early 80s, he develops diabetes. And that is something that is eventually going to force him to retire, not retire, but force him to bow out of full-time wrestling. That's the reason why... Like that's the real reason why he bow like he bows out of like IWGP. That's the real reason for eight eight eighty eight, the big match with Fujinami, where it's like if he loses he can't do a shot again. That's what that really is about. So that starts in eighty two, and this guy, this is one of my favorite Inoki stories. He his blood sh- his blood sugar level is at like oh, five ninety yeah. or something like that. That's like over five times normal human. So he ends up. Some, like, his doctor is saying, you know, dude, you got to retire at this point. Now, Inoki is able to spend, like, like I think he spends, like, a month and a half. And he's able, he's back in the ring. He's, he mostly eats cabbage. But my favorite story about this is his, uh, it may, maybe this is just Inoki telling a tall tale. But Inoki is one of those people who kind of seems to believe his own BS on some level. So I, this is true in my heart. His, he claims that since insulin, using insulin was against his philosophy, uh, his idea after he got discharged from the hospital was to lower his blood sugar by making his muscles twitch and consume it. The way he decided to make his muscles twitch was by bathing in ice water. Maybe that is a tall tale, but if anybody has ever done that, it's Inoki. I, I love the idea of that. I mean, the- you know, I, a lot of people I know have taken ice baths and stuff after sports games and stuff. Never for that reason, though. It's always just to, to relax your muscles and, and make them less sore, but never to twitch your muscles to consume sugar. So I, I love the idea of that. I don't know if it's true. I don't even think it is, but it could be. And, and okay, you're still an really idiot. Me, damn it. Still it's really still me. really you. But so basically, this all leads to where yeah, you were going with this. I kind of set you up with this. The IWGP League final. Hogan is the first ever, and so this is before the actual IWGP title that has its lineage today. They had one before, which I did ended up just international. So, I guess this does lead into what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. International. So they they finally get to this point. The International Wrestling Grand Prix is this idea to like unify like American, like North American, Japanese, and European promoters all like competing for the same thing. That is that's why it has that name. Now, this, the whole idea of the IWGP, it was based, so there is something behind the scenes that I'm going to get to soon that was the reason for this. In the early 80s, New Japan decides, we're going to go full steam ahead. They they basically try to kill their competition in the early 80s. That's why in 1981, they sign Abdullah the Butcher, they sign Dick Murdoch, they sign uh, Tiger Taguchi or Kim Duck, um... That, and that's that's what starts what's called the pullout war of '81, which culminated in Baba striking back by bringing Stan Hansen over to all Japan. Anyway, so this is the that was all to coincide with the to make you know the IWGP seem like this big deal. The reason why they were doing this. So in 1980, Inoki has a business gets this business offered. So in Brazil, in the early '70s, after the first oil crisis, Brazil started phasing out their use of pure gasoline to wean themselves off of a dependence to foreign oil. And they started sponsoring the development of, like, ethanol-based fuel. So this is, like, the, like when uh, Figueredo becomes president, uh, he was, like, by that, like, it was, like, the world's first fully ethanol-powered car. I think it was, like, by, it was, like, a local affiliate of Fiat, Fiat that developed this car. Anyway, Inoki, and the, the way that they made this, this sure, I promise all this is important. The way that Inoki, or not the way that Inoki, the way that Brazil made this sugarcane, or was that made this ethanol, was by processing sugarcane pulp that the sucrose had already been extracted from. There was only one problem with this method: when you take that that ethanol outside of sugar, out of sugarcane, what's left is very hard to dispose of. 
the cows can't digest it, and it kills your soil. Enoki in 1980 starts getting in on this business. He creates a, a company called Anton High Cell. Anton High Cell was going to get in on this, and he like, actually has a farm in Brazil. And he also, like, Enoki, like, like he thinks that he could, he probably thinks he could win, like, a Nobel Prize for this because he has, like, a friend of his mother is working at this university. They're trying to develop this enzyme that would allow the cows to develop, to, uh, to, to uh, process this sugarcane pulp so you could actually turn their diarrhea into working fertilizer. He's, and that this is the, yes, people, this is the reason why all of this is happening. This is the reason why New Japan nearly dies, because the Brazilian economy goes way down, like inflation just goes through the roof, not just through the roof, through that roof, through, <laughs> through the stratosphere. Uh, and his... Inoki keeps putting all this money into it. Eventually, the guys, the Brazilian army, like, seizes his cows. Like, they take his farm. And at the end of it, Inoki is two billion yen in debt. So guess what he decides to do? He decides to take it out of New Japan's money. So this is what leads to the coup in 1983, then this comp like uh, Naoki Yatsuka, I think, noticed on the shareholders report that even though the company had made had made like its most profitable year ever, be it had made just a minuscule profit, and this all comes out and it, it gets to Inoki is removed from power. They they have this like new uh, they they had this new regime that I think Yamamoto was part of it and some network Kotetsu Yamamoto was part of it and some network people as well. Uh, this is what leads to Inoki going, hey, if I can't be the, the president, brother, I, this is, I'm not going to work here. So that's when him and Shinma start, like, he, go, he tells Shinma, who becomes the fall guy for this whole thing, to start uh, talking to Fuji TV to create this other promotion called the UWF. And this is the reason why, uh, like, if you look at the original UWF posters, there aren't actually any wrestlers organized or, or announced. It's just Shinma with all the other, like, faces of big New Japan stars with question marks in front of them. Just blatant false advertising. <laughs> that um, maybe they'll be here. <laughs> like, we, we don't know. It was because this was originally an offshoot of New Japan that kind of lost its purpose when Inoki got the presidential seat back in October. Because by that time, this plan for this company was already too far in motion. That's what leads to the UWF. The next year... Uh, Atsuka creates this other company called New Japan Pro Wrestling Entertainment, and that eventually becomes Japan Pro Wrestling when Choshu and, like, 14 other guys all leave to start, I guess it's technically their own promotion, but they, they against their own will, become this satellite promotion to all Japan Pro Wrestling in the mid-'80s. And so that, this is all, this is the reason that all of this happens. And, like, oh, just to give you, like, tasters of, like, the late eight, like, the second half of the 80s, you, you start seeing stuff like, oh, um, at one point in, like, in late 86, early 87, the network takes, not only takes over the, the, the television, but they turn it into, like, a variety show. There's, they're, like, they have, like, these actual variety, it was because Beat Takeshi had just gotten arrested, and they needed to fill his time slot, and World Pro Wrestling wasn't doing good ratings anymore. So they start doing these, like, studio segments with, like, TV hosts, and, like, the fans hate it so much. They, there's actually a very famous thing where Hiroshi Haze, just, like, where this, uh, this television, this poor TV presenter, Kuniko Yamada, asks Hiroshi Haze a really dumb question, and he snaps back at her. Uh, she, the Kuniko Yamada, people listening now might know her. Uh, she was doing like color commentary on Noah, like in the last couple of years. I don't know if she's still doing it, but like her and Haze had like this cute moment uh, at some show where they like reconnected. So there's some lore with that. Then we get into Japan Pro Wrestling finally starting to come back to, you know, I guess I'm skipping over all these. <laughs> I'm I. I told you when we, you DM'd me, I wasn't going to be able to give you a comprehensive history of no, no. Shinji Honpuro. So. No, no, no. So, it, it, so basically, 
you, you told the story pretty well about UWF. Uh, there's so much that goes into, like, Maeda and his problems with, with Inoki. It would take a million years for, for us to even go through it all. all of the and, and then there's the whole thing with Tiger Mask where the UWF brings Tiger Mask back in, but I think it's at the cost of, like, it's like they get, like, they're, they're, the UWF president gets thrown in jail because he used, he knew that Tiger Mask's manager had connections to some Yakuza guy, and he went to some Yakuza, this Yakuza guy, to try to get Kasha to agree for Tiger Mask to join the UWF. So they lose their president. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, just crazy, crazy stuff. And then, of course, the UWF folds back into New Japan as like a satellite thing. With Akira Maeda, it ends with literally Akira Maeda kicking Sayama in the dick. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it does. Yes. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, in this New Japan, and New Japan UWF uh, situation. And, and New Japan UWF, that is... One like, of the best so, feuds in wrestling history. It way. is, it is, but it didn't do numbers. It did I, know, numbers. I know, I know. Because Choshu was so hot that Choshu, like, a lot of, what a lot of people don't know is that all Japan was taken out of prime time all the way back in 79. And they didn't get it back until, like, a couple years, uh, until, like, there's this, like, two, maybe three year period after, because of Choshu. It's, like, October 85 that they start getting prime time again. That's why if you ever watch, if you ever go through and watch all the All Japan, you'll see, like, all these different kinds of advertisements start showing up. I, I could make a whole podcast just about the weird advertisements I saw watching 80s All Japan. <laughs> now, that is a show we will do at some point, maybe for the Patreon. <laughs> I, goodbye, Wash. Goodbye, Wash. So I'm just telling you right now. It's, uh, <laughs> like, sorry, I'm. Trust me, if you know, you know. Anyway, yeah. let's go to. Um, like, we've gone with Inoki. Um, I should note, like, I, I kind of want to clear up something with. Uh, Maza Saito, people are probably going to be looking at those Maza Saito matches from 1987. If they watch that first match between the two, they see that it, that this weird pirate man in a spirit Halloween costume and a hockey mask comes in in the middle of the match. I want to tell you guys the re- <laughs> so so for those who haven't seen it, this guy comes in during the middle of their the first match between Inoki and Maza Saito in years and he handcuffs Saito to the ropes, not Inoki. So it seems like this Vince Russo, like, like swerve. <laughs> the reason why they, that, that happened, and, and this basically, like, this starts a riot. Uh, the reason why this happened is that they got Victor Manuel, Black Cat, to do it. Victor Manuel did not speak Japanese, so he didn't know who he was supposed to handcuff. <laughs> Oops, uh, and he's a legendary liaison to uh, CMLL in Mexico. Like he's always, yeah. yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so '87 was the year of the riots in, in New Japan. <laughs> I felt like but because also, I should I, I should also clear up uh, in '87. This is when not only is there that weird variety show thing I was talking about earlier. They were also uh, TV Asahi was kind of re- pressuring New Japan to book this intergenerational feud. That's why you see this. If you watch like mid eighty seven, you start like they're they're they start doing this generational conflict. But Inoki didn't like that. And now I, I wanna I wanna tell the real story, the real reason behind the island death match. So oh, okay. uh, here we go. This is what we were all this, waiting for, I think. So <laughs> So here this is gonna blow your minds. It was originally Fujinami's idea. This was the ma- – so Fujinami is a big castle geek. He went to Ganryujima Island to see the castle there, and he w- he wondered aloud to Tetsuo Baisho, who was, you know, former N- New Japan announcer, and Noki's, by this point, ex-brother-in-law. Uh, he tells Baisho, hey, it would be great to have my return match with Choshu on this island. Baisho tells Inoki – and Inoki's like, I'm, I'm jacking that idea. I'm going to stick it to the network. I'm going to – I'm going to show – me and Maza are gonna. Me and Maza. Me and Maza San are gonna show the world, you know. And uh, just so a little background on uh, Ganrujima, uh, uh, you know, the island. It's uh, basically the place. There's this legendary samurai. Duel. Yamato Musashi. Yeah, it's Sasuke Kojiro. Uh, they they battled on the island, and it's like it's an empty island, pretty much now. It's not like nobody lives there, <laughs> pretty much. And, yeah. And, yeah. And if- 
and, and like it, this is a legendary encounter. It was like a duel to the death. Um, yeah. Now, I, I will note that there's a good chance that it actually didn't happen. It might be, you know, yes. probably, you know, Miyamoto might have actually just murdered the guy, you know. <laughs> but but the, the legend of this, you know, that there's uh, anybody who's ever seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is the West when the or was it from the from the man who shot Liberty Valance. This is the West when the when the fact when the truth becomes fact. What was it? When the fact becomes legend, print the legend or something like that. That's, yeah. That's, that's, well, they, they, the fact is everybody knows about it. It's this legendary place. Uh, and if there's no real comparative, you know, it's not like you could do this kind of thing in America. Like, you know, <laughs> no. some, you know some legendary. I guess the only, like, I mean, I, there really is no good comparison. I, I, I really can't even think of I, I can't think, like, what, what would you do? Uh, would you have people actually wrestle on the Alamo? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like something like that. Uh, that. That would be the closest you can. I guess that's a legendary war place that you, you could think of. But there was no like hand-to-hand battle type of deal oh. that would fit with a you know that was like a war place. But this was like le- you know the legend is it's a one-on-one duel to the death, like you said, and they're trying to recreate that. It's it's an epic spectacle. Again, we talked about it in the seventies. Like Anoki still has his game plan here, where the spectacle is bigger than anything else. Like you know, this wasn't like a any kind of MMA, you know, fight type of deal. This was a spectacle fight that was, like, amazing for its time. Nothing that – you would never see Baba do this, you know. Like have an I don't care if this is a hot take or not. The, the Island Deathmatch kind of rules. It, it feels like – it's I, like – it's, it's like – Inoki has always reminded me of, like, a character you'd see in, like, a Werner Herzog movie. Like, just, like, something out of, like, Fitzcarraldo. And if Werner Herzog was, like, a wrestling promoter, that is the kind of thing that he would book. Just to have these two guys wrestling on an island for two hours. I totally agree with you that that match rules. I, I try. spoiler alert, I tried to get Striga to put this on our uh, week of show that we're going to do. But he said he had already reviewed it for one of his German shows, so oh. I, I, wa- I advocated for this. I will, I will say that. I don't, I don't think I, it'll happen. I will also say, Jose versus Tiger Jeet Singh is actually pretty solid as well. Like, that might be one of my favorite Tiger Jeet Singh matches. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I, obviously, like, the, uh, Tiger Jeet Singh, his legacy is all from the 70s and stuff, but we, we see more of him when he makes his return later on. Because he, 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 he was one of the people who jumped to all Japan okay. because of, cause he, didn't lo- he really did not like Abdullah the Butcher. Um, even when they teamed up, like, they, they, they did not get along. Uh, and I should say, in the late 80s, the reason why that happened, it, the reason why Singh goes back to New Japan is because so in the mid-80s, I, I guess I should clear this up for people, New Japan and All Japan signed this agreement not to take talent from each other anymore. And what what ended up lifting that was right in, like, 89, 90, when Sakaguchi became New Japan president and Baba finally became All Japan president again because without getting into the whole thing, Baba actually lost the position in 81 to a network executive. Um, that's why Steve Williams went to All Japan that is why uh, – who else? Who else did they trade? Oh, it happened in the first place because they techn- – like, New Japan would have been violating that old agreement by bringing Ric Flair over, even though Baba, by this point, was not part of the NWA. So that's the reason why that happened. That's In case you're wondering, that's why they have this Stan Hansen-Vader match. That's why Stan Hansen got to work another old, uh, New Japan match after that in 1990. So there yeah. was this brief, like, wall – the the – this, this, there's this brief thaw, and then Inoki's like, what are you talking <laughs> You know, he goes back. It's just like, apparently he shut that down. Oh, wow. But uh, in, in 87, I did want to mention one thing, too, that happened when we kind of skipped over here. But I will say, there's the first real IWGP title, not just the oh, league cool. title. Yeah, but uh, he, he was obviously the winner of, of that one. And we were kind of coming up where, you know, we were nearing the end by this point. But we talked about the Island Death match. And then speaking of spectacle, this is another case. I mean, you just mentioned it. But that was like a great segue. Vader's debut, which was very famously known as uh, the Beat Takeshi <laughs> incident. We have to we have to clear this up for the people yeah. right now. They were not rioting because of Vader. They no. were not rioting because of Vader. It was because of Choshu. Yeah, they Let's wanted Choshu to win right now. So yeah. that match, they, it was Choshu and Inoki were finally going to wrestle, you know, for the first time in three years, and. What happens is the match ends up being a bunch of BS, and then Beat Takeshi, the guy whose TV time slot they took, who was actually, like, he had this 
like, uh, Jado, Gato and Jado and Super Delphin actually all started in this weird, like, offshoot called, like, Takeshi Puresu Gundon. It was, like, this prep school for people who wanted to be wrestlers. So Vader was affiliated with that. So the reason, like, they might have been... Re- if there was anything that they were reacting to with Vader, it was that Vader was a proxy of Beat Takeshi. So he represented all of the network BS that had been thrown upon the company in the past year. And one more thing, the Vader prop, the famous helmet, the smoke helmet, that was something that was created by the prop department back during the variety show era. It was the whole idea behind Vader was to create this wrestler that would market to Shonen fans. Yeah, and you know, we, we, we just like we were talking about earlier, Choshu had jumped to All Japan along with all of his boys, and it was a super hot run at the time, but... Even he, though Masa Saito has to go go to jail, like, right early on, and... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he finally came back uh, here, so it was a big deal. Like I said, the story is told, like... Oh, well, they're mad because Inoki beat Inoki. Or, excuse me, uh, Vader beat Inoki. Yeah, Vader beat Inoki. Inoki beat himself. This is what really happened. But no. Oh, um, but yeah, Vader, like, Vader, that's like the last great, uh, of course, that's the last great Inoki opponent. Another match that I want to mention from 88, I think this is one of the last big title matches, when Vader and, Sh- or Inoki and Shoshi did another match, people might be wondering, listening to this wonder, if you've ever seen the Inoki Choshu match that starts, that has to stop after Choshu's hand randomly starts bleeding, you ever seen this? That was in, uh, when was that? 88? That was a title rush. It was definitely in 88. Yeah, I think that was, like, really early on that year, too. So it right. might have been, like, the first match after the, the big the big blow up at the end of... The yeah, stuff. this was, like, literally at the end of the year, this uh, Beat Takeshi deal. It was, like, the 27th. So, the 27th of the season. I looked it up. So let me explain what actually happened there. Uh, Inoki always taped his blade to the inside of his trunks, and Choshu went for that suplex, grabbed his waist so hard that he cut himself. Wow, look at that. You know, Inoki, yeah, because the referee stopped the match, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, now we're on the same page. But, yeah, that whole thing was just a huge, that beat Takeshi thing, that's another spectacle idea where he had come in, and like you, you mentioned that, I mentioned that before on the the, free, the regular shows about that Beat Takeshi deal that they had. But his whole gimmick coming in was like, ah, wrestling's not as good now as it was back in Ricky Dozon was around. Yeah. And, and, like, and, and Noki sucks and all this. And then basically, yeah, that all happened. They ended up getting banned from uh, Sumo, uh, was it Sumo Palace? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, no, real, yeah, yeah, cause, yeah. So the reason why the Sumo Hall Sumo Palace confusion is because there was the Rio Goku Kokuga Khan, and then there was the Kurame Kokuga Khan. The Kurame one was the one to replace the original Rio Goku. Rio Goku was rebuilt. So that's the one we're talking about right now. So yeah, yeah. That's uh, for the reason why we have this confusion between Sumo Hall and Sumo Palace. Yeah, yeah. So, so they got banned from it. And also, all Japan had gotten banned from that because of tape. They signed Hiroshi Wajima, which is ironic because all Japan was the first one to run the second incarnation of the K- real Goku Kokuku Khan. That's uh, because they they became they were the Budokan guys after that. Um, yeah, that's right. So I think I think that's most of what I've got to be honest with you. It's just yeah, we're, I, I told you I hadn't really gotten a comprehensive Inoki. I would have needed another month to really have a structured episode. Oh, well, yeah, we're doing fine. Uh, like I so said, we're near the the end of the like the major stuff in his wrestling career. So the end of the the line here, we had mentioned the diabetes earlier, and he had ambitions to get into politics, which we would see play out. So basically, they did the deal with uh, Fujinami, a uh, legendary match, which uh, yeah, which eight 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 eight. That is the I, I I don't know if I can call it the last classic match of the Showa period because there is the 1988 Real World Tag League Final. But if you want to see a match, if you want to know, like, the essence of Inoki, for, even, if it, even if it's flawed, that is a truly classic, truly great match. One of – I – there is something about that hour-long draw that I don't think any hour-long draw since has been able to recapture. It's one of the greatest – one, one of the greatest New Japan matches of all time by any <laughs> – and that, that's the thing you could say about Inoki, too, is that he really was a great uh, wrestler. I, I always thought he was kind of underrated because, like, everything that would come after, like, all the stuff we talked about kind of overshadowed. 
his wrestling, but he was actually so strong in the ring. I guess this is my closing remark on Inoki. I think the thing with Inoki is Inoki is Inoki was not. Um, I think I think part of it is because after Dory Funk Jr. and Jack Briscoe, you had Harley Race and Ric Flair starting to take the end of the critically beloved orthodoxy of NWA wrestling, like the NWA championship style, they started taking it in a far more spot-based direction. And I think that the, the, the shadow of like Flair versus Steamboat and all of our smart minds, as well as the all Japan stuff, those are not, you know, those are not idioms that Inoki was really working in. And I think that, I, I think that his, like, I, I think it, it's kind of, like, I've, I'm a lot, as we were talking before we started the show, I've only really been in this pro wrestling fan game for about three years. So I saw all the, I, I read back and see all the baggage that Inoki's work had. And, you know, sometimes it kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of frustrating because this guy was a brilliant wrestler. He truly was. He just wasn't playing that game, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And but there's, there's room for there's room for your hyper narrative wrestling and your more you know, which Inoki is I guess more about transitions and stuff and heat and it's you know I guess yeah that's something I want to bring up. Oh, there's I guess kind of awkward to bring this up now. There was one story that I wanted to tell. Yeah, about, go on. Um, about. The di- this is a big thing about the difference between, differences between New Japan and All Japan. When I was talking about that way, like, hours ago, the cultural differences, there's an f- interesting story with Shiro Koshinaka. Koshinaka was the first person to actually jump from All Japan to New Japan, or the other way around, because there was technically, when Choshu jumped, they Japan Pro, like, had their own locker room and all this different stuff. They were treated as a different company. So an interesting story about Koshinaka is there's this what, what, uh, early on in his New Japan career, he's standing in the locker room after his match all smelly, and everybody's wondering why isn't this guy taking a shower. Inoki eventually realizes that Shiro is waiting for his seniors to take a shower. So even in, like, the early 80s, even a decade after the JWA, they were still doing that shower stuff. And Inoki has to take Koshinaka aside and say, hey, when you work for us, you take a shower as soon as it's ready. That might sound like a small thing, but it reveals so much about as Americanized as all Japan was in some respects, it really was culturally more retrograde than than New Japan was. Because New Japan, like I, you know, there's that talent drought that all Japan has in the late '70s, where there's after Mazio Koma dies, they don't come up with a new wrestler for four years. While as I think that's you know independent of Inoki, that's just I know this isn't really about Inoki, but. The New Japan culture, the truly great thing about it was that it produced such great talent as opposed to with all Japan. I'm not going to say that they didn't. Pro- I, I love Fuji. I love Onita, you know, but they needed if you look at like those those the great wrestlers that they produced after Jumbo, who was more of a Funks product anyway, they really needed to catch up to New Japan in terms of culture. When you look at that in the early, when you read about it in the early 80s, Aki Osada, when he became the booker, really softened up the All Japan culture. And then after that, I think, I think like Kojika leaving, because Kojika, like from stories I've heard, I, Kojika kind of seems like the guy who was keeping a lot of that old toxic stuff in place. I don't think that somebody like Kenta Kobashi would have been able to exist if Kojika was still in the company. Like, they would have ground that theatricality out of him. And, and, you know, go back to where we started. At the start of this show, when we were talking about Anoki coming up, he was the one that was getting all the crap from all the old and guys. Baba, he was, Baba, you know, Baba didn't like that culture, but Baba was not inclined to rock the boat and yeah. really try to reform the culture. And he got, and he got by... You know, without all of that as well, you know, when he first started. So, Inoki, even all these decades later, we're talking about we're hitting 30 years into his career at this point we're heading into, and he still had that culture. Uh, you know, he was against all that stuff in right, New Japan. Right. So, uh, that, that shows you. But uh, we're going to get through this uh, last part of his career. Obviously, he's like very, very, uh, you know, last year of his career was – was 89 before he got into politics. Uh, the big thing he did was he put over Ricky Choshu for like a very rare loss. Yeah, and yeah. That was that was kind of to elevate Choshu as the the next ace. Although that and obviously on the time that Choshu becomes the Booker, right? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because he had to, he got out away from all of that when he went to politics. So he put he trusted Choshu with it, and Choshu did a fantastic job with it. By the way, like some, like people will like there are criticisms to be made, but a lot of but Choshu was is you know deservedly one of the considered one of the most respected bookers in Pearl history. And he was unselfish in the first ever G one. Remember, he put over Absolutely. every person. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to say I haven't watched any of the Enochism era stuff, and I don't. I am the rare person who does not actually want to judge that stuff until I've seen it. Yeah, that's that should that should be how it is. Somebody, I was reading somebody was talking about like a news report on Enoki's death, and somebody had like interviewed. I think it was like somebody had interviewed someone at a New Japan Strong show, and they had to edit out so much because this guy was obviously just slagging Enoki because he'd received that wisdom and. Whether or not Enochiism was wrong, whether or not it nearly killed the company, come on, Enoki does not deserve that. Yeah, you know, it's it's a uh, wild when you see that, uh, you know, things are going on. I, I saw this Twitter thread. I wanted to bring this up. We were going through the '80s stuff. Like, this is a good way to cap up the '80s before we get to the the very end of everything. Um, I, Loss, the guy who runs the forum, BW. Oh, I know Loss. I, yeah. I, I've been, yeah. Yeah, he made an amazing point on his Twitter here. I'm going to read his whole thread here about it. We're going to see what he says. I know the thread you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I, I retweeted and everything. But I, I loved how he made this point. I thought it was, like, so smart. So he goes, because it was huge in 82 and 83 on the success of Inoki, the rise of Tiger Mask and the Choshu and Fujinami feud, it was continuing into 1984 until re- wrestlers realized – uh, they, the big business wasn't resulting in more money for them. That's when they realized that Noki was stealing from the company. It's what caused Choshu and friends to leave, giving all Japan their biggest years in 85, 86. It's what led to Fujiwara, Maeda, and so many others leaving to join UWF. They needed something big in 85, and Brody sort of landed in their lap. The Noki brody feud carried them until that imploded as well, based on the issues between Brody and Sakaguchi. Brody ended up no-showing the final night of their tag league, and to make the event special, they gave Fujinami his first ever win over Anoki in the main event as a make good. Then they brought back the UWF guys after for the New Japan and UWF feud. That carried them into 86, so we're getting scandal after scandal, but he's bounced back each time pretty much. Uh, that carried them until 86, until the match people wanted to see, Anoki versus Maeda, couldn't happen because Maeda came back on the condition of never putting Anoki over because he hated <laughs> Anoki's guts, which many people agree with that statement at this point, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, then in 87, when that starts to not run, run its course but wane, they're able to get Choshu back. Then at the end of the year, there's the issue of Maeda and Shoshu, which again, that's a whole other story, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, Maeda kicked him in the face for real and, and uh, injured him uh, and everything. But that led to all kinds of stuff. It followed by getting banned from Sumo Hall over the Vader match. We talked about that. So then they're scrambling in 88 until Inoki reaches some type of deal with the Soviet Union. <laughs> Classic Inoki, but it results in a new crap of wrestlers. Uh, amazing wrestlers, too. Uh, Hashimakov was like really great, uh, by yeah. the way. Um, yeah, so they came in in some stellar matches, a huge Zongi, Zongi, man. Yeah, Zongi is good, too. Yeah, uh, really good. I, I love both of those guys. You're totally correct. Uh, then 89, as Sakaguchi works behind the scenes to repair a lot of the damage done with TV partners, Choshi becomes Booker and within a few years creates some huge new stars that makes New Japan the most successful wrestling company in the world. So that's amazing how everything bounced. It's like pe- things kept going wrong over and over in New Japan, sometimes by his own fault. Like, don't let's not. You know, we're not trying to make excuses for anything, but yeah, yeah. somehow it all ended up getting bouncing, like bouncing his way at the end of it, which is an amazing story. Yeah, it is. It yeah, it's it really is. You know, they, they I may have gotten into. I didn't. You know, maybe someday. I, I told you before the show the reason that I got into this whole wrestling thing. I may be the. I may be actually focusing most of my. If you can listen to me talking this whole. If you've actually sat through all of this, you might have realized that. New Japan is not actually the focus of my work. I'm mostly an all Japan guy. That's most not in terms of necessarily in terms of fandom, but that's where my research is because I want to write a book about 20th century all Japan. But uh, anyway, even with that, you know, I've, I, I guess this is my tribute to Inoki. I, I, it is my duty to help tell his story as much as any of the others, you know, because he's just too big. It, uh, New Japan is just, it's one of the most important wrestling promotions of the late 20th century, you know, besides the WWF in terms of influence, you know, and I guess WCW, I guess, you know, there's like things that were bigger names on like global scales, but in terms of just like, just endurance and influence, this is, New Japan is truly one of the, one of the greats, you know. 
Oh, absolutely. Even if, not, even if modern New Japan, it's probably, at this point, it's probably more of a brand than, like, a real a legitimate continuity of what it was. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and that's, not just, that's not me even saying, like, pro-Anokiism stuff. I mean, once Kotetsu Yamamoto died, you lost a lot of that old dojo sensibility just a- anyway, you know? I will say, just to wrap up the 80s, so by the end of the year, he wins... Uh, he, he wins the election. He gets into the Japanese diet, uh, pretty much. Now, this is a report from Meltzer at the time I found online. I was thinking through some stuff here. But this is what he says, because I, I, I don't remember this, thing, this anywhere, but I think it's very interesting. So, Inoki wins the election, gets elected to the diet. Major political figure right now. And in a very early speech, I think it was his first or one of his first, but you got to understand, this was a long time ago, 33 years ago, and somebody ran up on the stage during one of his speeches and stabbed him, an assassination attempt, and you know, you don't know what kind of enemies were out there, what was going on, Meltzer saying all kinds of stuff when he reported on it, you know, it, it was a crazy time in life when you see a major wrestling star get elected to office and set the stage for many, many others afterwards, some of which he trained uh, as wrestlers would follow his lead and become, go into office. Some just just went to office. But the story that everyone's been sharing and talking about happened the next year was when he went to I- Iraq and met with uh, Saddam Hussein to right. ne- negotiate the release of these hostage- hostages. And that uh, kind of... For a little like that, like that really hurt his political career in the like at the time, didn't it? Like with the Diet, like I think that hurt his relationship with them. Oh wow! wow. Like I said, like I like, I, like it didn't end his career by any means, but they weren't happy yeah. about that. Like, oh, I'm sure there was some other stuff that they weren't happy about. We're about to get into either <laughs> going in a couple of years, but yeah, but he gained a lot of public respect though uh, from the yeah, people, yeah. if not the the, the Diet. Uh, so yeah, he comes over there and yeah, he's I be misremembering that just to be clear. Oh, well, he, so basically he goes over there, and there's been different reports and different versions of the story, so I, I don't want to say for sure what's true, but basically it's like, did the families come, or did it, Noki told them to stay and leave it to me? But basically everyone that says there, he goes there, and he was planning to run like a, this was unauthorized too. He couldn't fly to Iraq. This may be right. what we're talking about. He had to like fly through to Turkey to get in there, and there was like one plane he fired because there was no flights to go there. Yeah, yeah. So it was unauthorized what he did, actually. So you may actually be right about that. Uh, so he did it unauthorized. He's going to run these kind of proto, well, you know, the Korean Peace Festival shows. He did that in Iraq in 1990, and he got the hostages released, and he got these gifts from Hussein. Uh, you know, I'm not exactly a political major, but I know that re- getting all those hostages freed and stuff was like a big deal to the public, and then, you know, and uh, that was a, a big deal from him. Uh, so he continued on. Um, this is also a fun story here as well. Uh, the This is when we first saw the Fighting Spirit slap get evicted. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I actually know this story. Yeah. February 16th, 1990, he gives a speech at this prep school. Some kid who clearly knows, like, Kempo or something just gives him just a solid, like, really good punch to the solar plexus. And you can tell, like, it's a reflexive thing from Inoki. But he slaps this kid. And... Like, it becomes, you know, the, the, the two convinta, as they call it. Uh, yeah, and the kid bows to him and was like, thank you. Well, you know, pretty yeah. much, yeah, yes. Uh, and it was just, and it was like a promotion. It wasn't like he just walked up and punched him. He was like, everybody was punching him, and he was like, ha-ha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he was like, like I'm time, I'm time to take care of Anoki. <laughs> now it was like, they were doing a publicity thing. Yeah, this, like, legit guy showed up and punched him really hard. And yeah, that's what you said happened. I think, um, there was, I think William Regal once told the story where it was like, if he, Inoki told him to, like, hit him really hard during their WCW match, and he, like, he actually heard Inoki, because Inoki was kind of, like, like, in a little in over his head. Yeah, you know, a fun story, too. This is another one. Again, I didn't want to get into all of this feuds and grudges. That could be another show. It'll take a million years to, to get through all of them. But the one with Maeda, again, we've, we've, saw, we've talked a little bit about him. And so, basically, my, Maeda's dream was, we mentioned him earlier, too. I was very surprised you brought him up, because I had him noted. But uh, Benny the Jet... A legendary yeah. martial artist. Maeda's dream was to uh, fight him, and he was oh. always begging Inoki to go, to like, hey, can I go to America to fight him? And Inoki was like, no. So as soon as uh, Maeda pissed Inoki off so much that as soon as he went back to UWF2, 
he brought in Benny the Jet into New oh, Japan. Yeah. <laughs> and Maeda was pissed when that happened. Um, but so he goes on. They had that one match. Uh, they yeah, really. Put uh, I know he did. He he trained Kengo Kamura a little bit. Like like I know Kengo. Like around that time, he does like a combo that was like supposedly from Benny. So yeah. Yeah, that was a, the ultimate petty move from Inoki to, to bring in Benny the yeah. Jet after left, and Maeda was super pissed. He's like, I can't believe this. <laughs> like, right after I leave, you bring him in? So, uh, you know, he, he really didn't do much in terms of wrestling in the 90s. It was more like uh, he had, like, one big match in 92 versus Hase, who was kind of another guy they were trying to really put over. Uh, obviously, Anoki won. And then they start this four-year-long retirement angle. Uh, you know, the four-year retirement road, the final countdown of Anoki. Anoki the final, yes. <laughs> yes. And at this point, we have to mention, because he had, won- he had gotten reelected in 1992 uh, as a politician, but in 94, a ton of scandals and stuff came out uh, for what he was doing. We have to mention really quick, he puts over Tenyu in the yeah, yeah, Tenru, yeah. That is a, I, I actually, I will stick up for that match. I, I love the idea where he, where Inoki does the illegal chokehold, and you've got the whole, the whole Tokyo Dome just of you holding their breath as Tenyu Fakes being knocked out for three minutes, but they can't, you, you know, they, they, can, they can't count him down because it was a legal hold. I think that is so brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, that so much. And a great way to, like, kind of lose and put yourself over at the, at the same time yeah. as well. So it was all good. But, yeah, so basically Shidma came forward, uh, still working with him even in the politics, but he came forward and he was like, hey, there's all kinds of stuff going on, financial stuff, and, uh, you know, TV Asahi was like, we don't even want to broadcast Inoki's uh, matches on television anymore. <laughs> but and, and Inoki was like, nah, like I, I didn't do all that. And he didn't get reelected. He got trounced in the next one in 95. Yeah. So he was done with that, and we're fully on into the retirement road. His career ends with a match versus Don Fry. Like, it, it set a record gate for the Tokyo Dome. Uh, for his retirement match. It had every, and by the way, I love how all these people, again, we can talk about all his feuds. Every person that hated his guts was there at his retirement ceremony. Yeah, and, yeah. So, so I, I love how that happened, and that was amazing. So, like, 98 was with his last match versus Don Fry, and he won. <laughs> he, won he won that match as well. And then he kind of – this is when things get really, you know – uh, shady, pretty much, with his ownership run, because he originally wanted to do this UFO deal, which yeah. was very much... The funny thing is, his influence with all of his guys, again, most of them that ended up turning on him one way or the other in the 80s, guys like Maeda and Takata, they started their own shoot-style companies, which I'm a huge fan of, for the record. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, so... Basically, the year before that, Takata had basically out Inoki'd <laughs> Inoki yeah, by yeah. <laughs> by starting Pride with this a complete lie and delusion that he could fight Hicks and Gracie, and yeah. had just a, a miserable loss <laughs> in, in the first fight. Yeah, but he made a ton of money off of it anyway. So uh, we saw that Inoki wanted to do his kind of version of that after UWFI like died and Rings was on its last legs. He kind of had that idea with Naoya Ogawa, which I know a lot of people. Uh, we talked a little bit about his feud with Hashimoto on the Patreon on the week of yeah. Hashimoto. Uh, but it's a long story with all of that. But I will say this. This is one thing I want to clarify. If anybody's ever seen the match where Ogawa, quote, unquote, shoots on Hashimoto, uh, the thing that kind of tipped me off, and this isn't wrestler eye, but when the ref, there's a ref bump in the middle of a, a real fight, I kind of think that it's not completely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, illegitimate, but that's something Inoki always gets buried for, that he's like, I, I have... Like, I'm sure that maybe, I'm sure Hashimoto, maybe Hashimoto wasn't thrilled about the booking, and maybe that was seeping into his performance, but that never seemed like a shoot to me. Never. No, they, they were, they ended up becoming great friends, like, Ogawa oh, yeah, left yeah. New Japan to join Zero One. I uh, mean, the funny thing is, we talked about uh, UW, UWF, almost the same circumstances that we kind of talked about with you. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to yeah. Mention real quick is that, you know, one thing, you know, I, like I said, I'm not going to, I don't have, I haven't seen enough to make an opinion on Enochism, but I do think one thing is interesting is that, you know, people, you, you, you kind of, people think of Hashimoto as kind of being like this martyr, like he's like the, <laughs> this martyr to uh, Enochism. But, you know, if you look at like early zero one, like there's like, like, there, wasn't there a lot of, like, shoot-style kind of influence in that, too? Or, like, at least, like, kind of in, like, Ogawa was kind of still doing what he was doing in New Japan, wasn't he? Like, 
it was, I, I think. Yeah, they had guys like Kevin Randleman. Yes, uh, yes. Like, even, there's even that one match. Uh, they did the, like this one year promotional match. There's even this one match with like Misawa where, Mis- like, they, like even that's kind of a little shoot styly. Like, if I remember correctly. And uh, Hashimoto, if, uh, uh, like him and Omori had an incident with Noah that got Omori uh, ousted from, from, from uh, Noah. It didn't quite. I don't think that. I think that hurt. Oh, th- there. That. I think that that has been exaggerated because Omori did. I think it hurt his relationship with Misawa, but it wasn't like an immediate firing. It was like. I, I also will say, apparently Omori. Uh, o- Omori had an attitude problem. I think that was a, that's another thing that people have said about him. So I refuse to acknowledge this as I wear my uh, Takao Omori shirt. That I, that I, I fear is like, uh, one of my secrets. I'm just. I'm just <laughs> uh, but what I was going to say well, about all of that, the circumstances around UWF where it was going to be originally be a spinoff for New Japan, the yeah. same is for Zero One. Hashimoto is going to be Zero at first because they were doing all this stuff with Ogawa and it was like, you know, there was all kinds of stuff. It wasn't just a no because Choshu and Hashimoto had heat as well. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, so, yeah, so a lot was going on there. And it's like he wa- he had this big idea, and they were like, no, we're not going to do that. Because Hashimoto was like, hey, maybe we can work with Noah. And they are like, no, nah, we're working with all Japan. And there was, there was a, t- a time where Hashimoto reverted to, like, his young lion attire in, yeah. like, the 2000. And it was a, a crazy time. So a lot of that happened. And so now we can talk about Enochism. Uh, again, it's been spoken about so many times, but the gist of it was he was really into the uh, – because this is when Pride had really taken off and MMA was really booming in Japan and wrestling was going down. I – here's my opinion on it. I've seen pretty much all of this. I actually like a lot of the matches, like wrestling-wise, like Nagata and Murakami. And uh, even the tag the tag match from 2000 when it was Hashimoto and Izuka versus Murakami. And I have Ralph. seen that. That is good. I have seen that. Yeah, that's like an amazing match to me. And uh, they kind of went around, and there was a lot going on. The one thing that didn't make any sense to me, even like putting the title on Bob Saff, I understand. Because he yeah, was yeah. like, he's, you know, I understand that. He's like, I get it. The that's thing fine. Yeah, the thing that I don't understand was when he put Nagata <laughs> against Krokop, and uh, all. Yeah, of- I'm not saying I'm not. Yeah, I'm not gonna say it. Uh, even with my reserved judgment, like yeah, I think that that was just because there's there's another interesting thing because like Choshu, like like I remember I was talking about. So one of the things I have covered is um, one of the big my big projects on pro wrestling only that I finished was I translated the book of. One of a weekly pro reporter, Hidetoshi Ichinose, who was yeah. a big creative consultant for All Japan in the 90s. And something he mentions, because he also talks about his time with Weekly Pro, is that something that Tarzan Yamamoto, who was like the maverick editor of Weekly Pro, he would kind of, he would criticize Choshu because Choshu wouldn't let people do like this the early MMA stuff. Of course, you know, Choshu didn't like nuke. I'm pretty sure like Cho- Choshu had a very good reason because MMA, you know, you know, this was the real thing now. But I think that that old, that old, like, I think Nagata was kind of a victim of of something like that, you know, like where. I guess that was the one thing that I really didn't understand. Uh, they did a lot of stuff from his old playbook, though, actually, if you look at the, the early 2000s, because you had these shooter guys in there, which is what the company was built off the back of in a lot of ways. Right. And, but there was also some silly stuff as well, like spectacle stuff, like, for example, Makai Club which was, like, Shibata was in there and all these shooter guys, and the gimmick was, and Hoshino was actually the, the leader of the yes, group. Yes, the, yes. The manager. <laughs> so they were trying to be like, uh, Inoki is like the god of wrestling, pretty much. And they oh, have actually, never actually known what the Makai Club was. I've seen people, there's a user whose reviews I like a lot on PWO, who goes by that name. I didn't actually know what Makai Club was, so. Uh, it, was, it was a faction, and it was all about Inoki's the god of wrestling, pretty much. Uh, and that led to some really goofy stuff at times. Uh, <laughs> but that, listen, Boss Rutten, I love it. Like, uh, yeah. Boss Rutten was an awesome freaking wrestler, and the fact that we got to see him because of this MMA stuff, uh, a lot of them were actually really good. They had some good ideas, and it was different than what you were seeing in your All, all Japan and Noah, whereas That's now... Something- yeah, I really love the idea of like mixed mar- like I love the idea of of pro wrestling being something that mixed martial artists can also do. Like it's what they're doing, but like a performative aspect of it. That's why like like you know, of course they're doing it because you know they can't fight anymore. Like they're 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 too old in years a lot of times. But you know, I I 
I kind of, lo- I love that like Suzuki and like Sakuraba and all these other people are able to do that. And I think that when people talk about, you know, when people slang on Enochiism, I think that you can, I think you can lose a lot of what's beautiful about that sort of, that, that sensibility of having a mixed martial artist go in this very different rhythm and have to reconcile their rhythms with pro wrestling rhythms. I think that that's, I think that has massive potential and that's, I think that's the thing where, why I lean towards wanting to defend Enochiism, even though I've never seen it, because I see how a lot of things have been, how this homogenous, uh, you know, my turn, your turn idea of a great match has kind of become the, the accepted barometer for yeah. quality in this art form. And that's just not whether, and I'm not, this is not me trying to call it anybody who likes AEW or PWG or anything like that. It is just not healthy for wrestling to just be that. Oh, I totally agree with you. Just as a fan point of view, I do. I will say, like I said, there were mistakes made. You know, let's again, I don't want to <laughs> vibe over it. And like Hashimoto, I just, I don't think the fans wanted to see their hero go down oh, yeah. to Hogawa. To, to like I, I wouldn't have done it how it happened, and it led to a lot of problems at the end of the day. Really, when you break it down, the era of New Japan, there was good and bad to it. And like I said, for most of it, I can kind of understand where he's coming from in most of his decisions. The only thing that I think was a really big mistake was the giving Nagata to Krokop and Fedor. And that was basically to save – the first one especially was just to save his show. I think somebody had got hurt, and he literally went in on a few days' notice to fight Krokop, the best fighter in the world at the time. So – like, Nagata had no chance, and I can't believe Inoki would even believe that. But it was really to save Inoki Bombaye, which was his big year in shows, that he would start putting out around that time. But it really hurt Nagata, and he never was able to become a star after that, after he had been built up really well, actually. If you look at everything till that point, the Muto G1 final is a legendary match, one of the best ones, and it all fell apart there. Hashimoto, as we mentioned, you know, yes, they got along by the end, and there was, they, you know, they split up when they got into a feud, Hashimoto and Inoki, over this guy, Mark Kerr, a UFC fighter. Hashimoto wanted to sign from Zero One, Inoki wanted from New Japan. Things really got heated then. But ultimately, the fans just didn't want to see their hero get beat up by this UFC guy, or MMA guy, at the end of the day, even if Pride was getting pro- popular. And that really hurt him. There were some bad decisions, but there was also a lot of good stuff that doesn't get rated properly. I think really his whole career is not really rated a lot in the proper context because I think he, he inspires so much visceral reaction, even a countries away, an ocean away, years, decades beyond his career. I think his name and his legacy has spawns a visceral reaction and most of it is legitimate. And, you know, I would say all of the criticism and praise, it's like he's the rare case where pretty much all of it's true. And Enochism is a microcosm of him as a person. And a lot of it was stuff that was just out of everybody's control, whether it was the MMA boom. The economy was in flux a little bit. So it's like a lot – wrestling as a whole went kind of down in the 2000s. And ultimately it led to the company nearly going bankrupt until Inoki sold – Oh, and, but another thing, at this point his son-in-law had jumped in. Uh, Simon, well. yes, yes. Yes, yes, Simon, uh, he, who had married his uh, daughter. At Hiroko, the, Hiroko, but yeah. Yeah, the, the one she had uh, with Baisho, uh, or he had with Baisho. So, yeah, so he, they, Simon was in there now, and Inoki sold the company. Simon stuck around, like, a, a, maybe a year extra, like, a, a little bit longer. And he sold it to Ukes, right, the game developer. Yeah, yeah, the video game company. And Simon, like, he, his main deal was he brought back Choshu as Booker in, like, 2006 oh. or something. Okay, uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so, but he was in a tough spot, so I, I, try, I don't really judge him. I know a lot of people like bash him, <laughs> but uh, it was, it, it, it was a tough spot for everybody. But it led to some good things. There were some mistakes made, especially I think like Tenzan and, and Nagata kind of suffered from it all. Like Kojima was the one that benefited because he left, <laughs> you right, know. Right. <laughs> yeah, so like him and Muto, and that's another thing. Like you look at Inoki's career, it's like all these guys who have left him, <laughs> you know, pretty much for one reason or another. 
And after that, they did a deal where Enoki started his new company, uh, IGF, Enoki yeah. Genome Federation. One of which, the greatest wrestling promotion names of all time, by the way. Hey, when we, when we did our draft at the start of the year, I named my company Enoki Genome Soldiers after Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> 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 that, yeah, so, I, got, I got it. Yes, uh, so I will say that I definitely am a fan of the name. And I liked the idea of the promotion. I just think the timing of it, again, was a, a tough spot. And definitely, I saw a really good match was like Hideki Suzuki and Josh Barnett. Like it was, yeah. I thought it was really good. And of yeah. course, we have to talk about the famous the match that that uh, <laughs> oh 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 Luke Turkana Gallows and yeah, Luke Gallows. Yeah, I, I without giving this an I don't want to give the episode an explicit tag to just look up that clip. It's on Twitter. It's amazing. Yes, it's very funny <laughs> at the end of the day. And okay, and he was kind of hot tempered even at the end of that New Japan stuff. It's like he and one time he ran to the ring and slapped uh, Nakamura in the face. <laughs> uh, like just after like after Fujita had kicked him in the head and pinned him, like uh, Inoki hit the ring and just slapped him in the face <laughs> pretty much because uh, he was pissed at Nakamura for some reason. Nakamura in his book. Uh, he did, and, and even Tanahashi, when they talked, they interviewed him about him. They were like, Tanahashi was like, "I took his picture down in the dojo because his era had passed." Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And around 2009, Nakamura's whole gimmick. This is before how we know him now, the like right, charismatic right. crazy guy. His I've whole gimmick. Some early, uh, I, I've seen some early Nakamura. I, I, I've seen like his Kawada stuff, so I know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, the, the Shining the Triangle. Was right, name? right, right. Uh, which I thought was an awesome move, for the record. Oh, but, I, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually, I think that that era is way, way better than the Nakamura we do, because he actually worked hard in all of his matches. Uh, but well, his, I mean, and, 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 and I mean, this current era Nakamura, the, 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 uh, to be fair, you know, he has phoned in a lot of his WWE stuff, so there is that disadvantage. Yeah, yeah even in New Japan, I, I thought he was kind of overrated. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I haven't, I haven't watched that stuff, so... Yeah, no, it's okay, but I like the, the, the Black Savior, that was like his nickname, he's like, his whole gimmick was... I'm bringing Strong Style back, and Noki's way sucks, and, like, my new version is way better than, than his. And Noki was like, what? <laughs> you know, pretty much. Because uh, they did a deal, too. There was this controversy around the title with Brock Lesnar and New Japan. Oh, I know about this. I know about that. Yeah, and it, and it reconciled with Lesnar coming to IGF to drop the title to, to Kurt Angle, yep. uh, pretty much. And, that, and it all worked out in the end. But, yeah, Nakamura was trash-talking Inoki in, like, the late 2000s a lot uh, on his character. And IGF, it it wasn't, like, a big mover and shaker or anything like that. It was a, a solid promotion, like, you know, B-tier promotion, so to speak. Yeah, it wasn't, like, yeah. By that point, I think the era of, like, really the last wrestler-promoter – like the the, the 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 era of promotions being du- run by wrestlers was just over. Like mis- like Noah was kind of the last one, and even that was really like there was some big network guys in there. I think like after that, everything you know, something like IGF can only get so big without. You know, at this point, the big wrestling right. promotions are like they're they're content creators for. That's a good point. Like like you know, it's basically. But you know, Bushy Road, be you know, New J- Bushy Road era New Japan and Bushy Road era Stardom. It's like Sinclair with Ring of Honor, you know. Yeah, Cyberfight has Noah now. Like they have yeah. a big company behind them. <laughs> like I, t- I totally get where you're coming from on that. But they hung on for a while until like the late 2010s, and then they uh, Simon and Antonio had a split when Simon divor- like Simon and his daughter divorced. Oh, uh, oh. yeah, this is this is like 2016, I think that was filed. Uh, and then they split to what new two new companies, uh, <laughs> Ism and New. <laughs> well, like uh, and, and Simon, I think was New, and Antonio was Ism, I think. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if Ism ever actually ran shows. I know New did. I like their shows. It was just like his holding company, you know. Yeah, it, it, probably, it probably was. Uh, but yeah, so Simon, they had a couple of new shows with like a lot of really cool wrestlers from China, which I thought oh, was like, okay. really, yeah, it was like really cool stuff. But it only lasted for a couple of shows, and then there was like legal intricacies that I I can't understand. <laughs> like you know, you have to be a native Japanese lawyer pretty much to understand some of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, that was kind of the end of the line in terms of his appearance in wrestling. He had had a lot of health issues, uh, you know, the last yeah. few years. I think what finally got him was, I think it's called, like, amyloidis, amyloidosis or something like that. Yeah, yeah. His body was making these proteins that it couldn't process or something like that. 
But, you know, he had a, a video that he posted just last week. I, 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 I retweeted it. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and it was like, the thing is, like, now when you look at that video, he was, like, pretty much all smiles. <laughs> for, despite yeah, yeah. being, like, like bedridden and stuff. And he was like, you know, I never really, or I don't really have any wants for anything anymore. I, like, I've had all the money and women that, <laughs> that I wanted. Uh, he had gotten, uh, uh, you know, he obviously divorced. We kind of glossed over this. He had divorced Baisho in the eighties from an adultery scandal. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it because like Baisho, like their relationship really went south because of the Anton Heisel stuff. Because yeah. he had always kind of been relying on her for money. So like, like that's what happened. Like, and uh, I, I read a story that she actually was like was Shinma. Like, why do you guys, or why are you guys always with Brazil so much? <laughs> like, she, yeah, she was yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the thing, because he, he was, like, with some hostess in Rapongi that he had an affair with. And if anybody watches 86 New Japan, there's this point where Anoki takes this really unflattering buzz cut, makes him look like Baba. Like, that's the reason <laughs> why. Yeah, yeah. So that's like kind of like a deal in Japan where you that's, like, your apology, pretty much. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, also, we didn't mention Russia Kimura feud. Check out my pro wrestling only Russia Kimura profile. I wrote a huge thing about him, like four posts long, where I go all into the Inoki feud. Yeah, yeah read all of his stuff because it's all very good if you're a fan of historical Japanese wrestling. But uh, he did get married again uh, to this uh, lady named Tazuko Tada, yeah. uh, but she did pass away a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, well, I read that. Yeah, so he and that was the main thing. He was very like upbeat for the most part. He's like, "Hey, I can." And they were telling him, "He's like, we saw a lot of fans that were like super inspired by you." And he was like, "Well, I love the amazing fans." And at the end of it, he was saying how like this is where things got kind of sad because he was like, "I get all this cool food here, like I I'm in a good you know I'm in a good place, but the the hardest part is that I'm eating all this food alone, you know, because yeah. he had no, nobody with him." So that made me like really emotional. I was thinking, man. Like, this legendary guy, and like, you know, is saying this here, but uh, it's amazing that he fought through so long throughout all of this, and the wrestling world definitely lost an icon uh, when he passed away, even though I know he's like, a, and he, like I said, not all of his life was positive, you know, and, like, he made mistakes, he did some crazy things, <laughs> to, be, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, you know, but he's a legend of this business, and he influenced multiple industries, whether um, politics, MMA, pro wrestling, and it all started from a guy who was working uh, in a coffee field 12 hours a day in Brazil, you know, and he, he went from there to where he became, and I think that's uh, a totally amazing thing, but uh, do you have any final thoughts on uh, Anoki in general, his legacy, or, or anything like that? You know, Anoki's just kind of beyond words, man, just a legend, you know, Bombaye. Um, you know, keep, keep an eye out on pro wrestling only, people who read, you know, already read my stuff. Because in the next few months, um, or next couple months, I'm going to be translating more interviews with Naoki Atsuka, and I'm going to be writing, like, recaps of these, and I'll, I'll be coming up with even more 70s New Japan stuff that has never been shown up before in English. You know, I, I just, I really look forward to that. Learning, being able to bring even more insight into this, this wild life this man lived, you know? Oh, yeah, so very spectacular. And I'll say about him, you know, just to kind of wrap up all of this, I think as a wrestler, he's really underrated, to be honest with you, just because his ownership stuff really overshadows a lot of it. Absolutely. Um, I, I really enjoyed a lot of his work, and I can't wait to talk about some of the matches specifically with Stringer next week, so y'all keep yeah. your eyes peeled for that. It's going to be. Listen to that, definitely. Yeah, real cool stuff there. Uh, I cannot wait to get into that. Um, I think as a promoter, he has to be considered one of the, absolutely the greatest self-promoters of all time. Yeah, he, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he knew, like, how to make himself a hero to the fans in so many different ways, even in, uh, you know, ways that, you know, because I, I think about it, I remember reading a, an interview with him sometime or, or something like that, because they were asking him about strong style and Nokiism and all of that, and he basically said it wasn't as serious, like, as the, like it's more serious to the followers than him, it was like, I didn't it was a really marketing mean, term, yeah. Yeah, ex exactly. It was like, a, this is a marketing deal, and like, people really took it you know, serious. I think in general that's kind of his deal. <laughs> like, you know, a lot of times, I think a lot of times he does stuff, or did stuff that he didn't even think about uh, nearly as much as maybe the fans or his, uh, you know, the people he trained or anything like that did. Uh, because a lot of times, as I said, if you really look at his career, as much as he's his whole image is that of the one who wants wrestling to be real and the MMA and, you know, shoot and all that stuff. 
a lot of times when he wrestled, it was more of a spectacle. Like, you know, when he promoted himself, you know, whether it was the death matches with Tiger Jeet Singh or whether it was the beat, bring in beat Takeshi, you know, and I, th- these things aren't representative of that. They're representative of a guy who has a spectacle. And you listen to a lot of his interviews, a lot of his things that he's done. Uh, we kind of, again, we kind of gloss over it. We didn't really need to get into the North Korea stuff because they made a whole episode of Dark Side of the Ring of that. You know, so the you story. don't need me to add anything to that. I guess, oh, yeah, there was. They, there was they, – they, they wanted – I think they wanted George – they wanted to do, like, a different styles fight with George Foreman, apparently, yeah. but George Foreman was not going to go over. I think that's the one thing I've got that's, like – Yeah, then they should – then uh, Maeda also tried to do a similar thing with George Foreman as well in, in Red Rings. That old man heavyweight title run when he bet, beat – was it Michael Moore, I think his name was? Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that was a, a crazy time <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But, yeah, so, like, you already know the story of that. But uh, he did it there, and if you notice, it was called the World Peace Festival. The thing in Iraq was the World Peace Festival. He did that a lot, and even in Nakamura's book, he was kind of negative on him, but he talked about how uh, he was he was dreaming a lot about world peace and really talked a lot about that. And even in the last video he did, one of the last things he says is, like, he wants the earth to be healthier and stuff like that. Yeah. I think he, and even with the Ali fight, this is just my opinion right now. This is not any kind of factual statement. It's just what I see with him. I think he saw wrestling as a vehicle more than anything else to bring people together in the he world. He wanted to change the world, man. Uh, yeah. He really did. And he did. Yeah, you know, he totally did. He changed the world uh, through wrestling, which was his dream, ultimately. And to see what he went through and the hard life that he had and to see the heights that he went. Like I said, he's a complex guy. We talked four hours about the guy. <laughs> you know he's – you know, you don't just do that if he's some loser like that, that that has nothing interesting about him. It's because he has a lot to him. There's good. There's bad. You can point the finger at him, you know, in so many different ways. And, you know, some people have even said – you know, he's done some crazy things. I mean, working with the North Korean government, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, like, you know, that's just crazy. And, and there is, like, like, also, I didn't mention, like, there, is, there was apparently, like, some financial, st- even in his political career, there were, like, some accusations of, like, financial impropriety or something like that. Yeah, Shinma came out with that. That's the 94 stuff I was talking about. Well, that's why that's why he didn't get a, that they stopped showing his matches because of all of that. Yeah, so he had all kinds of embezzlement issues. You have to wonder the reasons why for that, just because of who knows what was going on. Right. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, I just and whoever it, knows probably isn't going to say at this point, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely not now. Exactly. So, uh, you know, there was a lot to him, but he did a lot of great things as well. You can't just ignore that. He's a very complicated uh, character in the world of wrestling, and one of, you know, one of the most unique. I would definitely say a lot of people have said, like, what if Hogan and Vince McMahon were like the same person? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. That, I can say this for Anoki. Yeah. We're never getting anybody that interesting in this business ever again. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's uh, the way – and that's part like, the good and the bad. It's like he's – all of these things you can say about him, all of them are true. And that's what makes him so interesting to talk about and why he's such a legend and why so many people – again, even the people that he screwed over in the past and uh, have hated on him ended up, like, rallying behind him at the end of it and still respecting him so much. So that shows you uh, something about him as well. So uh, – Cameron, it's been so good to have you on. You held out so well for such a long podcast. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it, had a little fun with me talking about stuff. I uh, even had some secret info <laughs> for, for you there about uh, Tiger Mask <laughs> mostly as well. But I really enjoyed having you on, man. It was so good. Your knowledge bank is so vast that I know all the fans really enjoyed it. I hope they did anyway. Uh, so I hope you can come on again whenever I do a historical project. I'll have to, it'll have to be a special one, but I, I do I do I did really enjoy having you. So thank you for that, and thank you to all the listeners out there. Uh, please support uh, the Eastern Lariat. Uh, we got a Patreon, patreon.com slash Eastern Lariat. We got some 90s project, the top 10 match in 97 coming up. with me and Fredo Esparza from Lucha World. Lots of fun stuff there. I'm uh, going to do a review of the, the latest New Japan show that's coming up in a couple of days as well. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, me and Strig are going to bounce back. Uh, the free, the first episode of that's going to be free. We'll have some on the Patreon after as well, the Sanoki uh, match quality. So we're not done with Sanoki yet. we got to talk about his actual wrestling, which is a lot of fun. We did a little bit with me and Cam, so it was good. Um, follow us on Twitter at Eastern Lariat. Follow me at Viva underscore zero. Cameron, where can the people find you? You plugged your blog earlier. Plug everything you want now. Uh, unload it. All right. Up. Um, you can find uh, at Twitter. Well, I have two Twitter accounts. First Twitter account for me, my personal, is Kinch Stalker, capital C, uh, or no, at capital K, lowercase I-N-C-H, capital S, lowercase T, 
A L K E R. At, at that point, you're typing in. You can probably find it, Cameron Lee. Also, oh, I probably don't need to plug this because it's in the profile. I also have a blog, uh, another Twitter for my blog from Milo to Misawa, uh, which you can find. That's just in the profile there. I also use that Twitter account if you're really into my PWO stuff. I like to post there when I have significant new posts on my Pro Wrestling Only. You can find me on Pro Wrestling Only. And uh, I'm also on Death Valley Driver, though I don't post as much. I'm really just commenting on one of Matt D's threads. That's mostly what I do at Kid Shocker and both of those. Um, that's really it at this point. So, yeah. Well, thank you for coming on once again. Hopefully everybody checks out because you're doing amazing work covering the classic Japanese wrestling and a lot of the stuff behind it with the networks and the shady sightings and stuff like that. So I really love all of that you did. You brought a lot to the table. I can't wait to have you on again. I just talked to, talk to you again. It's so fun yeah. uh, talking to you. So thank you Thanks so much. Me. Oh, absolutely, brother. Anytime. Uh, thank you to the listeners for – tuning in for our big, big, long show, but he deserved it, Inoki deserved it, and we said a lot of useful stuff, I like to think, in there, so hopefully you all enjoyed it, and you tune in again next week. And of course, you know the only way a show about Antonio Inoki can end like this is in the very special way that he would want it to end, and I'm going to give it to you all right here. Ichi, Ni, San, Da!